Good morning, everyone. Uh, for many of you, I'll say welcome to Marshall, and for Marshall folks, I'll say thank you for letting us uh, be here and enjoy this beautiful uh, piece of history and still making history. And uh, going to have a good time today, a profitable time, an important uh, time, and so we're glad each one is, uh, is able to join us. And so the uh, Senate Committee on State Affairs uh, will come to order. Will the clerk call the roll? Senator Betancourt. Present. Senator Campbell. Senator Hall. Senator, Senator Colcorst. Here. Senator Lucio. Present. Senator Schwertner. Senator Zaffarini. Senator Birdwell. Present. Senator Hughes. Present. We have a quorum. <clears throat> Again, welcome. Uh, the, as far as housekeeping matters go, there are restrooms through the door to my left, most of your right. Hey, Judge. And, uh, We'll be moving through after some opening remarks, uh, hearing from witnesses. We have some invited testimony, uh, as well as uh, members of the public who wish to testify. One thing unique to Texas legislative hearings is that uh, real people get to come and testify if they want to, and we listen and we learn a lot. So we'll be doing some of that today as well. It is the chair's intent to take a lunch break at some point. We'll give you as much notice as we can. There's some. Uh, Technology that needs to be switched out and some other commitments, but we'll try to move through expeditiously. We recognize that many folks have flown here and driven here, and so uh, uh, many folks sit on all sides of all the issues. So we'll try to accommodate everyone, but we will not short circuit or limit the important work that needs to be done here today. And so uh, that's where we are with that. I'll make a few opening remarks, and then I'll ask any member of the committee who wishes to share. Actually, I'll, I'll say this. Before I make my remarks, I'm going to make a couple, a couple more things about our committee. Uh, Senator Eddie Lucio is here, who well known to I think everyone in this room and probably most of the people watching, who has uh, served the people of Texas for a long time and did not seek re-election this year. This uh, this may be his last hearing for now in the Texas Senate. And the fact that he came from Laredo, he drove further than anybody else out there. From from did I say Laredo? Where's Senator Zaffron? He came from Brownsville. Uh, all the way, drove all the way from Brownsville to be here, and uh, sure honored to have him here. It shows his commitment to the people of Texas and the importance of the matters we'll be discussing. And I'm just going to pause for a minute and start with Senator Lucio and see. Do you have any remarks, Senator, before we get Mr. started? Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't, uh, you know, tell you how how great it feels to be back in Marshall, Texas. I was here in 1980. I told our Judge Sims, though I press this now. Senator Lucio, before you go, I should, I should have mentioned this. We got a member, uh, uh, Senator, you have to hold the button down the whole time you're speaking. So I'm sorry. Senator Lucio, go ahead, please. <laughs> Keep on pressing it. Hold Keep it, on. it. Hold it down. All right. Well, my hair and age won't work too well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm, I'm very pleased to be here in Marshall, Texas. As I mentioned, um, I was here in 1980. I told Judge Sims last night, who was a gracious host, I appreciate um, uh, having uh, a chance to meet him and others that gathered uh, around uh, the table. Um, and, you know, it just, just um, uh, we always talk about Marshall, uh, quite frankly, because um, uh, there's a, there was a lady down there. She's 97 today. Uh, I called her. She invited me to come up to Marshall. There was a historical commission meeting here. And I said, absolutely. I was her, her driver. I was a, you know, she, she and I were very close friends. She um, was a grand lady who just did so much for our community. I couldn't say no to her. But we spent a couple of days um, looking over this historic uh, community and enjoying all the, uh, I call them the Southern Plantation homes that, that were here at the time. Um, and, and I have a lot of fond memories of your district here, Mr. Chairman. But I also wanted to be here to, to acknowledge the people I've worked with. Um, and as I look back when I started, uh, in the House and Senate in 1987, I met a young man that was just a, a spark plug, um, a, an, an incredible, wonderful, ongoing, handsome guy, you know, by the name of Richard Anderson. And uh, I didn't know where Marshall was at the time, but um, 
you know, I, I thought back, I said, I went there, wait a minute, I know where Marshall is. So uh, Richard and I had a, a great relationship. He continues to advocate for his community. It's great to see you, Senator. Um, and um, you certainly have been a statesman all these years. And I, I needed to say that this morning because I've had a great deal of respect for this man. Um, county government is the closest form of government to people. And um, I, I value the experience that I got. I was president of the County Treasurer's Association in 1976. And then I became a county commissioner before I ran for the House. But I, God has given me, Mr. Chairman and members, an opportunity over the years to uh, meet so many wonderful people, men, women, and children in every corner of our great state. We are one Texas family. I love the pledge to our, to our flag here in Texas as much as I love the pledge to our flag of our nation. And um, we need to remember always that we are a nation and a state under God. I don't think uh, anyone that I serve with here that is here today has ever forgotten that. They have an incredible, strong moral compass. I enjoy that from each one of these uh, people that are here especially the young lady at the end of the, of the bench here. Beautiful young lady who, uh, I got upset at her the first time I met her because she went out and beat me at the, on the golf course. She, I didn't realize she had a golf scholarship. Uh, she's a horn frog, TCU, TCU. <laughs> but it, seriously, uh, thank you for this opportunity, Mr. Chairman, to just um, um, say goodbye to a job that I've loved so much over the years and um, one that has given me back um, with great memories that are priceless. That's my reward and I love it. Uh, I, I couldn't be happier than to uh, sit here today and acknowledge the fact that there, there are a lot of great men and women. Some are in this room. All of you are important to us we're important to each other, so we, we must commit to ourselves and to one another to be good neighbors at all times. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. God bless you, sir. Chairman Lucio, thank you. Again, folks in this room know who you are. Many may not realize that from your service as a young man, as a county treasurer, county commissioner, and then uh, teaching school, uh, running businesses, coaching, then the Texas House and the Texas Senate, serving on all the big committees, chairing committees, and uh, we know your service is an ending, but uh, we, we understand you're still going to be involved in a lot of things in Austin and in the Valley. Uh, we, hope, we hope you are. I'm going to forgive you for saying I was from Laredo. That Judy Sepermania, she better not find Hello. out. If she finds out, she'll remind you I'm, about it. I know, I know. But, but he, he's my neighbor on the floor of the Senate, and I couldn't have a better neighbor than him. And the other neighbor on the Senate, I'm surrounded by two good men, is uh, Senator Hall. Where's Senator Hall? Oh, there he is, <laughs> Senator. Um, yes, um, thank you very much, sir. You and I were together in McAllen last time, and uh, big districts, we're, we're thankful for you. Uh, Senator, is any any uh, members of the panel wish to make any opening remarks before we before we before I make mine? Senator Betancourt. Thank you, uh, Chairman Hughes. I Make sure and hold that button down while you're talking. Well, don't worry. There's no button. It's, it, it's automatic. I hope. Somebody. It better be automatic somewhere because there's no button on this. Um, I wanted to uh, thank you for the uh, invitation and the very important work of the State Affairs Committee today uh, to talk about really uh, why we believe Texas energy investments are strong and should continue. And... Uh, and what we are uh, hopefully going to hear uh, is, uh, uh, is, is an echo of the recognition of the obvious of why Texas energy projects uh, have made this state what it is today and, and will continue uh, to be uh, not only the, uh, the energy capital of the world, but the job capital of the United States. But I could not, without some due, give my due to my Hermanos Christos brother, okay, uh, Senator Lucio, on his last rodeo here, last ride. Um, and, uh, it, you know, uh, Senator, you've been an inspiration for everyone uh, in your term since uh, many of us 
Senator Colcourse and I, Senator Hughes all came. Uh, I know Senator Burb will too. You were to the Senate, you were there. Um, and you uh, welcomed uh, the uh, new Republicanos with the same fervor that you welcome a new parishioner at Catholic Church. And as a fellow Catholic, I salute you for your steadfast uh, support of, uh, of, uh, of life and also just of your willingness to live that life the way you preach it. Uh, it's been a wonderful experience to have you in the Senate uh, for our first uh, journey, and I say my classmate, uh, Senator Colcourse and uh, Senator Hall, sorry, who I missed. Uh, we, we don't know a Senate without uh, Senator Eddie Lucio. Uh, we're going to take the best of what you uh, showed us and, uh, uh, and the ability to welcome us, as well as look for the betterment of Texans, all Texans, from Brownsville to you know, to Dumas, to, you know, El Paso, to Orange County, and uh, because that's, you never uh, missed an opportunity to, to go on the, the tours that Senator Hall and, and others remember from my property tax review. We made every city tour and you were there at every single place. And so you show what it means to be a senator uh, and, uh, and a bipartisan one at that. Uh, and more importantly, uh, you know, you, you, you launched the, the, uh, the 21st century in the Texas Senate uh, with uh, your integrity and your honor to serve. And it's been a pleasure and an honor to serve with you, Senator. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, I must very briefly um, respond. Thank you, Senator Bedencourt. We've, uh, each one of us have had wonderful experiences that we can reflect on and that will make us better people, better Texans. Um, I must add, ladies and gentlemen, that I worked under several lieutenant governors, um, and I, I have to tell you, uh, when they call him Honorable Dan Patrick, he is. He is a very honorable man, a man that really cares for his, the people of our great state, and he uh, has never treated anyone in the Senate in front of me or behind closed doors ever in a negative way. That's leadership and that's statesmanship. And I, I'm going to miss you all, but I'm going to miss him as well. I think you'll agree with me that we're blessed to have a leader such as Dan Patrick, uh, you know, as president of the Texas Senate. But um, good luck. And I'm, I'm here because I wanted to finish the race, put up the good fight. And never, and never lose my faith as long as I live. Thank you. Senator, thank you. Uh, Senator Birdwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to, I'll be very brief. I just, uh, you know, the United States Army, they teach you to be an officer and a gentleman. Uh, but you're the quintessential gentleman, Senator Lucio. We're going to miss you. God bless you. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Hua. Thank you. Uh, Senator Goldcourt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to first begin by saying thank you to Senator Lucio. Well said, Eddie's Senator Birdwell. Um, if you look up the definition of what a statesman is or should be, it would have your picture. I have never seen someone who voted what they thought was best without fearing the next election. You set a very high standard for what we should all strive to do, is to gather the facts, vote your conscience, and as Sam Houston once said, do right. And so I just thank you so much for the example that you said, set and that the Senate is a better place because you served. And as I studied your life, and we've had long talks, truly, Senator Lucio, from your very humble beginnings, you have lived the American dream. So thank you. Um, you will, um, you will uh, be looked at in the annals of history very favorably as a, and as an example for all of us. So thank you for that. Now, Mr. Chairman, I have about five legal pages of a speech 
that I'm not going to give because I have to hold down my, my little button here. It's just too much effort. Yeah, there is, um, there but is I, I do want to say how important this meeting is. It's great to be in Marshall, Texas, uh, deep in East Texas. It was a uh, wonderful to see um, the forest and everything and um, a different part of Texas. Uh, we're so vast and so rich uh, with people in our natural resources. And I think that's partially um, why we meet today is about our natural resources and the investments that we make on that. And so uh, rather than, than, than to read a very carefully crafted speech that I've worked on for several days, I will sprinkle those in in questions. But I will just say that as I traveled my district uh, most recently over the last four or five months, um, people are becoming more aware of what ESG is. I always ask, anybody in here know what ESG is? And they all look at me and go, what? And then I, I, you know, I say, yeah, environmental, social, and governance. And, and then they go, well, what does that mean? And I said, well, it's about to affect all your lives because it is a shift. It is a score. It is a score. And um, lest we forget, um, one of the things that we're meeting about is the investments that some of the largest pension funds in the world, right here in Texas, TRS and ERS, make. And I will just tell you that um, the Harvard Business Review in March of this year wrote that ESG funds tend to lag in performance when compared to the overall market, citing research from the University of Chicago using data from Morningstar. The review writes that those researchers analyzed uh, the Morningstar uh, sustainable sustainability ratings of more than 20,000 mutual funds representing over 8 trillion of investor savings. They found that although the highest rated funds in terms of ESG sustainability certainly attracted more capital than the lowest rated funds, but none of the highest sustainability funds outperformed any of the lowest rated non-ESG funds. And I, Mr. Chairman, I want to be clear. None of the high ESG funds outperformed the lowest rated, less ESG, ESG funds. Not one. Not one. And we have a commitment to our retired teachers, and we have a commitment to our retired state employees to do better with our money. And that's, you know, just the beginning of what we should be considering uh, again and, and what it ends up uh, doing. You know, it's, it's sobering that the now debunked FTX got a higher governance rating than ExxonMobil. Sobering. When they had a two-member board, they used Quicken Books and then you look at the ExxonMobil had a lower ESG rating on governance. So I look forward to today, and I just think that we're at a real crossroads. And like Florida and Arizona and other states becoming very wise to this scheme, I think it's time that we take bold steps and make sure uh, that the laws that we've passed are enforced and that Texas is big enough to move the needle, and I intend for Texas to move the needle with your leadership. Thank you so much. Amen. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hall. Mr. Chairman. Is this work, working? Yes. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, thank you very much uh, for holding this hearing. And Senator Lucio, I just want to echo what all of my other colleagues had to say, uh, particularly uh, you know, we, we've walked down a different aisle, but we've always been aligned in our Judeo-Christian values and, and how we serve our Lord. And you've been an integral part of our, all of our attempts to protect life at both the beginning and the end. And I truly appreciate the heart and good thoughts that you have brought to this chamber a long time before I got here. Uh, you were doing this, and I appreciate it. We're gonna, you will be missed, that is for sure. And, and uh, Mr. Chairman, I echo uh, S Senator Colecourse's concerns. I think this issue of ESG is something that has floated underneath the radar way too long, and I think it's probably one of the existential threats 
to our economy here in Texas and to the U.S. Uh, it's ill-conceived ideas of, uh, that it's pursuing. I think it's high time that it was brought out with the bright light shined on it, and we take whatever steps are necessary to protect our people in Texas and make as many people aware of what is happening as possible. So thank you very much for, for holding this hearing. I thank you, Senator Hall, and I thank each member of the committee for being here and participating in this. And uh, we've, this has been done to an extent, but we want to make sure and uh, acknowledge uh, the folks who have allowed us to be here. Uh, County Judge Chad Sims and the Harrison County Commissioner's Court made this, this beautiful building available to us. And we've already partially recognized former county judge and former senator Richard Anderson. Mrs. Anderson, great to have you guys here. We have former uh, member of the Texas House, Honorable Jason Isaac, is with us. And Representative-elect, soon to be sworn in member of the Texas House, Carrie. Isaac, welcome. And, uh, and most importantly, from my standpoint, a lot of uh, people who live in Senate District 1, my bosses are here. And so well, we're thankful for each of you. And, and of course, we work for the people of Texas and uh, uh, all those who elect us, whether they vote for us or not. We have a duty, and that's what we're here to exercise today. So with that, the, the issue's been well represented. Uh, the committee is building on the work begun last session when Senator Birdwell uh, filed in the Senate and the House passed Senate Bill 13. This was the first uh, law of its kind in the nation. We were concerned. We were concerned when we would read about major banks and Wall Street firms that were publicly stating we will no longer fund oil and gas projects. We will no longer fund development of energy that America and the world needs, desperately needs. And so uh, Senate Bill 13. Senator Bardwell's bill said, basically, uh, to these firms, if you boycott oil and gas, Texas will boycott you. Other red states have followed suit in, uh, in the months since then. And so we've learned it's going, it goes deeper than just cutting off funding. We're going to hear about that from our first witness, about what this means in real life. When there's no funding for energy projects, energy projects don't get done. Energy costs go up, jobs go away, and the cost of everything we buy goes up. Everyone in this room affected, everyone in our country affected by this. This is real. This is family security and it's national security. We have learned since that time that it's deeper than just boycotting energy, boycotting oil and gas. We've learned through public documents and through documents that we have obtained in this investigation that many of these firms are not just boycotting oil and gas, rather they're buying shares in oil and gas companies and then voting those shares against development of oil and gas at a time when we need it more than ever before. And the shares they are voting are shares they are buying, not with their money, but with your money, with our money, with money entrusted to them by retired teachers, by folks trying to save to provide for their families, to provide a nest egg for their future. That's the money that's being used to vote against your interest. And that's why we're here today. It's about families. It's about national security. We've learned through these documents, and you'll hear some of the witnesses testify under oath about this, that foreign governments are involved in these decisions and also other state governments. Major state agencies from other states are influencing investment decisions using Texas resources. That's not right and we're here to shine a light on that. So what's the committee been doing? What's the committee been doing? We've been taking a look at this. And so uh, earlier this year, back in May, we talked to representatives from the Teacher Retirement System of Texas and the Employer Retirement System of Texas about some of the votes that they were taking. And we're going to talk to the folks who made those votes on behalf of, or ostensibly on behalf of, the Teacher Retirement System of Texas and the Employer Retirement System of Texas against development of Texas oil and gas. One thing that's key that we're going to try to bring out today, these documents have shown us, many times if you watch interviews with some of the folks who will testify today and some of their companies, they'll say, we're just responding to the market. This is what our investors want. Our investors want us to make these changes. That's what we're doing. But you're going to find in these documents, and I, I, I trust the witnesses will be truthful in their responses, you will find that these firms have pledged not just to invest that money where the, company, where the investor said, we want you to go green, we want you to go against climate change. They have pledged to use all of the money they have under investment. Not only those people who've asked for this, but retired teachers, folks working hard, trying to make a living, who have no idea how their money is being used. And we're going to talk about that today and hopefully get some answers. The documents speak for themselves. 
the documents speak for themselves, but we're looking forward to giving the companies a chance to explain uh, what they meant when, they, when their companies made these statements. And that's what we're here about today. And of course, we're going to listen. And so, after we uh, had that visit back in May with Teacher Retirement System, Employer Retirement System, uh, we decided to uh, reach out to these firms and ask them to provide us with some documents. Under the law, this committee has the power to issue subpoenas. It's not used very often, it's not done lightly, but it's appropriate in situations like this. So we wrote to each of the firms and they, were, and they each agreed to cooperate with us and send us documents. Uh, we did end up issuing a subpoena against one firm, who we'll hear from today, and they've They've also given us more documents, and so uh, so you'll know the committee's work is ongoing. We're still getting documents from the firms, going through them, asking questions. So today, we'll be asking questions about the documents we have so far. We'll also be asking them for some more documents. Uh, this is money they're investing belongs to the people of Texas, the people of America, and we're sure they won't mind answering simple questions. Uh, I doubt they have anything to hide, and so we're glad they're here, and we're glad they're here voluntarily. We're, we're thankful for that. And so that's what's going to happen today. The first witness, uh, the first witness we're going to hear from uh, is someone who is uh, a, a businessman in Texas who's provided a lot of jobs, a lot of energy, energy that makes people's lives better and, and makes their cost of living lower. Uh, and he's going to talk about an experience that he had to sort of kick off uh, where we're going. And I'll pause here to see if any member has anything else before we begin calling witnesses. And for the benefit of the witnesses and those participating, just to tell you what to expect, each witness will come uh, to the table and before they're seated, we will administer the oath of office. Uh, of course, we expect people to tell the truth. We believe they will. We're going to administer, administer the oath of office to every witness. And every witness will then be uh, allowed to give an opening statement. And then after that, committee members will have questions. And we'll move through those as quickly and expeditiously as we can. We'll try not to be repetitive. But there's a lot of information uh, that needs to be covered today. And so that's how we expect this to go. So, Chair calls Bud Brigham. Mr. Brigham, before you sit down, uh, get set up there and we'll, and we'll give you the oath of office. Go ahead and get your everything ready and then we'll... So Drew's reminding me I keep saying the oath of office. Forgive me. That's just a, that's just I'm just programmed. But, uh, it's not the oath of office actually. We're <laughs> thank you, Drew. It's the oath that you've that everybody's seen on TV, and so uh, we know everybody's going to tell the truth. But it's important we do this. So if you will raise your right hand, do you uh, do you uh, swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Thank you. Please be seated. If I break into the oath of office, just correct me, and, and uh, I apologize for that. Uh, so we'll introduce yourself and, uh, and uh, give us your testimony. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, my name is Bud Brigham. Um, I'm an energy producer, um, sixth generation Texan, and happy to be here. And Mr. Brigham, as you do, pull that microphone a little bit closer to make sure we can hear you and make sure the folks who are recording and broadcasting can you hear get hear me better now? Yes, sir, I think so. Uh, Go ahead, please. Okay. Well, um, I did have a slide deck, and um, um, but I will uh, summarize um, the information in it. Um, I want to make three um, overview points uh, before getting into a few specifics. In 1980, half the world's population lived in extreme poverty. Today, that number is now less than 10%. Affordable, reliable energy begets clean water, modern medicine, warmth and light, safe cooking fuels, and the basic necessities that make for human flourishing. The prosperity we enjoy in the United States can be spread across the globe thanks to natural gas, oil, and clean coal. The second summary point, the ESG movement is a sacrifice of the shareholders to virtue signaling. 
America has never ratified the Paris Agreement. It would seem to violate antitrust laws, and it's perhaps treasonous that financial institutions would be forcing companies that they invest with to comply with a foreign treaty that hasn't been ratified by Congress. And I will provide a specific example of that later. Third point, capitalism has been fundamental to American exceptionalism. For American companies to grow and thrive over the long term, they must generate attractive outcomes for all their stakeholders. Capitalism and all its benefits, including to the environment, is sustainable. These coercive movements, such as ESG, are not. Now, I had a slide in my deck um, um, uh, projecting the EI data on energy demand forward uh, beyond 2050. And when you see even by the EIA's projections, contrary to the popular narrative, oil and gas utilization is not going away. In fact, it's increasing by their projections in 2050. Now, a little more on my background so I can set up some subsequent discussions. I did grow up in Midland, um, and I went on to get my geophysics degree at the University of Texas. My wife and I started our first company on only $25,000, but thanks to great ideas and even better people, we've now created six substantial companies, hundreds of direct jobs and probably thousands indirectly, and along the way made a lot of money for our shareholders. We've taken two companies public, sold two companies, and, um, and are currently merging another into a $5 billion enterprise. Importantly, where I'm going with that is I recognize from the founding of my first company that to be successful, to create value for our shareholders, which is our core responsibility, we have to take good care of our employees, we have to be good stewards of the communities and the environment that we operate in. Not only have our shareholders won, but all of our stakeholders have benefited. I would put our company's environmental accomplishments up against any company in our industry. And I had a slide in the uh, deck illustrating that that is the beauty of capitalism because American companies have also focused on their core responsibility to create value for shareholders. They've benefited all the stakeholders, including the environment. Again, con contrary to the public narrative, our emissions have been declining. While we're flourishing, our GDP has gone up and to the right, and we have among the cleanest air and water of any major country. So I asked a friend of mine who's a professor of philosophy at the University of Texas, I said, what do you think about this ESG movement? And it's, it's great how philosophers can put things in very succinct terms. And as he thought about it, he said simply, it's the politicization of commerce. And he's right. So, and I'm gonna provide you a couple of spe specific examples of how corruptive it is, looking at the ESG movement. And these are my examples. So our companies, I have a slide that illustrates this, but our companies over the years have, have raised a lot of capital privately and publicly. And we were doing a capital raise with a, a bank, Credit Suisse, that we've raised over a billion dollars with over, over 15 years or so, probably closer to $2 billion. Uh, they and another bank had invested a lot of time and effort in a potential transaction. And the time came um, where we had moved sufficiently far where they need to go to the investment committee to get approval. The other bank came back that same day and said, we've got approval, thumbs up, let's go forward. Did not hear anything from Credit Suisse for several days, and uh, so finally I called them, and he called me back, and he said, bud, we may not be the right bank for you. And I said, really, why? And he said, and he kind of hesitated, he said, climate change is real and it's not debatable. And I said, really? I said, well, I'm a geophysicist. I know climate change is real. Climate's always changed, it always will. Uh, but science is about debate. And he hemmed and hawed and, and we had a, a, a prolonged discussion. He said, I'll tell you what, maybe there's a misunderstanding. He said, how about if I can get you some bullets to tweet, if you will tweet those out, I think there's a good chance we can go ahead and do this deal. 
So at that point, I knew there's no way they were going to we were going to do the deal. But um, I, I said, okay, I'm headed to a basketball game. If you will email those over to me, I'll take a look at them and and we'll see. And I, to my surprise, he did. He emailed them over that night, and I've got the email. Now, a couple of the bullets that he suggested are not a problem at all. Um, one was agree that climate change is occurring and that carbon is contributing to climate change and global warming. Yes, of course it is. I, I think there's not a climate catastrophe, but, but that uh, as a statement is true. Uh, this, another is believe that man is contributing to the addition of carbon in the atmosphere. Yes, of course. CO2 is a greenhouse gas, and we are contributing. But the other two are problematic. Um, agree that uh, agree that company activities should be aligned with the Paris Agreement. I absolutely do not agree. That is not a treaty. It was not ratified, um, I, 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 and, and I, I don't think it should be a treaty. Believe that companies should have a commitment to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. I absolutely do not agree with that. I think that would be immense human destruction, and we're seeing just the attempt at that in Europe, how destructive that, that actually is in reality. So I was personally very offended by that. I mean, it, it, for them to use their, their power, um, their access to capital, um, uh, to try to, to suppress my freedom of speech, to try to coerce us into their political viewpoint, I found to be offensive. Um, we got another bank and, and, um, and, um, and a very good bank, so, so we're going to be fine. Uh, the second example, but that is happening in our industry. The second example, um, we uh, it was a, a passive mineral company that, that owns mineral interests in, in shale plays around the country. And the ESG ratings um, for the S gave solar companies um, out, based out of China that actually engage in slave labor a higher ESG rating than our passive mineral company. Um, and uh, so there's a piece written by Chuck DeVore about this uh, that, that we can provide. So um, obviously um, that's um, just, just absolutely ridiculous. So um, I want to wrap up, and my closing uh, comment is, you know, it's it's thanks to private property rights and the energy freedom that we have in the U.S. Absent historically extensive government intervention, we've enjoyed plentiful, low-cost energy and a continuing reduction in emissions. I mean, a lot of conversation about energy transition, um, we're already in an emissions transition, and it's been happening due to the private sector innovating, driving down costs, driving up efficiencies, which is driving down emissions. On the other hand, you're seeing in Europe when government gets active and, and starts to uh, tilt the playing field and central planning does not work, and we're seeing higher emissions in Europe. We're seeing elevated en energy costs, and we could have people dying and freezing uh, due to intermittent, unreliable energy. So ESG and these other crony political movements are di disruptive and put us, unfortunately, on a path to Europe. So um, I'll conclude my comments there. Thank you. Mr. Brigham, thank you. Senator Cole, of course, has questions for you. Mr. Brigham, um, can you, uh, again, quote the, it was a, the University of Texas philosopher? That, what, I'm sorry, repeat the, the question. The but, philosopher that you quoted yeah, um, from it, the uh, University of Texas, I don't usually, I'm not a UT fan, but I want to hear that quote again. What yeah, his name quote? is Professor Salmeri, Greg Salmeri. And what was the quote again? I wasn't Greg. Sure. What was the quote again? Did he say when you asked him about this? I asked him what he thought about ESG. And what was his answer? He said e ESG appears to be the politicization of commerce. Which it is. And um, one more question. Um, the, I think it was a bank, a financial institution. Credit that, Suisse, yes. What, what, what was the name of it? Credit Suisse. Ah, and mm, um, no surprise there. But 
And and so you had to sign the bullet. You you had all those bullet points. They requested. They said, if you will tweet out these bullets, I think there's a good chance we will do this transaction. What with did you. they ask you to do? To tweet out those four bullets. To tweet it. To tweet it. And then you could get the loan. Yeah, he apparently found my tweets to be offensive, and um, and uh, and not aligned with his political views, mm. and so he was obviously seeking to line up my political views and our company's views with that of now, his. Now, this is a new one. So if you tweet something, you can get the loan. I'm not sure that's ethical, but okay. Um, and then the other thing is, I was going to ask you, you are based out of? Austin, Texas. Yes, ma'am. Okay. And uh, y y y how long have you been in oil and gas? Um, 33 years or so. Yeah. Thank you very much. I, st I started in 19. And I want to make sure again. You didn't have to sign an agreement. You had to tweet out the f the form. Yes, yes, and, 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 and uh, the the banker that I was talking to, to his credit, he was trying to be commercial. He was trying to create value for Credit Suisse. A gentleman on the investment committee had a problem with my political views and with, and, and wanted a statement from me um, lining up that with the Paris Climate Accord and net zero by 2050. And the banker indicated, if you will tweet those bullets out, I think there's a good chance we can move forward with the transaction. Boy, this is really new to me. <laughs> Very familiar with financial institutions. I didn't know we... To get loans, we have to tweet our political stances. Yeah, and again, I want to say the banker, to his credit, he's trying to be commercial as he should. He's trying to live up to his fiduciary obligation to create value for the firm. It's the gentleman on the investment committee that was bringing politics into business, which I view as being extremely destructive. And and that and, and, and again, that's how I view the ESG movement. To me, business, it's like church and state. Uh, politics and business don't mix and it's, it's very destructive. That's my view. Mr. Brigham, thank you. And you and Senator Colcourse made this very clear. I want to make sure I got everything right. So there wasn't a question about whether this was a good deal for the bank. It wasn't a question about credit worthiness. You had done a billion dollars with them before. Is that what you said? Over a billion, Over probably a billion. approaching two billion. And we had made the bank a, a tremendous amount of money. <laughs> yes, sir. It was a win-win relationship. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Senator, Senator, Senator Bettencourt. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Hughes, and I appreciate your testimony. I just wanted to go over a couple points. You made a comment about capitalism being fundamental to American exceptionalism, and the fact that there's a, you talked about this relationship because there's a fiduciary obligation, okay, that you certainly represented to your shareholders, okay? And I sure it was astonishment when you had the bank that you had done business with say, just tweet out these four things that we can get this loan, right? Right. Um, and now, they weren't explicit that if I tweeted them out, they would definitely move forward, but the, the implication was if I tweet that out, he felt like we had a good chance to move right, forward. Right, but you've got people that are supposedly having a discussion about fiduciary obligations on both sides, one to yes. the bank shareholders, yes. another to you and your shareholders of the company, and what co crops up in a meeting is, well, if you just, just tweet these four... Now, did they even know if you had a Twitter account? Did they check? Apparently, the gentleman on the investment committee follows me on Twitter. Ah, so, so, uh, and the end of the story was? The end of the story was we we found another bank and moved on. Well, um, that was the right decision for your fiduciary yes. responsibilities, and it showed that he made the wrong decision by suggesting it in the first place. Yes. Now, you made a comment too as well. You said that there's a you, you there's a ESG scoring rating system that we've got Chinese companies with higher ratings than a, uh, American companies. You want to elaborate on that? Yes, uh, and there's an excellent piece written by Chuck DeVore on that um, um, about a Chinese solar uh, firm uh, that apparently um, has uh, slave labor and uh, slave labor. And the video I was going to show was an example of that children um, working in uh, slave labor and cobalt mining. and. Uh, um, and that firm had a higher um, S rating um, um, on, on, uh, on ESG than, than the mineral company. 
Right, and uh, and that's uh, Chuck Devore with Texas Public Policy yes, Foundation. Yes, and we can provide that. Um, so you've got a, a company with a, a slave labor situation. We don't know whether it's the Weirs or what it is, but it's probably Western China, um, and uh, that doesn't factor into an ESG rating. Um, but uh, but and clearly, so you have a company of, of total lack of moral ter 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 turpitude is higher rank than American energy companies. Yes, apparently so. And you made a comment that I just want to emphasize. We're talking about what is really affordable energy and, um, and the fact that in America we have the best, you know, clean water, clean air, you know, uh, legal and environmental, you know, technology uh, really in the world. But yet, we're having this structure imposed, uh, this ESG structure that's imposed from uh, on what should be um, a normal market, op, you know, discussion of what's best for consumers. And given the fact that we are leading the world in environmental technologies at the same time, it's pretty preposterous that we're we're being basically that a company like yourself gets even for lack of a better description, threatened at a negotiation table, having to tweet out four things and it might be better for us to be able to get a loan, even though you've done over a billion dollars of, of loans with the, this, this bank before. Yeah, it's really perverse when you think about it. It's the United States that innovates, whether it's medicine, whether it's technology, um, whether it's energy, whether it's uh, entertainment. It's the United States that innovates because we have private property um, and we have economic liberty. And the irony is that the SG movement um, is really a direct attack on that private property because it is undermining the fiduciary obligation that managers have to the owners outside special interests who, as in the case of Credit Suisse, have political agendas and, and objectives, and they're trying to force that on these private enterprises. Right, and uh, just the last comment is with, um, uh, with in our social norms of having uh, no child labor, no concentration camps, et cetera, are not the, the rule in China. But yet, an ESG ranking system can rank a solar Chinese company higher than any, you know, than higher than American energy companies. Yeah. When they should have been completely not only disqualified but de de but declared an anathema internationally as a result. Exactly. Exactly. A clear bias against American companies that are outperforming. Well, thanks for being a, a, yeah, a, a being a, a promotion of uh, the obvious, which is capitalism is the fundamental basis for American exceptionalism. Thank you for your your decades of service in that regard. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Brigham. Thank you for coming up here. Thanks for your testimony, and uh, thank you for sharing with us what's been happening. Yeah. Thank please keep uh, providing those jobs and that energy. We need you. Texas <laughs> needs you to keep doing that. Please. Thank you, Senator. We'll keep working hard. Thank, thank you very much. Here. Thank you. As we prepare to call the next two witnesses, I'll mention another thing to be aware of and to uh, watch for as we as we hear the testimony. We've talked about oil and gas. So there's also a very important fossil fuel that has provided <coughs> clean burning energy, reliable energy, and good jobs across America and in this community. You know, just a few miles from here, the Perky Power Plant and the Lignite Mine attached to it has been in operation for decades. It has decades of life left plentiful resources there, and again, great jobs. Those of you who were in Texas a year ago, or if you weren't here, you read about Storm Uri and all the difficulties we had around the state because we did not have enough reliable, dispatchable energy like that provided by this plant. And you need to know that here in Marshall, here in Harrison County, this is a very real, real matter because uh, AEP, the parent company that owns that, wants to shut that plant down prematurely while it's got plenty of life and while it is a war course providing energy that Texas needs, that America needs. And we're going to ask questions about this because there's evidence that AEP has been targeted by the very firms we're going to talk to today. And specifically, uh, they've admitted in other documents that they are encouraging companies to close coal plants before their life 
is over and when we need that energy and my goodness I think we learned in Texas a year ago that we need more dispatchable energy not less uh, this could not be more serious and it's playing out right here and we're talking about real jobs that help families and low-cost energy that helps everyone in this state Senator Colquitt I, I saw I, I saw that plant today as I was coming in and uh, it's coal burning is that correct it, it, one of the things that that I'd like to continue to talk about as you say not just oil and gas but other energy sources that we have not only here in Texas but the United States it's my understanding that in 2021 the US burned about 2500 tons of coal into the environment but that same year China burned 25,000 tons of coal can I say that again 2500 versus 25,000 and I just don't see the same standards of ESG being, uh, like my uh, colleague Senator Bentoncourt pointed out, uh, being applied across the world. And I, I, I think that this is um, very alarming. And uh, I, to quote, uh, he's going to become my favorite professor, the politiz po po politicization of commerce. Uh, hard for me to say this morning. Got up really early to be here. Um, but I, I, I really do think that this has to continue to be uh, discussed. And I mean, just last week, China signed a $50 billion trade deal for the first time with Saudi Arabia. Now, I would think that that's probably for oil and gas. Wouldn't you, Mr. Chairman? One, one, one could assume that. And, and, you know, that's been an energy partner of ours in the Middle East forever. And, 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 and so... China and Saudi Arabia seem like they're not paying any attention to the ESG score. I don't think Russia is. To my knowledge, India is not, because their nations are putting their financial interest first, um, the need for reliable oil and gas energy. And as you say, we have migrated away from coal as you can see, I mean, 2,500 tons in 2021 versus 25,000 in China. We're doing, we, we lead the nation in renewables to the detriment of our citizens, as we saw in URI. And, and, and any dispatchable you know, energy, I think we're very focused on natural gas or nuclear, uh, which burns very clean. And so thank you for bringing that up. I, I, I just, I, I think that America's got to wake up and realize what's, you know, happening to us. And I, I, Mr. Brigham was talking about the standard of our life in American exceptionalism. I dare say that, I would say that ESG is working to tear that down, tear America down and not being applied worldwide. Well said, Senator. Well said. Chair now calls Ms. Dahlia. Oh, Senator Hall. Yes. No, I just, uh, it, the, the point you brought up about the threat to our electrical system here uh, with the shutdown of the, this plant, it's all over the state. We've had dozens and dozens of, of uh, coal fired power plants that if we had them online today, we would not be worrying about dispatchable energy. We would not be worrying about capacity because they provided it, and they did for years as clean coal-burning facilities. We managed to rise to having one of the cleanest environments in the world. If you look at a world map of, of environmental cleanliness, you'll see the U.S. is right there at the top. China is right there at the bottom in there. And so this assault that is on us with, between the growth of unreliable energy, which is wind and solar, it is unreliable, because it only operates when it chooses to, and the removal of our dispatchable energy has put us in a very precarious situation, uh, both physically and economically. And so that is something is we cannot overlook as we look to see what, what are these policies that have gotten us there, and I think we're targeted right on those policies that have led us to the brink what could be a major disaster in, uh, for Texas with the shortage we have in power systems. Thank you, Senator. That's right. Uh, the chair now calls Dahlia Blass, Lori Heinel. If you.
Thank you. If you'll each raise your right hand, do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So help you God. Yes, sir. Thank you. You may be seated. had uh, I understand the arrangements we made with us that each of you would make a statement before we been quest begin questions or do y'all still want to do that? Is that still good for you prepared to do that? Very good. Ms. Blast, we'll start with you. Introduce yourself, tell us who you represent and then give us your give us your testimony. Thank you so much, Chairman Hughes. Um, I want to make sure to move that mic oh. close so everybody can hear you. Yes, we will. Thank you. Uh, and I'll try to speak loud as well. So um, Chairman Hughes, thank you. Vice Chairman Birdwell and his team members of the committee. My name is Dahlia Blass. I'm a senior managing director, head of the External Affairs Group, and a member of, the, of BlackRock's Global Executive Committee. Given the cross-functional responsibilities of the group I lead, I am involved in our stewardship and sustainability activities, which I understand are areas you're interested in discussing today. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity to be here. I also appre appreciate the opportunity to listen to you as the elected representatives of the people of Texas. BlackRock's story is one of American success and innovation. The firm was started 34 years ago by our CEO, Larry Fink, and seven other partners working out of a single room. It was founded on the principles of putting clients first, offering them choice to meet their unique needs, and providing them unparalleled risk management. This unwavering focus on clients has led to more and more people entrusting us with their money. We are proud to be helping more than 35 million Americans, including nearly 3.5 million Texans, save for retirement. In fact, our relationships with Texas clients are some of the oldest at the firm, with some going back about 30 years. We have been fortunate to grow these relationships since then, and we are very proud to serve more than 100 Texas institutions. Many of our clients' assets are also invested right here in the great state of Texas. We have helped put our cl clients invest over $300 billion in Texas to grow Texas businesses, fund Texas communities, and build Texas roads, schools, and pipelines, including the Los Ramones and Whistler pipelines. We do this with the goal of delivering investment performance so our clients can meet their financial goals. We understand how important the money we manage is. Most of it, most of it is for someone's retirement. And we are delivering the investment performance for our clients both inside and outside of Texas. For example, for five years running, we have delivered above benchmark returns for our t active pension plan client assets in Texas. We are fortunate to have a large and diverse client base with unique investment goals and objectives. And so we offer them a broad choice of investment products to meet their unique goals. Ultimately, the decision on how to invest their money is theirs, and we follow their instructions. On behalf of our clients, we are significant investors in public energy companies, including many right here in Texas, such as Exxon, ConocoPhillips, Valero, Phillips 66, Occidental Petroleum, and Chenier. We also have made significant private investments in Texas energy companies, ranging from natural gas utilities to an energy storage company to carbon capture. As of the end of the last quarter, on behalf of our clients, we had $107 billion invested in, pub in Texas public energy companies alone. We believe in investor choice. And we believe investor choice should extend also to voting, to proxy voting. In speaking with clients over the past years, it's become clear to us that more and more of our clients want to express their own views on corporate governance in a meaningful way. So we pioneered voting choice to empower our clients to vote their shares as the true owners of the companies we invest in. We offer choice to clients on how to vote proxies more than any other firm in the industry. Currently, all, all our public pension uh, plan clients in the United States, including those right here in Texas, are eligible for voting choice. And we are working on how to expand the offering to even more investors, including individual investors. And finally, we deliver performance. 
We deliver performance by managing risks and opportunities in our client portfolios. While BlackRock today may be synonymous with index <coughs> investing, our roots are actually as an active manager. At our beginning, we were small, but we proved to the market that we had the skills and tools to manage risks and opportunities in active portfolios better than others. And that ethos, understanding and managing risks and opportunities, remains core to our firm culture. We studied dozens of material investment risks, including climate risks, and their relevant impact on portfolios. We do this because we are fiduciaries focused on delivering the best investment results for our clients. In sum, we are proud of the role we have played since our founders sat in that single room 34 years ago in delivering value for our clients, providing unparalleled choice in investment solutions, and offering a data-based approach to risk management. Thank you again for the opportunity to share our story, understand your concerns, and answer your questions. Thank you, Ms. Blass. So you, I think you told us your role as, as head of external affairs at BlackRock, is that right? That's correct, sir. Okay. Uh, is BlackRock an asset manager itself or uh, through one of its subsidiaries? Just help us with the, with the mechanics of how, how the chart lays out. Um, sure, sir. So BlackRock Inc. is a public issuer. We're a listed company. And BlackRock um, is, is, a, is a registered investment advisor uh, with the SEC and with other regulators um, around the globe where we operate. And would the term asset manager be an appropriate one to describe BlackRock's role? Yes, sir. Uh, what does it mean to be an asset manager? Um, and as an asset manager, we, uh, we, our clients um, give us at their, their money. And we invest in accordance with mandates uh, that they give us, um, and we invest in their best interests. I think you probably answered this next question, but to be clear, the money that BlackRock manages as an asset manager, is it BlackRock's money or other people's money? Not one single penny, sir. It's BlackRock's money. It's other people's money. You may have told us this. How long have you worked at BlackRock? Uh, about a year and a half, Mr. Chairman. We talked about this a moment ago, but I want to make sure I'm clear. We have BlackRock, Inc. Are there also separate entities and separate funds with BlackRock, Inc. as the parent? Walk us through that, if you will. Sure. Um, BlackRock, Inc. Is, a, is, is the public company. We are a public issuer. We are a listed public issuer. BlackRock is, is a um, BlackRock Advisors is 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 a is our is a registered investment advisor with SEC. We have multiple advisory units um, that are registered, um, but our business is as an asset manager and a registered asset manager with the Securities Exchange Commission, and we also have subsidiaries in other countries where we operate as well. So BlackRock Inc. also have a number of funds that are BlackRock funds. The BlackRock advisor has the funds um, that investors, retail investors, and others can um, invest in. Do each of those funds have their own boards that manage them, or are they uh, managed by BlackRock Inc. board or BlackRock advisors? Tell us how that works. The, the BlackRock funds have different boards. Not There is not one board per fund, but there are different boards for the different parts. Like for example, our ETF business, our closed end fund business, they have different boards. And uh, you mentioned this uh, to an extent in your opening remarks. Tell us about your main responsibilities as head of external affairs. Um, thank you, sir. So I, um, uh, I manage several um, business groups within uh, BlackRock. Um, I had the Global Public Policy Group, our Corporate Sustainability Group, um, our Long-Term Capitalism, Academic Engagement, and our Social Impact Group. We hear the term uh, investment stewardship. If I were to use that term, what would that mean to you? What does that mean to BlackRock, the, the term investment stewardship? We have um, um, the industry's largest stewardship group at, at BlackRock, and that is the group that engages with um, public issuers and also votes um, the proxies on behalf of the clients that have given us their proxy voting. Is there a separate investment stewardship committee for each of the funds, or is there one that's company-wide? Tell us how that works. 
Um, the investment stewardship group is a is a is one centralized function for BlackRock. However, we do have because we have global investments on the part of our clients, uh, we do have local expertise in different markets. So we have our team is spread uh, globally, um, and the um, the stewardship votes are done via global guidelines that are, you know, looked at every year by the stewardship team. Instead of external affairs, do you have any direct responsibilities related to actual ESG engagement voting? Do you work on that directly? Do I? I'm sorry, do I? In your role at BlackRock, do you have any responsibilities related to the actual ESG engagement with companies and the voting of shares? Thank you for that question, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, in my role, uh, given that I, I do head the um, public policy side of, of the firm, and with my background, my regulatory background, I, um, I do sit on an, an advisory um, body for the, for the stewardship team, so I'm very familiar with what they do. And uh, we discussed this in preparation for the hearing, but you know, many of our questions will be about ESG engagement, uh, to use the euphemism, about voting. And so I understand that you are prepared to answer on behalf of BlackRock for these decisions and these statements that have been made and acts by BlackRock. Is that right? Yes, sir. So to the extent that we have to ask you questions about things that happened before you started at BlackRock, which was fairly recently, or about actions taken by different committees or voting actions or so-called ESG engagement, you're prepared to answer questions about that on behalf of BlackRock? Um, I will do my absolute best, sir, to answer your questions. Will you let us know when you're not able to speak for BlackRock when we have a question for you? Um, for sure, sir, absolutely. We understand it's a busy time of year, but as you know, we list, we requested a number of witnesses with, with who were directly involved in this, who've been there a long time, and for various reasons they were unavailable. And then we're glad you're here. We're not fussing at you, but it's important that you know you're BlackRock today, and we're going to have questions for you. We need answers. Okay? Absolutely. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. As head of external affairs, I think you've answered this, but I want to make sure. Do you have any responsibilities related to communicating with the U.S. government? Yes, sir. What about foreign governments? My team does um, cover different jurisdictions in which we operate, so yes, sir. Who do you report to at BlackRock? Our CEO, Larry Fink. The BlackRock's website says that its first corporate guiding principle is that it is, I'm going to quote this, a fiduciary to its clients and that its clients' interests come first. So tell us what fiduciary obligations BlackRock investment managers owe to their clients. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to, sir. And, and in fact, under my tenure at the SEC, I, I wrote the fiduciary obligation for asset managers. Um, in, in general, um, as a fiduciary, um, you're required by law to act in the best interests of your client, but within the scope of their mandate that they have given you. Will you explain to us what BlackRock's interpretation is of the fiduciary duty of loyalty? What does that mean at BlackRock? Sir, for, um, for us at BlackRock, um, we work really hard as fiduciaries to provide our clients with the best risk-adjusted returns we can um, for their investments. So the fiduciary duty of loyalty is a uh, means what at BlackRock? We owe them our, in the fiduciary duty, we owe them our, our the duty of loyalty and the duty of care. And in sum, um, that translates into acting in their best interests to deliver for them the best performance we can. What about the fiduciary duty of prudence? So that would be within the law within for pension clients. And in, in general, the fiduciary obligations for asset management um, in terms of investments, in terms of the pensions, they come to the same core issue, which is acting in their best interests to deliver the best performance results we can. As I'm sure you're aware, uh, last year, attorneys general from uh, Kentucky, Indiana, and Louisiana, just a few miles from here, wrote opinions 
explaining that under their state laws, investment managers must act in the sole financial interest of their clients. That sounds like that sounds like BlackRock's first corporate principle that we talked about. Uh, that clients' interests come first. Uh, would you agree with those state attorneys general that BlackRock has a fiduciary duty to act in the sole financial interest of its clients? Yes, sir. When it comes to ESG investing, which interest is BlackRock trying to serve? The general welfare of your clients, the general welfare of humanity, or the sole financial interest of those clients? Sir, when it comes to um, ESG, we look at um, financial material risks and opportunities for our clients to deliver the best risk-adjusted returns we can for them. ask you some questions about Climate Action 100. Tell us, what's, what's Climate Action 100? Who is that? What is that? Um, sure, sir. So Climate Action 100 is an investor initiative um, um, that looks at the, the world's largest emitters um, with, and, you know, to take, consider like climate change issues. Do you recognize the document on the screen in front of you? I can tell you that it's the sign-on statement from early January of 2000 for Climate Action 100. I can barely make it out. I'm, I'm sorry, at my age, uh, my, my eyesight is not what it used to be. Okay, thank you. I'll represent to you that this, again, is the sign-on uh, statement from uh, January of, of, two, of uh, early on of Climate Action 100. And the first page of this document lays out BlackRock's commitment as a signatory to Climate Action 100. And so let me ask you this. Is the purpose of Climate Action 100 for BlackRock and others to secure commitments from companies to take actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions consistent with the Paris Agreement? Is that your understanding? Sir, we participate in Climate Action 100. Um, to engage in dialogue with other participants, market participants, governments, so that we understand issues that are relevant to our clients. So is part of your pledge to Climate Action 100 to secure commitments from companies that you invest in to take action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions consistent with the Paris Agreement? Sir, when we engage with companies, um, we engage independently in accordance with our global stewardship guidelines and to understand, from their perspective, understand material risks and opportunities so that we can produce the best performance we can for our clients. So when BlackRock joins a group and officially signs a statement that says, we are going to secure commitments from companies to take action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions consistent with the Paris Agreement. Is that not true? Sir, I, I do believe in the production. You also received the letter that we signed, making it clear with respect to Climate Action 100 that we act independently um, in accordance with our own fiduciary principles and guidelines. And that is what we do. We are part of this organization to engage in dialogue on issues important to our clients. But we are independent in our actions with respect to our stewardship. So even though you joined this group and you pledged, BlackRock pledged, to secure commitments from companies to take actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions consistent with the Paris Agreement, you're saying that's not what BlackRock's doing? I want to put the context of this language that you have here. Well, it, it, they're not our words. Uh, BlackRock signed it. Uh, I, I didn't write it. I, I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Um, but we also sent a letter that made it very clear how we view our engagement uh, with respect to climate action. Well, the letter contradicted this statement and dozens of others. And that's what we're trying to get to the bottom of. The letter? Con yes. The letter made it clear that we are fiduciary investment, um, in, in fiduciary investors on behalf of clients, and we do not make any commitments or pledges with our clients' money. They make commitments. We do not make commitments with our clients' money. 
So what is BlackRock's view on the Paris Agreement? I'm not asking about climate action on earth. I'm asking for you as BlackRock to tell us what is BlackRock's view on the Paris Agreement? Sir, we, we look at the transition to a low carbon economy. We look at the opportunities and the risks with respect to the transition. We do a lot of research in this regard. We believe um, as an, an, if there's an orderly transition that could benefit our clients' portfolios, we provide this information. Our role in this is to provide the data, the research, the analytics to help our clients navigate. But ultimately, the decision of how to invest is theirs. Let me read from your website. This is on your website as we sit here today at this moment. It says, BlackRock's website says, we have joined Climate Action 100 to help ensure the world's largest greenhouse gas emitters take necessary action on climate change. Now, should the website be changed? Should that be taken down? Sir, what I, what I can tell you is that we have joined Climate Action 100 to make sure that we're participating in dialogues that are important to our clients. But what we do, we do it independently, and we do not commit our clients' assets. If the client has made commitments, we respect that, obviously. We have to. That's their choice. It's their money. But what we do is manage in accordance with our fiduciary duty and their commitments. So is that statement going to stay on the website that so I just read? Thank you for reading that, sir. I'm, I'm not familiar with, with that statement, but I, I'll, I'll be sure to take that to our, to our team. You know, there's a whole lot of statements like that. You're going to hear about them today. And I, I, Do you acknowledge that there are many statements along the lines of what I just read that have come from BlackRock, from Mr. Fink in the media, from publications by BlackRock? Surely we can agree on that. This is not a matter of opinion. I, I think if you look at our website and publications, you will see that we have put out um, a, a lot of things. The website doesn't say anything about engaging in dialogue in Climate Action 100. It says, I'm going to quote to make sure everybody's clear, BlackRock's website says, we have joined Climate Action 100 to help ensure the world's largest greenhouse gas emitters take necessary action on climate change. True or false? Sir, what, what I can say? Um, if I made two things. Um, can BlackRock send us a witness who can tell us whether that's a true or false statement on its website today? Sir, if you pull that off the website, then, then, then that is on our website. But what I can I'm tell I'm not asking if it's on the website. I know it is. Is it true? Does it accurately represent BlackRock's position? Sir, our position um, is we are members of this group to engage in dialogue on issues important to our clients. Now, we appreciate very much. We appreciate that um, people have very different views on engagement and voting, which is why we pioneered voting choice. Voting choice we're looking forward to speaking about a little bit later. Um, I am curious about BlackRock's joining Climate Action 100. A lot of people are, and again, BlackRock's documents and Mr. Fink's statements are pretty clear and pretty, pretty unequivocal, and so we'll just have to go through some more of those. Clarify when BlackRock uh, joined Climate Action 100. Do, do we know? I, be um, I believe it was um, 2020, but I'm not 100% sure. I'll, I'll, I'll have to get back to you on that, Senator. But as many of the questions we have will be for for uh, BlackRock and State Street. So. Don't go anywhere, please. Uh, we'll be. We'll have a lot more to visit about. Uh, Mr. Chairman, 
Senator Colcourse, go ahead. Uh, if we're on BlackRock, and again, I'm trying to understand all the timing of this and uh, the fairness of it, and as in my opening remarks, which I spared everyone for my six pages of legal notes, um, just to summarize that we're, we're looking at how, uh, again, standing up for retired teachers and retired state employees um, and their investments. Uh, but, but going to some of the groups and, and some of the statements made on your website, it's my understanding that in 2015, Mr. Fink was invited to China to provide counsel to the Chinese Communist Party on how to address a market downturn there. And I, I'm going to quote something. I continue to firmly believe China will be one of the biggest opportunities for BlackRock over the long term both for asset managers and investors, despite the uncertainty and decoupling of global systems we're seeing today, Mr. Fink wrote to shareholders in 2020. The same year, BlackRock won Chi the uh, Chinese Communist Party approval to start the first wholly foreign-owned mutual fund business in China. So it, 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 I, I, I have to wonder, I have to ask this for our investments, but does this move make BlackRock incentivize and prioritize Chinese companies over their U.S. competitors? And is this somehow the motivation behind ESG? And is ESG merely virtually signal, virtue signaling for investors, or is it something maybe deeper and darker? And so I, I guess what I'm asking is, it's Climate Action 100, and I'm looking at all the timing. I'm quoting from your CEO. How does all that couple together? I mean, I, I, I've given you how many tons of coal China burns. I told you what they're doing in oil and gas. Um, my colleague talked about, I think you termed it slave labor. And yet, you know, we've heard from one businessman that talks about his you know, the rankings of ESG. I've studied what y'all have done. I, I don't know how FTX can get a higher ranking on ESG than ExxonMobil. So, so what do you say about that timing? I mean, that, that, that concerns me. Do you apply these same standards to um, other investments that you make in other countries? You said that you talked to the U.S. government and foreign government, you yourself. Um, Senator, we apply our principles, our stewardship principles uh, globally um, in the United States, in China, and everywhere where our clients' assets are invested. So those companies get the same treatment as our U.S. companies. They're ranked the same way. Even though we see certain things are discounted, maybe how workers are treated, how much coal you burn. Um, so it, it's applied globally. What, what, what the chairman's talking about in your um, Climate Action 100 and your agreement, it's applied to every country, every, co every company in every country. Fairly, same. We, we do not, we're, the ESG scoring that you had mentioned, I believe, earlier, that, that's, that's not ours. Um, that's third parties that do it. That, that's, that's not ours. Um, with respect to our stewardship principles, uh, we engage and vote um, in accordance with global principles that are transparent and, and, and very, very public. And I just will note that our, um, our business in China, it's a very small part of our of our business at BlackRock, and the um, business that you mentioned, uh, we received these licenses um, under Mr. Trump's trade agreement, and it's a local business in China. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Bencourt. Thank you for your testimony. I've got a, a few questions. Um, you mentioned that you have a long-standing relationship with Texas customers. Um, do you, how do you value the Permian Basin uh, at this point in time uh, compared to maybe a solar project in the same area? How would that be scored by BlackRock? Um, thank you so much uh, for this question, um, Senator. So actually, 
Um, just in, in June of this year, we financed the Wink to Webster, um, um, the $45 million. Um, and we are, we are just, I have to know, we are really proud of our performance um, for um, the Texas institutions who have entrusted us with their money. I'll, I'll just, if I may, just give you one example. Uh, for one client, one, active, one account that we run for them has produced over $2 billion, about $2 billion of returns in less than 10 years. Um, I figured you would be. So my question is, you heard the testimony of, uh, of, uh, of Bud Bigelow earlier. Has BlackRock ever encouraged anyone to tweet out uh, ESG-related uh, uh, ideas before you would uh, help them underwrite a project? Um, no, sir, and um, just we are not a bank, sir. Well, uh, I know, but yeah. I mean, yeah, we, no. in, in any scoring activity that you have ever done, because you, you've made a, uh, tried to make a point to uh, to, uh, uh, to Chairman Hughes that the customers make all the commitments. You're just really there as a kind of a service provider. So um, we have both retail funds, like our open-ended funds, our exchange-traded funds, and we also have private funds, um, and we run institutional accounts as well. For our institutional clients, they have investment guidelines and mandates, and this is how we run their investments. For all our retail funds, um, all of that, their strategies, objectives, holdings, very transparent and public. Okay, so, um, but, you know, joining Climate Action 100 seems to be a demonstrative step towards taking a view of the, of, of, as a corporate entity, is it not? Sir, when we joined Climate Action 100, uh, there is a letter um, that we have, and it's on our public website, to make clear that we are independent, um, we do not make commitments with investments or voting that is outside our own fiduciary. We do it independently. We do not coordinate. We do not commit. Um, that letter is on the website. It is public, and I, I do believe it was provided to the committee as well. So if we looked at BlackRock's relationship with their customers, there's simply, you're saying there's absolutely no bias for an energy project in the Permian Basin versus a solar project. You have absolutely no bias at all. The Climate 100 has no it, no effect on your recommendations to either your retail clients or your corporate clients. Um, Ms. Sounder, we invest across the chain of energy, uh, oil, I'm gas. For an answer to my question, not I know how you invest things across the chain. I'm asking a question about bias. Um, so, because you joined Climate 100, you've made many demonstrative statements on your website. You're saying that you have absolutely no bias and you don't have any, any tilting towards an ESG, ESG score whatsoever? Um, Sarda, we have one bias, and that's to get the best risk-adjusted returns for our clients. That is our bias. Okay, if that's the case, then if you weren't using an ESG scoring, uh, you were ranked fifth out of 12th uh, in an annualized rating in Florida. Um, how much higher do you think your ratings would be if you hadn't <coughs> used ESG in Florida? Sir, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, the question is really simple. That you're out of 12 firms that Florida uses, you were ranked fifth on a one and three and five year analyzed return basis. So if you weren't using an ESG scoring, how much higher do you think you would have been than fifth out of 12? Because you are the largest company, apparently. Uh, um, so why were you not number one? Uh, sir, I. Um we do not use ESG scoring for our investments. Um, for some of our clients have asked us to note the ESG score for the funds that we manage. We publish that. We use ESG integration for our active investments, but that's not ESG scoring. Well, then why were you fired in Florida? Why did Governor DeSantis fire you on a $2 billion um, uh, investment? And why did the Florida state recommend that all $13 billion of their investments not be placed with BlackRock? It's it, all the all the literature I see. It's all about ESG. Um, Senator, respectfully, uh, we actually don't know why we were fired when we were performing really well for the state of Florida. We did not have the opportunity for which we are really um, grateful here. Our engagement with the state of Texas has been fantastic, and we did not have that opportunity. We are a very we were a very well performing um, manager for that account, and we are proud of our performance. Fifth out of twelfth is above average. I would not consider it well. Okay, 
So again, my question is, you're, you're saying that you have no idea why you're fired in Florida, even though all the financial literature that I see, all the periodic literature I see, it's all about ESG. And you say you have absolutely no knowledge of why you were fired from, uh, from, uh, from uh, working with the state of Florida. Uh, Senator, we, um, we performed very well for the state of Florida, and we are proud of our performance here, right here in the state of Texas, for our clients. I can mathematically tell you that fifth out of 12 is slightly above average, which is six. So you're slightly above average. You keep referring yourself as well. You're not first. You're not second. You're not third and first in three and five year annualizations. You're fifth out of 12. So again, I, 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 I disagree completely with the characterization of well. And again, I go back to my question. Everything I read about this decision is about ESG. So if you didn't have ESG, if you didn't take it into account, a, why are you being fired? And B, why are you just barely above average on an annualized basis in Florida investments? Um, Senator, for one Texas client that just published publicly, put out the results for their board. I'm asking about Texas. I'm asking about Florida. Answer my question, please. Uh, I will, sir, but if, if you would just allow me to, to finish, I'd, I'd truly appreciate it, sir, if, if I can, just to put it in context, if, if I may. If it's uh, somehow germane, I'd love to hear it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Um, so for one Texas client that just put out its board materials, um, not only did we outperform the benchmark, we were the best manager okay. for every peer. Ma'am, with all due respect, I'm not asking about Texas right now. I'm asking about Florida. You've been fired. You were fifth out of 12. Fifth out of 12 on an annualized basis, which is underperforming by any stretch of, that I can understand from the standpoint of your company's resources and expertise. And it's not well, and clearly all the literature, both financial and popular, say it's about ESG. And you're saying you don't understand why you're fired, nor do you understand any of the, any of the actions that the state of Florida has taken. Sir, we performed for the state of Florida we performed well for the state of Florida. We delivered investment performance for the state of Florida. And we ran those investments in according to, with their mandates, that's what we do. Okay, so their mandates let you be fifth out of 12. That's what you're saying, because that's your annualized ranking in Florida. So we, we produce results concrete results and, and in our management. Line is you have no idea why you were fired and no understanding of how it relates to ESG. Because that was your earlier testimony. Sir, we... Was your earlier testimony that you had no idea why you've been fired by the state of Florida? Yes or no? Because I've got a holographic memory. I don't need to run the tape back. Um, sir, we, we do not know why we were fired when we were performing for the state of Florida, Thank correct? Thank you very much for your testimony. Senator Colcourse has a question for you. Uh, right. It was very impressive when you testified um, about the different, I want to make sure there are different boards for different funds. Is that what you testified? I'm simplifying what you actually said to the chairman. That, that's right, Senator. And so you listed a number of things that you help manage in your position. Um, one of them was academic engagement. What, what is that? Just out of curiosity, I don't know what it is. What, what and yeah, no, sure. Um, we actually, um, there is a lot of research that takes place in the asset management space, um, index investing, um, bond funds, fixed income. A lot of stuff that you know people cover in the asset management space, given the importance of asset management to the national economy. Um, and so, when um, there are academics that are publishing research in the space, we do actively engage. We help them with data in some cases, if if that if we if, we, if it's public and we can. Um, so that's our academic engagement program. So, do y'all um, publicly disclose what? University, I would as, as assume it's all universities. Um, who y'all engage with on that? Um, it's um, it's it tends to be particular professors who are interested in the space. But our academic engagement is also we publish as well. We're also publishers. We do academic studies and we publish them. So mostly professors. Would we be able to find a list of professors that you engage with? Since it seems like they're a certain set of 
professors and what universities um, they uh, are employed by? Um, our engagement is across the United States and in some cases with some universities abroad as well. Um, I, I do believe we have a, this is a very new function, I should say, started about a year ago or so. Not, not that, it's not a, it's not a, a very old function, it's just um, it's something that we brought together, it was kind of throughout the firm, but not uh, concentrated, and, and if you will, and we brought it together so that we have a more centralized function in how we engage with um, professors that are interested in, in, the, in, 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 uh, in the asset management industry. So um, since this is December 2022, uh, you said about a year, could I get a little more specific? I, I, we'd be, so I'm not guessing, ma'am, we'd be happy to get you that You're under oath, so that'd be great. So, Mr. Chairman, would it be out of order to see if um, we could get, again, specifically, um, you know, when y'all started with academic engagement, and then, Mr. Chairman, is it um, in order for me to ask, um, you know, what universities uh, they're doing uh, research with and for? Uh, it certainly is interesting, and we can... Uh, put that in writing to your attorneys, or you could just agree now that she'll provide it to us. Uh, so what, what do you prefer? More, more than happy to provide you with uh, the list of engagements, the topics, um, more than happy to. Yeah, I think that's great. I think it's fascinating um, and, and would be very useful um, to, to again, you know, you're in asset management, and as you say, in your space, um, y'all do a lot of research, and obviously um, we have some great universities in the United States, but uh, as you say, you're doing also engagement with other um, academic institutions across the world. It'd be really good for us to know that we fund universities at a very high level in the state of Texas, even though they sometimes complain we don't fund them high enough, but uh, it'd be good to know. So, um, Mr. Chairman, in specific, it would be how long they've had the academic engagement, um, as you say, uh, you oversee that. And then uh, secondly would be what universities, and in particular, what professors they're doing research with. Council, you, you got that? Yes. Very good, thank you. Thank you, Senator Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you blast for being here. Um, my question is fairly basic. Uh, what, what is the primary objective of the Black Rock, uh, Black Rock business model? Um, we is, are. Is it, is it not to maximize the return on investment of your clients, I believe you said earlier? We are a fiduciary asset manager uh, required by law to act in the best interest of our clients, which for us means um, producing the best risk-adjusted returns for them. Yeah, I said a bit before, I'd like for you to answer the question asked. Uh, is, is not that your primary objective? Is there, is there another objective? No, sir. It, the primary objective is the return, return on investment for your clients? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. What is it about the ESG policies that makes it important to maximizing that return? You could uh, take each of the elements and explain how they contribute to maximizing the return that led you to believe that uh, that was in the best interest of your clients uh, to do so. Um, thank you for the question, um, Senator. So when we look at ESG, we look at material risks and opportunities. So we're looking at unpriced risks in the markets. We're looking at opportunities um, because when we manage the risks and um, 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 invest in the, in the opportunities, we maximize the returns for our clients. Okay. How does decarbonization uh, play into that? Where, where, how does it fit in maximizing the return on investment? What, it, what, is it, what does it contribute? So we, we look at a um, variety of climate risks, um, and this is something that has material climate risks, and this is something that has been mandated actually by the SEC since the 70s. So we look at material crime, climate risks and how they could impact a portfolio, and that's how we, 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 we look at that for the portfolio and to generate the returns we're looking for. What about gov governance? How does that materially affect the investments you make that says, by, by this, we know we're going to get more return? 
governance, um, good governance is um, one of the foundational drivers for long-term performance. A well-governed company is a company that is going to produce well for its shareholders. And there are a lot of studies that show the link between governance um, and performance. And that is why it's actually the, the, the core of our stewardship function is looking at good governance. environment is, is one of the major elements of, of ESG. And as much as the United States has one of the cleanest environments in the world, what, what do you see as the benefit to your clients in the United States uh, of the ESG policies as much as we are already the cleanest in the world? We're very proud, actually, um, to be in, in a country that um, you're, you're absolutely right, sir. It is one of the cleanest producers I'm, I'm of energy. Too. I'm, I'm asking, yep. what is the benefit? What is the added benefit? We're already there compared to the other countries. Um, may, may, I, may I answer your question, sir, by giving you a, a bit of a simplified example, but um, it's sort of how I, I, I think about it. Um, if we are um, looking at investing in real estate on a shoreline, um, for example, the shoreline of Florida, um, two real estate, commercial real estate, exactly the same building, uh, buildings, um, same year, same materials, same construction, same usage, same everything. One is two feet above sea level, one is 20 feet above sea level. That is climate risk. This is how you think about it. And one would be, would have more unpriced risks than, than the other. How did BlackRock come to embrace ESG policies? Was that developed internally, or what entity or group brought that to you? Thank you for the question. Um, so the, the governance, the, the G, this has been a core for engagement and stewardship for decades. This, this is not a, a new piece, good governance, uh, good performance. Um, the, the E as, um, you know, the SEC has had, and actually for the S as well, material E and S risks. Uh, U.S. public corporations have been required to disclose them ever since we've sort of had the idea of material risks being disclosed by companies. So these pieces are actually not new pieces in capital markets. The new pieces that you're seeing today are more regulators globally looking at more consistent, comparable disclosures, um, but these are not new concepts, sir. At the beginning, Senate Cole Cross read off a summary of reports and pointed out that those companies embrace ESG perform more poorly than those who don't. If your real objective is a return on investment, and Florida is a good example where you obviously are not performing as well as others are, why would you continue to embrace these policies when it, it is keeping you, obviously, from uh, maximizing the return on investments? Um, Sarah, I, I really hear your concerns, and I, I think the context, you know, really matters. So for ESG funds, by way of example, in the United States, we have 66 ESG funds that because our investors are demanding these funds. That is out of over 600 funds. Um, so, and globally, it's about 5% of our global assets because investors want to have these funds. In terms of performance, and I appreciate there are a lot of studies here, a lot of studies on this one, um, but a lot of them, quite honestly, they're a little bit um, apples to oranges. If you look at apples to apples, if you look at ESG indices compared to their non-ESG counterparts, non-sustainable counterparts, we did a study in a three-year period, 76% of time, they actually outperformed their non-sustainable counterparts. If you're comparing the right time frame to the right thing, they are outperforming. That said, sir, we appreciate people have different views about this. Definitely appreciate that. We appreciate it's their money, not ours, which is why we offer choice, not just in investment products, but proud to also offer it in voting. It's all for now. If I can, one last thing. Senator Bencourt, one more. Um, 
I'd like for the committee to hear from the uh, public statement of the Florida's chief financer, chief financial officer, Jimmy Petronas, because the witness says that she's uh, completely um, uh, clueless as to why BlackRock has been uh, uh, has been eliminated from uh, uh, the, the state of Florida's uh, uh, financial uh, uh, operation and. Uh, I'll just, it's a very long statement, but I'll read one paragraph because I think it's important. Whether stakeholder capitalism or ESG standards are being pushed by BlackRock for ideological reasons or to develop social credit ratings, the effect is to avoid dealing with the messiness of democracy. I think it's undemocratic of a major as asset managers to use their power to influence social outcomes. If Mr. Fink, that's paraphrased, or his friends on Wall Street want to change the world, run for office, um, start a nonprofit. Uh, using our cash, however, to fund BlackRock social engineering project is not something Florida ever signed up for. It's not something, it's not, it's, it's got nothing to do with maximizing returns. It is the opposite of what an asset manager is paid to do. Florida's Treasury Division is divesting from BlackRock because they have openly stated they've got other goals than producing returns. You, you are a highly placed person to work for CEO. You have no idea until now what the state of the Florida's CFO said or why you were fired. Um, this is, by the way, dated December 1st, 2022. Um, respectfully, Senator, I, I, we, I had um, seen that. Um, then why did earlier, did you say you had no idea why you've been fired by Florida? Why, why BlackRock was fired by Florida, if you'd seen this? Sir, I have no idea why we were fired by Florida, because we have been producing investment returns. The, you know... Um, returns matter, and returns is what we do, and our our returns are out there. Our performance is, is out there. 89% of our fixed, active fixed incomes performed above peers, 89% just, for just, five years. Just, just so we're clear, and, and get the, yeah, good question. We're going to get to that. The peers are often European companies. Uh, let's talk about this just as we go forward, just so we can have a real dialogue yes, and sir. really listen to each other and, and both ways. Senator Betancourt has hit on a very important point, and it reminds us of what you and I engaged with earlier. The CFO for the state of Florida said, here's why we fired BlackRock. He just read it, and you said you'd read that before, but you told us you don't know why Florida fired you. That, that's a problem. It seems, respectfully, it seems, like what we're learning is BlackRock says whatever it needs to say to whoever it's talking to at the time. That's what we're experiencing today. Now, on that, let me ask you this question. Just refresh. We just refreshed the website, and it still says, your website still says, we have joined Climate Action 100 to help ensure the world's largest greenhouse gas emitters take necessary action on climate change. It's 11.03 a.m. Do you still disagree with that statement on BlackRock's website? So yes or no? I, 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 I will stick with what I explained as... So you disagree with the statement on BlackRock's website still? Sir, um, this is a statement, I don't know the context around what's before it, what's after it. What I can tell you is that with respect to Climate Action 100 and our letter with, with that entity is public, it's out there, and I believe we gave it to the committee, we act independently, and we do not commit our clients' assets. We are independent in how we invest and in how we vote. So the website is a problem. Let's see if a letter signed by the founder and CEO is something you can agree with, something BlackRock agrees with at the moment. Uh, we're going to put up uh, a letter written to CEOs, uh, Larry Fink. You've probably seen that before. You've probably seen that document before. Do you recognize it? Um, yes, sir. And is it the January 2020 annual letter to CEOs from BlackRock CEO Larry Fink? Uh, that that's what it looks like, yes, sir. So before we get into details, can we generally agree that CEO Larry Fink can speak for BlackRock? Yes, sir. So if he says BlackRock is doing X, we should believe him? He is our chief executive officer and the leader of our firm. So if he says BlackRock is doing certain things and not doing other things, we should believe him, right? Uh, he, he's Yes, he's our CEO. Oh, good. So... 
I understand these issues come out each year, these letters come out each year, Mr. Fink, to all the CEOs of publicly traded companies. Is that your understanding, letters like this? He um, writes to the CEOs of um, companies in which our clients are invested. But the annual letter, as the name would suggest, comes out annually, right? Um, yes, sir. So it's kind of a big deal. People pay attention to this when he writes one of these letters, right? I, I, will, I will take your word for it, sir. What's the purpose of the annual letter to CEOs? Um, our CEO has been writing these letters um, for about a t decade or so at this point, and he shares, he writes them as a fiduciary to our clients. Um, I believe he has that, yeah, um, every, the very big first paragraph, he notes that he writes as a fiduciary to our clients, and he uses these letters to share his insights into what he sees are long-term drivers of value. We are not short-term investors. Given that the majority of the assets we manage are retirement assets, we are long-term investors, and our record and our success story in that regard speaks to itself. So you're okay if he speaks for BlackRock and we believe what he says? Um, sir, um, our CEO is um, our, our founder, our chief executive, and he is the leader of the firm. I'm going to take that as a yes so we can move on. The second paragraph of the letter says, I'm going to quote from the letter, climate change has become a defining factor in companies' long-term prospects. And that paragraph concludes with Mr. Fink telling CEOs that he, quote, uh, believes we are on the edge of a fundamental reshaping of finance. That, did I read that right? Um, I, I cannot see from here, but I will, I will take your words so that you're at, you're at that. And I bet that's not the first time you've heard those words, is it? Um, I, I have read this letter, so okay. yes, sir. So, uh, uh, before this letter, before this letter, what was the purpose of finance from the perspective of an, asset, of an asset manager like BlackRock? Before this letter came out, what was the purpose of finance? Before this fundamental reshaping, what was the purpose of finance? Um, Mr. Chairman, the purpose of the capital markets and finance has always been the same before this letter, during this letter, after this letter, and that's looking for opportunities um, in the markets and managing risks in the markets to produce the best returns we can. So what did Mr. Fink mean by the financial reshaping of finance? Um, thank you for that question. I, I don't know exactly, you know, the context of exact reshaping. What, now, I, can't, what I can't say. you've seen this letter. This is the annual letter to CEOs. Now, please, don't tell us you don't know about this letter or what it means. Now, come on. What does it mean? What is the fundamental reshaping of finance? Uh, sorry, sir. That, that is not what I meant. To, um, I did not mean to leave you with that impression. If you um, look, for example, at the um, technological revolution in finance and how that you know reshaped sort of the e economy, um, we believe that the transition to a low carbon economy has opportunities and risks, and if managed well, overall, we do believe that will produce better returns for our clients. So before this fundamental reshaping of finance, finance meant managing risk and maximizing long-term return for investors. Is that is that close? I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I'm not sure I understand your question. The purpose of finance was what before this fundamental reshaping took place? The purpose of finance was and is to finance opportunities for our clients, to find the opportunities for our clients, and to manage risks in their portfolios so that we can produce the best risk-adjusted returns. Our purpose with respect to the capital markets remains the same. I'm going to read you a quote from a Reuters article from January 2020. This is not from Mr. Fink, don't worry, or from BlackRock. This is from a Reuters. Uh, and it, the article says, a Reuters analysis in October found the top index fund managers rarely challenge company management and have largely opposed climate change proposal. proposals. In 2018 and 2019, BlackRock and Vanguard only backed around 10% of climate-related shareholder resolutions." Unquote. Just for context, of course, we're talking about those shares that BlackRock holds, 
bought with its clients' money, its investors' money, and BlackRock votes those shares at the annual meetings of various companies, right? So far, so good. Yes, sir. Is that right? Okay. And so we're talking about shareholder resolutions. So a shareholder brings a resolution that says we want the company to do X, Y, and Z. Those can be all across the spectrum, all kinds of issues, right? That's that's correct, sir. Very good. Thank you. Just want to make sure we're tracking. And so climate change proposals. According to this analysis from Reuters, in 2018 and 2019, BlackRock only backed around, voted for around 10% of those climate-related shareholder resolutions. Does that 10% number sound about right to you for the 2018-2019 time period? I know you weren't there, but you're, you're BlackRock today. No, I, I, I appreciate that, sir. I, I presume they, uh, our voting records are public, so I'm presuming they pulled it from the public record, so I'm, I will... I'm sure they pulled it from our public records. So in 2018 and 2019, when, when that 10% number applied, when BlackRock was voting for about 10% of these uh, climate change resolutions, was BlackRock making its voting decisions uh, to maximize return to its shareholders? Um, yes, sir. Was, was climate change a short-term risk to companies in 2018, 2019? I'm, I'm not sure I understand that. The well, I'm not a I'm not a finance person. I know that's your field, but there's short-term risk, intermediate-term risk, long-term risk, and sometimes those are handled differently, and uh, some are more pressing than others. And in some of Mr. Fink's letters, he talks about climate change as a short-term, long-term risk. I'm asking if in 2018, 2019, if climate change was a short-term risk to companies, in your view, in BlackRock's view. So, um, for for BlackRock, given that we um, invest long-term assets, most of the assets we invest are retirement assets. They are not short-term assets. We take a long-term view in terms of risks. But you're not, I don't want to split hairs, but you're not suggesting that BlackRock ignores short-term risk, are you? And no, sir, but um, we look, our core is to look at the long term because our assets are managed for the long term. So in uh, 2018 and 2019, was climate change a long term risk to companies? Sir, uh, climate risk, other environmental risks, um, depending on the industry, um, they've been material risk for companies to consider since the 70s. So that goes back to a question I wanted to ask you earlier. You were talking about climate risk, how that's been mandated by the SEC since the 1970s. I'm still confused by what uh, Mr. Fink meant by this fundamental reshaping of finance. In his letter to CEOs 2020. He, um, in the reshaping of finance, when it comes to the transition to a low carbon economy, um, this is the reshaping, looking at the unpriced risks, looking at opportunities um, in the transition, and we we believe that if managed in an orderly fashion, that could actually produce better risk-adjusted returns for our clients' portfolios. some more questions for you, but I'm going to ask a few questions. But, oh, Senator Colbert, do you have something else for... I, I just want to ask... And, she, and the witness is not being excused. We're just going to give her a little break. I want to ask Senator Bentoncourt, um, when you've referenced Florida many times today, uh, and appreciate your efforts, did Florida have a bill to move or to, to uh, move their funds out of BlackRock, or was that unilaterally done? Senator, uh, my uh, the research I've had, I think the the treasurers uh, and in the case of uh, other states, Louisiana, Miss, uh, Missouri, uh, pulled uh, five hundred million dollars uh, from BlackRock in October, and seven hundred ninety four million from Louisiana, and I think the uh, Florida CFO. Uh, used his, uh, his specific ability to pull 600 
um, remove $600 million from BlackRock. Uh, then he put a custodial freeze of $1.43 million on the billion on the remainder. Um, but that, but the witness might know better than I did. I'm just reading periodic literatures and being stunned by the fact that she didn't know that there was what the issues were in Florida until we read the press release to her. Yeah. Um, do you know if they took legislative action or was this a action by uh, the executive branch or by their retirement systems or their funding systems? Thank you for the question. I, I believe this was by the comptroller, and I um, I am very aware of what he published. I am not aware of why he did what he did, given that we were a well-performing manager on behalf of that account. Mr. Chairman, do we have the ability to make those decisions like Florida and act quickly, or it seems like Senate Bill 13, <laughs> we had to have a Senate bill and uh, to move our teacher retirement system or our ERS t system. Are you aware, do, do we have the ability, uh, does anyone uh, statewide have the ability to make those decisions or does it always have to be a legislative action? Yeah, my understanding is that uh, Senate Bill 13 did empower the comptroller to do some analysis and make some decisions like this. But um, we do have a more decentralized system. We've seen that come up in a number of ways compared to Florida where the governor can fire district attorneys and things like that, the power that we don't have. So it can be frustrating. I think um, I think there's maybe legislative action required from some of these decisions. And I'll defer to the committee, but I, I don't think we have the same authority they do when we're not in session. We love this part, having a part-time citizen legislature that's, we have real jobs and go home and respond to the people. It does sometimes cause state government to move more slowly in Texas, as you, as you well know. Uh, one more thing to close the one more topic to finish that up. We talked about how Reuters indicated that 2018, 2019, Blackhawk was voting for about 10% of climate-related shareholder resolutions. Would it surprise you to know that the same records show that in 2020, after joining Climate Action 100, Blackrock voted for over 50% of all climate-related resolutions? Does that sound right? As I mentioned, sir, our voting record is public, so I'm presuming this is from our public uh, disclosures. And so you don't dispute that? No, sir. So before joining Climate Action 100, um, BlackRock was voting with about 10% of those climate change shareholder resolutions. After joining Climate Action 100, that jumped to over 50%. Sir, may I, may I make um, three points on, on that, if I may? Do we agree? You're not disputing the facts, are you? I'm, I'm not going to dispute what is probably in our public disclosures. Yes, Please sir. go ahead. Um, over 90% of the time, we support management, and that, that is in our public voting record. Over 90% of the time, including the past three years, we support management, and I can give you the numbers. It's over 90%. Second point I'd, I'd like to make is that our stewardship is governed by um, good governance to drive long-term uh, long performance, and we've actually done an analysis of our stewardship here, um, and uh, we see a correlation between our voting and stock performance. So our approach is working. And this year, we have seen a, my third point, sir, we have seen a um, deluge of shareholder proposals that were very, very prescriptive. We did not support them, and we put out a statement in that regard because we do not believe in telling management what to do. We look to management to help us understand their business, their material risks, and how they're managing those risks. But in general, we are, it's the rare case, actually, when we're not supportive of management. Thank you. We're going to have some more questions, but want to want to move over to uh, state seat for for a moment or two. Uh, yes, sir. Welcome back. As you as you know, you're you're under oath, and uh, yes, please uh, introduce yourself. And give us your testimony. We have some questions for you. Welcome. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. And can you hear me okay on the line? All good. Thank you. 
Um, well, Chairman Hughes and members of the Senate Committee on State Affairs, thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify today. Uh, my name is Lori Heinel. I'm the Global Chief Investment Officer for State Street Global Advisors, the investment management arm of State Street Corporation, which is headquartered in Boston, Massachusetts. Today at State Street Global Advisors, we manage over three tr trillion dollars in assets for investors. We partner with many of the world's largest institutions, as well as financial advisors to help create better outcomes for them and the people they serve. We work with more than 2,000 institutional clients, including corporations, governments, and endowments and foundations. We also invest on behalf of more than 30 million defined contribution participants in retiring re retirement savings vehicles such as 401ks. We were among the first asset managers to bring the power of low-cost index and ETF investing to people around the world starting in the late 1970s. In fact, almost 30 years ago, we created the first ETFs here in the United States. State Street Global Advisors is proud to serve a wide range of Texas entities. Specifically in Texas, State Street Global Advisors manages $12.6 billion for re defined contribution retirement plans and $18 billion for state and local public entities. As a broader organization, State Street Global Advisors affiliates are equally committed to servicing our Texas client base, including energy companies. The investment servicing business of State Street Bank and Trust Company has over $864 billion in Texas-based assets under custody and or administration. State Street Bank also makes equity investments in affordable multifamily housing communities in Texas as part of our tax advantage investment group and through our participation in the low income housing tax credit program. Our current LIHTC portfolio includes 75 Texas properties encompassing over 8,000 affordable units. I appreciate the committee's interest in how State Street Global, Adv Global Advisors manages our clients' investments with respect to environmental, social, and governance factors, particularly as it relates to Texas public funds, and I'm happy to share our principles in, the, in that area. First of all, we are a fiduciary. We are obligated to act as a fiduciary for our clients, and that duty is the basis for our approach to all things, including ESG. We believe that company-specific material ESG factors, which could include things like climate impact, but also many other things, such as supply chain management, data security, and the treatment of hazardous waste, to name just a few, have the potential to impact the performance of investment we manage for our clients. Our sole focus is on ensuring long-term value creation for our investors. <coughs> Secondly, we engage with companies in our portfolios we do not divest. As primarily an index manager, we are effectively permanent capital for the companies and the indexes that we are tracking. When we offer, for example, a client an S&P 500 fund, we stay invested in those 500 companies that are part of the index. We do not pick and choose what to invest in. Given this goal, or given this fact, excuse me, our goal is for all of the companies in that index to perform well because that means our clients will do well. More specifically, we do not discriminate against companies in any sector, including energy companies. That means we do not tell those energy companies to shift their strategy or to drill more wells. That is the responsibility of the company management and its board. Today, State Street Global Advisors funds uh, collectively own $144 billion globally in energy-related securities, with $65 billion in firms based in Texas. We believe we are uniquely positioned and incentivized and have a fiduciary duty to encourage portfolio companies to consider long-term risks and opportunities in order to maximize the long-term value creation for our clients. Thirdly, we do vote proxies as a fiduciary for our clients. Part of that duty is, in the, is to vote those proxies in the best interest of our fund investors. 
Now, many of these votes are routine matters where companies are required to seek approval from, for their share, from their shareholders. But in a small minority of cases, votes may be more contentious, including when those votes are prompted by activist investors. For some time, a substantial portion of our client base has had the ability to vote their own proxies if they wish, particularly in separately managed accounts. And this week, we did announce that we would extend voting choice to a wider range of fund investors. But when we do vote as a fiduciary for our funds, we use detailed public guidelines for our voting, which covers most circumstances. And in all cases, when voting our investor shares, our vote is based on independent research and judgment focused on long-term value to the fund. Fourth and finally, we offer clients choices. We are highly transparent, and our clients have all the information they need to make informed decisions around their use of a wide range of products. In addition to broad-based index funds, we offer a variety of sector and other funds focused on our clients' specific needs and preferences. Any State Street Global Advisors investor can choose to invest in fossil fuels or not at their own discretion. In fact, we manage a nearly $40 billion exchange-traded fund that's solely invests in the energy sector of the S&P 500, in which Exxon, Chevron, and Pioneer Natural Resources are among the top holdings. As I previously stated, we take our fiduciary responsibility seriously. In the United States alone, we manage more than $800 billion in retirement assets in North America in the form of defined contribution and defined benefit plans. And we know that behind those big numbers, there are people you represent, like local firefighters, school teachers, and nurses, counting on us for their retirement savings. Thank you for your, the opportunity to testify today, and I welcome your questions. Thanks for your testimony. Thanks for being here. I, I want to. I was talking to your lawyer earlier, and I want to make sure I'm clear. Are you? Do you anticipate uh, leaving before the hearing is concluded today? Well, I will certainly make myself available as long as my services are required, Chairman. Thank you very much. We're certainly not seeking to take advantage of it, but we do have a lot of questions and Understood. a lot of witnesses, and so we do have a lot of questions and a lot of witnesses, and so we just want to make sure. But we did give adequate notice of the hearing, and you're very kind to come, so we hope you'll be able to stay and uh, and answer some questions. Yeah, certainly, as long as my services are required by this committee, I'm I'm definitely willing to stay. Thank Thank you, Thank you very much. Um, Thanks for the introduction and for giving us the overview. Uh, I think you've, you've told us this in your remarks, but how long have you been with uh, State Street? I've been at State Street Global Advisors for over eight years. And I'm glad you said State Street Global Advisors. Uh, help us with State Street Global Advisors versus other entities and how, how that all fits together. Yes, of course. Um, so the parent company is State Street Corporation, which is listed on the stock exchanges. That is the large custodial bank primarily that many of you may be familiar with. Uh, State Street Global Advisors is the asset management division of State Street Corporation. So we are the ones that actually are investing assets that's on behalf of our clients. Does State Street Global Advisors have its own board of directors, or is it governed by State Street Corporation's board? Well, we're not an independent um, company, so we don't have our own independent board of directors. There is a board of directors for Straight, State Street, the corporation. There are, however, uh, mutual funds and, and fund boards which we answer to. And again, uh, that construct is uh, similar to what you may have heard from uh, the previous testimony, where we have different mutual funds, ETFs, other vehicles, and those vehicles have independent boards that govern uh, those, fu those fund complexes. But State Street Global Advisors does not have its own board, no sir. We were talking a lot, of course, about uh, asset stewardship. Yeah. Uh, do you oversee asset stewardship, all asset stewardship? For I'm going to call. How about if I say I may say SSGA yeah. to to uh, yeah. distinguish that between State Street Inc. Yes. But yeah. for State Street SSGA, do you uh, are you over all of that investment stewardship? I do have oversight for the asset stewardship within State Street Global Advisors. Yes, sir. And you may have answered this, but is there a separate asset stewardship committee or a responsibility for each fund, or is there are a committee that does that company-wide? There is not a separate entity for each fund. Our asset stewardship program is centralized, and we exercise our proxy voting responsibilities on behalf of the broader set of funds that we manage. 
And it tells who you report to? I report to the Chief Executive Officer of State Street Global Advisors, uh, recently appointed Yixin Hung. Uh, she joined us just about a week ago. Prior to that, it was Cyrus Terpavala, who was our CEO. Thank you. So it's fair to say you're a senior manager at SSGA. I, I, sometimes I bear that responsibility, yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you for being here on their behalf. Uh, I want to ask you about Climate Action 100, about net zero asset managers, and about mm -hmm. uh, also GFANS, the Glasgow uh, group, and also uh, Ceres. I want to ask you about Ceres. Um, is that a North American investor network made up of asset owners and asset managers? And that's, it, forgive me, I, uh, mm -hmm. I'm from around here. That's C E R E S, Saris series. How do we how do we pronounce that? A Saris is how I thank have you pronounced very much. It, yes, sir. So tell us tell us who is yeah. Saris, yes, who and yes. what is Saris? Yeah. Um, so I, maybe I'll, if you don't mind, I'll start with sort of a broad um, overview of these various organizations and how we think about our participation in those. If that would be okay with the chairman, that would be very helpful. Okay. Thank you. So, so I actually was quite struck by uh, Mr. Brigh Brigham's testimony this morning because much of what he said is actually very aligned with how we think about this space. So he indicated that, and, I, and I'm going to paraphrase, that um, climate change is real. Uh, he indicated that CO2 emissions are contributing to climate change. Um, that would be very aligned with how we think about that space as well. And that's not to suggest that those are the only things that are driving climate change. We all know that climate change has been with us since the dawn of time, uh, but there is certainly uh, evidence that suggests that um, these climate change issues are becoming more acute for us as uh, global citizens. So I, I, I provide that backdrop because our interest in being part of these bodies is to have a voice in what it is that investors need to be aware of as it relates to the impact that their various portfolio companies may be having on the contributing to that particular uh, climate change situation and how those companies are managing the risks attached to that. So when we engage with these entities, um, number one, we want to understand what the best thinking is around um, how to think about climate change. We have our own views on that, but we're looking to other investors and other participants who might have different views or can bring different information to the table. We're trying to understand how these various risks are becoming as important as traditional financial risks that we may have all, always thought about. So we've always thought about things like you know, a company's accounting standards. Standards, uh, things like their leverage ratios and how that how that makes them credit worthy or not. But increasingly, in some of these spaces, we're seeing risks that were not well understood by investors historically. Physical risk, um, that's a, an obvious one, right, to the degree that a company's um, footprint or their supply chains may be disrupted by climate events. That's quite common now. Reputational risks um, in certain jurisdictions, and again, we've probably all seen some news out of Europe recently where they're going to start to impose incremental taxes potentially on companies that they believe are bad actors from a climate standpoint. Um, you know, crises events. Um, certainly, many of these companies are, uh, you know, have susceptibility to various kinds of crises, and how are they managing those risks? Regulatory changes. I just referenced Europe. Again, there are things here in the U.S. as well. Consumer behaviors, et cetera. So, I, I, I again, I, I, I apologize for the bit of a, a rambling statement here, but that's the basis upon which we engage with these entities because we want to understand what things are going to be important for our investors to have disclosure around, and what things is going to be important for those companies themselves to be very aware of and manage from a risk control standpoint. So hopefully that um, addresses your question, Chairman. Uh, that is helpful to give us a framework of how that fits together. And so following on with your question, Saris yes, uh, North America, is Saris a North American investor network made up of invested owners and asset managers? Mm -hmm. And is one of the purposes of Saris, I think you answered this, to coordinate on actions related to climate change? They bring together groups of people to have conversation. They ask us often to you know, state opinions. There are are times when they will um, write 
papers or propositions and they will ask for the um, participants to participate in signatory to those. We in some cases, if we agree with the positions that they are putting forward, we will participate in that process. There are some times we, when we've actually chosen not to participate in that process. So we're part of the group, we engage in the dialogue, but we retain independent judgment of when we are actually supportive of a proposition they're putting forward and times when we might not be as comfortable with that proposition. And so my understanding is that Saris and other investor networks back in 2017 formed Climate Action 100. Is that That's your correct. recollection? Yes. yes, sir. Okay. And I'm going to sometimes call it Climate Action 100 or mm -hmm. CA 100. But is it fair to say that Climate Action 100 is a global initiative led by investors to foster the clean energy transition by engaging the companies and sectors with those highest greenhouse that, gas emissions? Yes, sir. That would be accurate. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, I'm going to read some quotes from their website. Climate Action 100's website entitled How We Work, and it says this, and uh, in signing up to Climate Action 100, investors commit to engaging with at least one of the 166 focus companies and to seek commitments on the initiative's key asks. Does that sound That's, right? That sounds correct. Yes, sir. Uh, there are three asks, and I'm going to quote, uh, the three asks are, quote, to implement a strong governance framework on climate change take action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions around the value chain and provide enhanced corporate disclosure. That's correct, yes, sir. Okay. And then engagements with focused companies are, quote, headed by a lead investor or investors and supported by a number of collaborating investors. Does that sound right? And that is correct language, yes, sir. Okay. And then, then also from their website, uh, Climate Action 100 on their website today describes engagement processes. And here's what it says. Says, lead investors and those engaging companies individually must disclose through a biannual survey their engagement plans and priorities over the coming 12 months to consumers uh, uh, for concerted action. Does that sound right? It does, sir, yeah. yes. Specifically, it says this, investors are, quote, required to liaise with relevant network staff and or lead investors to ensure engagement priorities and ambition are aligned with the goals of the initiative as well as with the overall collaborative approach. Does that sound right? That is accurate language, yeah. yes, sir. And then finally, uh, Climate Action 100 directs signatories to communicate, quote, a central message to their respective focus companies. And then it says, and I'm going to quote one more time, inaction by companies following engagement may result in investors taking further action. Is that yes, correct? Yes, sir. And then we're going to look at a State Street document. Mm -hmm. Similar to this discussion that we that we were getting close to before, uh, and this is a this is a letter from November thirtieth, twenty twenty, mm -hmm. by from State Street Global Advisors about why we are joining mm -hmm. uh, Climate Action one hundred. Does that sound familiar? It absolutely okay. does, yes, sir. Well, you, You've seen that document I have, before. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. On page two, there's a paragraph that says this. In joining Climate Action 100, we look forward to sharing with our peers what we've learned in our engagements with more than 600 companies across multiple industries and markets on climate-related issues since 2014. We are also excited about this opportunity to work closely with other asset managers and asset owners to scale our impact on climate change risks. Did I read yes, that right? Absolutely, yes, sir. And this was from the CEO who yes. said that? Yes, it was. So then... It sounds like the purpose of joining Climate Action 100 was to coordinate with other asset managers uh, to scale each manager's impact on climate change. Fair to say? It is. And, it, and again, if I may provide some context, because sometimes the words matter, right? Um, so when we approach this, our interest is in understanding what the company's issues are as it relates to climate, and making sure they have a good handle on that. In fact, we engaged um, around climate several years ago, long before we signed this particular, signed on for this particular initiative, where we had a very intentional engagement to say 
to companies, we're going to sort of score you on your understanding of your risks. Number one, have you identified any material risks that your company might be faced with as a consequence of its business practices? Number two, to the degree you have identified the, what those risks might be, are you mitigating those risks? Are you doing things to deal with um, the potential um, crisis that might be created or the potential, um, and, and again, this wasn't just related to energy companies, this was related to all companies. because we, So we were really looking for companies who were well managed and understood the risks that were intrinsic in their business and that they were managing those risks. And then third, are you disclosing those risks to investors? Because if you've done the hard work of understanding the risks that you're facing, you've done the hard work of mitigating and managing those risks, and then ideally as an investor we want to know that because that gives us a better sense of how well managed the company is writ large. So that's the context through which the words that you read, Chairman Hughes, are intended is to have an understanding of what those risks are, make sure that we can, uh, that the boards and the companies themselves are, are managing those effectively and that we as investors understand that. Thank you. To follow on with that, we're going to look at another document. Uh, this is uh, from November 30th, 2020. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a document issued by State Street Global Advisors. Uh, Momentum will carry ESG investing far beyond the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that document? I am, yes, sir. At the top of page one, it says, we believe that 2021 could be the transition year for concerted global action to tackle climate change and other environmental and social challenges. Is that yes. right? Yes, sir. If you turn over to page two, uh, you'll see that it says, perhaps the single most significant development in global efforts to tackle climate change this year has been the election of Joe Biden as president, as the next president of the United States. This represents a pivotal shift in the political climate of the world's largest aggregate carbon emitter. Is that right? Yes, sir. Now, that sounds like political factors behind SSGA's decision to join Climate Action 100, doesn't it? So it wasn't intended that way. So I can understand the you know calling that out as being viewed as political. What our so our view at our core is that this does require global coordinated understanding and, and action. And again, I would lean heavily into Mr. Brigham's remarks that we believe that climate change is real and that CO2 emissions globally need to be managed if if we're to you know uh, sort of um, deal with what the potential risks and implications are. I would also say that there has been a lot of activity here in the U.S. which we have been quite um, concerned about. So, for example, some of the um, things coming out of the SEC right now around disclosure on scope one, two, and three emissions, we did write comment letter on uh, the potential for overreach because there are several things that are very complicated around things that, like scope three emissions. So. I, I understand the sense that this may have been uh, politically motivated, but I can assure you our interest is to look at this independently and assess whether um, we, you know, we are collectively, as a society and as a humanity, uh, managing through what we do believe to be some concerning issues with respect to climate. Let me ask you about a related matter, speaking of the federal rulemaking process. Uh, you're familiar with the Labor Department uh, rule under the Trump administration that had to do with yes. ESG investing. Yes, sir. Tell us about that rule. Yeah, so there was a ruling by the Department of Labor that they were uh, putting into place where they, in broad terms, the concern was that companies, uh, asset managers, investors were um, putting ESG issues first uh, and potentially at jeopardizing what they characterize as the pecuniary or financial interests of investors in retirement plans. We actually, um, sorry. Oh, yes. go ahead. Yeah, nice. uh, no, I was, was going to say, so we, so we actually responded to that um, through the lens of our fiduciary responsibility is always to put the pecuniary, i.e. the financial interests of our investors first, always. We also were concerned that our belief is that some of these ESG factors, as I detailed earlier, actually are material financial issues, and there was some concern with the way that that was 
um, constructed that it could put an undue burden on the plan sponsors to prove that they had not incorporated any issues that were not pecuniary in nature. So there were some concerns that we had about how that was characterized. And so in your lobbying efforts, did you express those concerns and oppose the development of that rule during the previous administration? We were quite detailed in the things that we, so yes, we did submit a comment letter and I believe there were almost a thousand comment letters on that particular proposal and we proposed a what we viewed as a balanced assessment of things that we were applauding about that rule and some things that we had some reservations or concerns about. Yes, sir. In addition to that comment, did State Street engage in any other lobbying regarding that rule? I, I don't know specifically. I suspect, or I shouldn't suspect under oath, but um, I know we routinely do talk to policymakers. Um, so during the course of that, we would have had opportunity to talk to policymakers and express that balanced assessment. Yes, sir. It's been widely reported, and it's uh, like it's in dispute that the current administration has repealed that rule, replaced it with a new rule. Uh, did State Street participate in the repeal of the previous administration's rule and the implementation? of this new rule by the Biden administration so similar, on ESG investing pension so, funds. So similarly, we have opportunity to engage in the process. Um, I can get you details of specifically what uh, that looked like as it relates to that. We would have expressed exactly the same position, though, which is that there are some things related to these rules that we applaud, i.e., um, to give investors uh, choices, to make sure that the pecuniary interests are first. Um, and there may have been some things that we were, you know, expressed some reservations around as well. And just as a, uh, a bit of a commentary, I personally, I, I share the committee's concerns that ESG has become such a highly charged, politicized set of letters that we work really hard to make sure we are focusing on those things that are material, that are relevant to the company, and that are ultimately posing risks uh, to that company. That's helpful and, and leads to the next question about yes, the document that we were just looking at. Uh, but before I do that, Please. Uh, you had mentioned you could provide us information about your about yes, the, the, yeah, so lobbying with regard to that. Have a follow we'll have a follow-up of any specific, you know, specifics. I don't recall being drafting a comment letter. Maybe my, my, we my, yeah, we, we talked to staff. I don't recall us drafting a formal comment letter or, or, or related to that, a public, pub, public comment letter. We, we did not. So, oh, we did. Okay, sorry. So we actually did file two public comment letters, and we did have engagement with staff. Yes, sir. So our request would... Oh, go ahead. I don't, want to, I don't want to keep you talking to you longer. That's important. Go ahead. Well, we'll get, we'll get, that, we'll get that detail to the committee. Okay. Yes, and so specifically what we're looking for is uh, state trees engagement, lobbying, not just the formal rulemaking process, but other lobbying for the Trump era rule and the current rule. Does, does that make sense? Yes, sir. You need that in writing, Counselor? Is that good enough? That's good. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And so, Chairman, oh, can you oh, clarify Senator. again what you just asked for? Thank you so much. And so, uh, the Department of Labor, under the Trump administration, issued new rules uh, with, the, I think we would agree, the intent to make sure that ESG was not getting in the way of maximizing shareholder returns. Yes. Uh, State Street engaged in that process. and. Uh, had some concerns, and I think you said you liked some of the rule, didn't like some of the rules. That's so right. they engaged in that process. Uh, the Biden administration has repealed that rule and come out with a new one. State Street was engaged in lobbying on that. Correct. And they're going to, I think you're, the agreement is you're going to get us everything you did through the rulemaking process, through the lobbying on those rules. Is that is that right? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, Senator? Good. And let me pause and may I make the same request of BlackRock. Uh, your, your lawyer's not here, but let's just talk about it for a minute. Is, of course, having been in the Trump administration, you'd be familiar with that rule that the Department of Labor had in place to make sure that our concerns today were being addressed, right? To make sure that ESG wasn't getting in the way, getting in the way of retirees' benefits. The Trump administration had a rule about that. Are you familiar with that rule? I'm familiar with that okay. rule, sir. And was state was BlackRock involved in lobbying, involved in the rulemaking process, engaging at all with the federal government at any branch in the development of that rule under the Trump administration? 
Um, BlackRock did submit a comment letter with respect to the um, 2020 DOL rule as well as the more recent uh, revision to that rule. So my request to you and, and counsel, I can get it in writing if you wanted. Our request would be the committee would like to see any written communications and any record or any lobbying, whether through the administrative process or otherwise, that BlackRock engaged in on the Trump administration DOL rule and on the repeal of that rule and the new rule put in by the Biden administration. Does that make sense? Yes. Sir. Can you do that for us? Yes, sir. Counsel, you want that in writing or is this good enough? Very good. Thank you. And so speaking of shareholder wealth, let's go back uh, yes. to this letter mm -hmm. on page on page two. At the bottom of page two, there's a heading that says, the march from shareholder to stakeholder capitalism. And the text says this, quote, the traditional paradigm of shareholder primacy is shifting toward one in which companies must be seen to act in the best interest of all stakeholders. Did I read that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Is that the traditional understanding of finance and, and a fiduciary duty to maximize shareholder wealth? So first of all, we hold deeply that the primary reason for a corporation to exist is to generate profits and to generate uh, returns for its shareholders. So we are absolutely steadfast in that. We are actually quite concerned about the rise of stakeholder ca capitalism as a class of investing, um, where we use that kind of um, framework is that we do believe that companies who manage all of their stakeholders well will do better in the long term. So that's things like making sure that they're good places to work for their employees. So we did a, um, a um, shareholder engagement a couple of years ago where we were trying to understand a company's human capital strategy and how that human capital strategy aligned with its uh, long-term corporate strategy. That would be an ex example of worrying about something that might not be an immediate shareholder impact, but over time would be a shareholder impact if they have high turnover, unhappy employees, poor products, et cetera. So that's the context in which we think about what it means to think about your stakeholders more broadly. Along those lines, is Climate Action 100 about shareholder primacy, or is, it about, or is it about acting in the best interest of all stakeholders? It is about shareholder primacy because we believe that these climate risks matter and that companies who manage their climate risks better and manage the transition better will do better. So then if it's still shareholder primacy, why are we talking about uh, shifting away from shareholder primacy towards stockholder primacy? So, so I think the subtle, Stakeholder primacy, pardon So I, I believe that the subtle shift that's happened over the last couple of years is that a lot of things that investors didn't have an easy way to understand or quantify are becoming more important to them. And again, I come back to climate's the sort of easy one in a sense because it's it's um, there are lots of very tangible examples. So insurance companies have always known there were hurricanes in Florida, and they've always managed their business to deal with that kind of climate risk. But we've even seen in some of the more recent situations the sheer um, impact has blossomed partly because of the growth of population in, in Florida, partly because of other kinds of considerations. So I, I think that the the struggle that I have, honestly, Chairman, is that these are good, sound investment principles, but sometimes they get reoriented in ways that are not helpful to investors. So if there's language on the website about purpose-driven companies and and social benefits and social wealth, that really is just a new, new, another way of saying maximize shareholder wealth? Well, what we do know, or what we have seen, right, is that the employees today and employees in certain jurisdictions are interested in working for companies that they view as being aligned with them. So that has impact for a company's ability to recruit, attract, retain talent. So, and that's just one example. I'm not saying we're, we're not telling the company 
what to be as a purpose. We're not telling the company what products to manufacture. We're telling the companies to be aware that some of these things will have implications for their business models. That's how we approach that. So when State Street Global Advisors decided to uh, join Climate Action 100, I believe in November of 2020, uh, did State Street Global Advisors or State Street speak with anyone at Climate Action 100 before Yes, that? we would have had conversation, yes, sir. Uh, did you ever speak to Mindy Lubber, president of Saris, about joining Climate Action 100? I did not personally, but I do, I'm familiar with that name, and I do believe we would have had conversations, but I don't know for a fact. We could certainly check the record and get that fact. Will you check on that yes. and, and let us know yes. about communications with uh, personnel at Climate Action 100 before mm -hmm. State Street, Street joined? Mm -hmm. In particular, in addition, uh, include but not limited to Mindy Lover. Uh, who made the decision for State Street to join Climate Action 100? I believe it would have been our then current chief investment officer and our then current chief executive officer on the recommendation of our uh, our asset stewardship team. So did the SSGA board approve it? Again, we don't have an SSGA board per se, sir, so no, it would not have. Um, it would have been more of an executive um, team that would have agreed to do that, yes. So the parent company, State Street Corporation, their board would also not have been involved? They would not have been involved in a, again, confer with counsel, but I don't. I don't believe our, they would have been involved. They would have been notified that we were uh, signing up, but they would not have been approving or disapproving. Uh, did any environmental groups or activist groups ask State Street Global Advisors to join Climate Action 100 or other Net Zero initiatives? So we get outreach from all manner of uh, cli clients, from um, groups, and again, we take the independent decision based on whether we think that those are organizations that are going to provide useful, transparent information and where we want to have a voice. Did any representatives of foreign pension funds or foreign governments ask State Street Global Advisors to join Climate Action 100 or any net zero initiatives? Uh, so again, I'm, I don't know the precise, um, I don't know the answer to that question. We would have to double check where we have communications where, I, I would just uh, again say that it is quite common for investors, other interested parties to reach out to us. We retain the independence of the decision, however. I'm going to ask one more along yeah. these lines, and it's very important. Yes, sir. Did any pension funds that are customers of State Street, such as CalPERS, or Calsters, those large California state pension funds, did they request that State Street Global Advisors join Climate Action 100 or any other net zero initiatives? And again, I would have to get the specific, so I don't know specifically, sir, we will get that information. I would, again, expect that we've had lots of outreach regarding that yeah. opportunity. We, we do need that information. Do you need a formal request, or will you be able to get that to us? Yeah, we can. Very good. I need to know this. Did State Street Global Advisors talk to any of its other pension clients before making this decision? So, again, almost certainly. Again, I don't have the details. Our general... <coughs> way of operating is to have regular conversations with our, you know, broad constituent groups. That would include clients, it would include other, you know, industry bodies, etc. And perhaps the most important question here for our purposes today, mm -hmm. did State Street engage with, check with Texas pension fund clients before so I did not know the answer Climate to that. Action 100 and yeah. agreeing to do some I pretty major stuff. I, I don't know the answer to that. We can fact check that to see if there was. I do not know the answer to that. But they are, those Texas pension funds are your clients. They are indeed, as I referenced in my opening statement, yes, sir. Did you did SSJ, SGA poll any of its non-institutional clients before making the decision to join Climate Action 100? We would not have done a formal poll in that nature. Our, again, our general way that we assess these entities is, is there value that we believe we can get by learning about what that group is doing, sharing uh, what we're doing, and using that as additional input into our independent judgment. There's the chair's intent, uh, by way of aiding folks who are around today to uh, take a brief uh, lunch break. Our 
folks working on the technology need to some time to switch some technology out. And so we'll do it, we'll do 30 minutes. Uh, most folks probably plan on working straight through, but uh, there's great places to eat on the square and not on the square in Marshall. When we return, uh, we will continue this conversation. We'll be shifting into discussions about votes, specific votes that have been taken by BlackRock, by State Street, and of course by ISS. In fact, when we return at 1230, uh, we ask each of these witnesses to remain. We're, we're going to have more questions for you. But when we return at 1230, we'll be uh, hearing from ISS and then coming back to BlackRock and State Street. And so, that's right. So, so we still will be, will be bringing back up uh, these two witnesses. Let me just ask, uh, Ms. Buster, are you going to be around this afternoon? Do you, do you, can you stick around for some more questions? Um, sir, I'll be here as long as you need me. Thank you very much. And I think you've told us, Ms. Heinle, but it, it, will you be around this afternoon? Yes, again, I'll be here as long as the committee needs my services. Thank you. We will be respectful of your time, and thank you for this important discussion. And so, uh, with that, the committee stands in recess until 1230. ...company that assists our clients who are institutional investors in exercising their voting rights as shareholders in accordance with their own unique values and investment philosophies. We are best known for our proxy services where we provide research and recommendations aligned with clients' values and investment philosophies on the agenda items which are on the ballot at shareholder meetings of the public companies in which our clients invest. As part of this offering, we also help clients manage the complex process of voting their shares and reporting their votes to stakeholders and regulators. ISS understands that investors are not monolithic and so we offer numerous voting policy options to ensure that the available policy choices meet the differing needs and values of our diverse client base. Just as investors have different investment time horizons, risk tolerances, and investment strategies, so too they have different ways of assessing how proxy voting serves their investment goals. The services we provide and the process we follow reflect this reality of the marketplace. Our flagship benchmark policy represents the prevailing market view and is arrived at through an annual survey and comment period that is open to investors, corporations, and other stakeholders to help ensure this policy reflects the broader marketplace. We are very transparent with this process, and there is significant information about it on our company website. For the numerous clients whose values and investment philosophies do not align with the prevailing market views reflected in the benchmark policy, we offer customized recommendations that align with the value investment philosophies of those clients. Our core deliverable is a research report with vote recommendations that are again based on the particular policy framework selected by each client. A big part of the process on our end is what I would refer to as the grunt work involved in collecting a large volume of data about each shareholder meeting. We then apply each client's chosen policy to generate vote recommendations for the annual meetings to help inform their vote decisions. Ultimately, ISS is agnostic as to whether our clients support a proposal, reject a proposal, or abstain from voting altogether. ISS's role is not to advocate for the passage or defeat of any particular ballot proposal, but instead to help our clients make fully informed voting decisions in light of their chosen voting policies and their own goals and priorities. We have had the pleasure of serving the state of Texas through both the teacher retirement system of Texas and the employees retirement system of Texas for many years as their proxy advisor. We recognize that we are here today in part because we let down our long-term client ERS this year in assisting them with several critical vote recommendations. 
As we are a client-focused company, we deeply regret we've disappointed the state of Texas. We are actively engaged with ERS and TRS to ensure that similar issues do not arise in the future. Thank you for having me here today. I am pleased now to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. May I ask a very basic rudimentary question, if I may? Yes, sir. Um, because I've heard the word independent thrown out a lot today in testimony. And in, in your first sentence, you said you're an independent company. Independent of what or whom? Uh, so <clears throat> we are not a public company. So we are a private company, and we do have uh, shareholders, but we have a very arm's length arrangement with them so that all of our research and our policies are generated without interference. Interference being undue influence, or? They aren't involved in the process at all. Okay. okay. Members' questions on um, Senator Colcourt, do you have a question? Or Senator Betancourt, you're recognized. Uh, th th thank you uh, for recognizing the obvious about these uh, um, these votes in Texas, but I've, I've got to understand several uh, several points on this. First off, you said ISS is agnostic. So how did you advise ERS four times to vote by proxy to vote against Texas energy projects? We unfortunately did not have enough dialogue with uh, TRS, ERS to understand their view on that particular issue. And so the policy that we had, we thought we were voting or recommending in their interests, sir. Well, that clearly means you were recommending a policy that you believe was correct and that, uh, so that came from where? From ISS, obviously? No, sir. The policy was a policy, a custom policy put in place. Uh, with ERS. Okay, well, if you if you say that you can't, you said that you you didn't have enough dialogue with the Texas um, employee retirement system or the you know or the uh, the teachers retirement system. How can you say that uh, that? I mean, where did this come from? A vacuum? Did it spontaneously come out that 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 uh, that you're telling TRS and IRS to vote no on uh, Texas energy projects? The policy that we had, we interpreted that we should be voting in that direction. If I could step back for a moment, uh, Senator Betancourt, and just comment, and I think we heard earlier that there were some unique parts of 2022 as it related to shareholder proposals. And those four issues were shareholder proposals. So uh, the SEC had changed a rule that, in a sense, um, loosened the reins on shareholder proposals. And what we saw was an unprecedented number of shareholder proposals that hit the ballot, as well as new issues that hit the ballot. And so in that regard, there were new issues that we had not seen before, and we, again, looked to the policy as that framework and made the recommendation. Okay, for the people listening or watching on Senate media at this point, you basically, ISS advised... ERS to vote no on four Texas energy projects. True? Yes, sir. We gave a recommendation in that regard. Okay, and, and this recommendation was based upon your interpretation of what exactly? Because you mentioned interpretation. I'm trying to understand of, of the, what it is. Of their voting policy, sir. So you as the fiduciary financial advisor interpreted the Texas employee retirement systems intent to vote no on Texas energy projects because of, and you, of what, really? Because of the, the contents of their policy. I should add that when, as soon as we became aware these particular votes were clustered, as soon as we became aware of the issue, we quickly pivoted, changed the policy, and ensured that all votes and all recommendations moving forward were consistent with the ERSU. Okay, but my question is where, if, you know, if, 
I, I'm, I'm trying to understand because I'm in a I'm in a logical loop here. I don't understand how you can interpret ERS. If, but you said you didn't have enough dialogue, so the interpretation must have come from yourselves as the fiduciary, the responsible responsible for the recommendation. Am, am I missing something? We looked at the policy, we looked at the issue, and we made the recommendation based on the policy, sir. We did that in good faith. Okay. And to the extent, again, when we were informed by ERS that was not the correct direction, we quickly pivoted. Okay. Well, pivoted is an understatement, okay? Um, this is Texas. We have an energy core business. We have you know, substantial severance taxes. We have, um, uh, you know, 100 year plus, you know, investment in Texas energy. So how could you possibly interpret or even self uh, and analyze any type of uh, uh, any type of vote that you would recommend to the t employee retirement system. This is the state employee retirement system, and you're telling them as their fiduciary to vote no on four energy t Texas energy projects. Unfortunately, sir, that was the situation. Okay, but how how did it occur exactly? Who interpreted what? to come up with this aghast, you know, appalling, horrible decision by, you know, contrary to not only the interest of the employees of the state of Texas, but to Texas taxpayers. Our custom research teams interpreted the policy and believed that that was the correct direction. Okay, so the cu customer service team is who? Uh, no, our research team, sir. Customer research team headed by who? I mean, ultimately headed by our global head of research. And again, we had a policy that we believe directed us to do so. Okay, you had a policy that directed you to do it. Is that a policy from ISS? No, that was the ERS policy, sir. Okay, well, if you've already said that you didn't have enough dialogue, how could you say that there was a policy from the employee retirement system that you were following to make these four recommendations votes against Texas energy projects of the, the entire uh, you know, employment retirement, the employee retirement system in the state of Texas. Yeah, uh, Senator Betancourt, as I had indicated, and perhaps not clear enough, there was a new type of proposal, that particular proposal, so we looked at that within the framework of the policy. That is where we should have had additional dialogue. Again, we are very clear now okay, and have continued that. Okay, what type of that. new proposal or type of, what, what type of newness are we talking about here? Literally, the pr proposal to um, the, the fossil fuel financing, the withholding of fossil fuel financing was a new type okay, of proposal. Okay, so the withholding of, so the recommendation was to withhold, um, withhold all fossil fuel financing. I'm paraphrasing, but it was essentially to align with the net zero, and a part of that is obviously a financing policy consistent with that. Okay, so you've, you had a recommendation to withhold all fossil fuel financing, and somehow the head of the Global Research Department at ISS thought, imagined, created, conjured up that this would be the appropriate recommendation to the state of Texas employee retirement system being the energy capital of the world and, and didn't have to go to school to figure that one out, the global research head made that recommendation. So the global research head did not, but ultimately within the team, that recommendation was made, sir. Okay, so what level of the team, who made, who made this recommendation? The gentleman that made the recommendation is no longer with our firm. Okay, the gentleman's no longer there. So is there the team and the team this person headed, their gentleman headed is still in operation? Yes. And, uh, and sir, you know, we do look to the policy as a document to guide us, and that policy is built through dialogue with our clients. And as I said, the difference with this year was there were things that no one expected. And so we've recognized that we have to evolve our engagement and then use additional tools to ensure we're communicating. Now, I heard that after that experience and after the, we had a hearing in Senate Fairs on this that 
the very next day that somehow TRS voted against one of the fossil fuel projects too based on your recommendation as well? I am not aware of that, sir. Okay, then we'll ask that when we get closer to this. Now, um, so do you, my astonishment, it's unbelievable, okay, that you would have a research team decide that somehow without input from the client, that somehow that there should be basically a, a ban on fossil fuel, um, uh, you know, projects. I, I, and in fact, uh, why aren't you fired? I, I'm just saying, why, did, why are you not fired at this point in time? Do you believe that you should be for that type of, I mean, you're, you've, you've recommended to the Employee Retirement System of Texas four times to basically nix all fossil fuel investments. And I hate to say it, Texas is built on fossil fuel investments. And sir, if either ERS or TRS determine that they want to fire us, we will certainly be disappointed. We hope that we have corrected this error and that our long tenure of working with them, where we haven't had errors, has some merit and some value. As I acknowledged in my opening statements, um, we were very disappointed that this happened, and we've worked very quickly to ensure that it won't, and to engage in significant dialogue and find ways to ensure that that does not occur. Ms. I appreciate your statement at this point, okay, because, but it's, it's almost, um, I, I got to understand the corporate bias that led a research team to somehow, I guess, dispense all rational judgment that a fossil fuel ban on projects would be acceptable recommendation to the Texas employee retirement system. And, and because it's, it's almost preposterous on its face. It, it was not a corporate bias, sir. Okay. It was a mistake. It, it was a, is this an individual decision? And, and do you recommend other fossil fuel project bans to other clients based upon the same conditions that you went through? Every policy, every custom policy is unique, sir. Okay, but you don't have any bias in any other comp any other environment we, that I've, would lead that would lead somebody else to be given the same disastrously poor advice because it is by any fiduciary. Uh, recognition of the obvious, recognition of where your client is, um, it's uh, recognition of how state government is funded, how employee salaries are made, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an unbelievable recommendation by a major financial fiduciary. There is no bias, sir. As I said, we don't have an agenda. Okay. Um, and uh, but even though this has happened more than once with our two different funds, from what I understand, um, you say that there's no bias on this agenda at all. There is not. Well, I will tell you that I'm sorry. I'm beyond disappointed. My recommendation stands to the ERS and TRS um, that uh, I would I would have terminated your group immediately because it is a. Um, it's a lack of recognition of the obvious. It's a lack of recognition of your responsibility as financial fiduciary to have that type of dialogue. For anybody in a global research team not to understand the meaning of the word Texas, T-E-X-A-S, when it comes to energy, is preposterous. And for them to assert their own obvious feeling or, or a belief into that equation to the employee retirement system of Texas, it, it's staggeringly wrong. It's stunningly wrong. That's why I asked if you felt like you should be fired. I'm not talking about you personally, but I'm talking about your company. Because I believe you should be. Because there's some performance that makes a difference. And I, I totally disagree with this, this uh, ESG scoring system. I totally disagree with the concept of having a ban on fossil fuel projects. But the fact that you would recommend it to the Texas Employee Retirement System once, twice, thrice, four times. Is, 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 in my opinion, just prima facie evidence that your contract should be terminated. 
Do you have a comment? I appreciate your position, and as I've indicated, if we are fired, we would certainly be disappointed, but we believe that we have remedied this situation, and I think ERS and TRS would support the statement as well. Well, we'll have TRS up, I th think, later uh, at the chairman's discretion. Thank you for your direct responses. Thank you, sir. I may disagree, but I can handle somebody saying what they think is truth. When they don't bring up truth, I can't handle it. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Senator Bencourt. Let me, uh, before I come to Senator Colcourse, Senator Hall, did you have, uh, did you want to, okay, me, before I come to Senator Colcourse, in your, in your opening statement, Ms. Kelly, you used the word agnostic. I took that, so I want you to correct me here if I've misunderstood. Um, I thought that the context of the use of the term agnostic was in making policy decisions that you were simply an executor, not to, not to use uh, a, a flippant parallel example, but you're the traffic officer moving votes back and forth, but you're not the, you're moving the flow of votes, but you're not impacting the content of those votes is how I took that word agnostic. But then based upon your conversation with, uh, based upon your conversation with Senator Betancourt, I'm sorry, based upon that conversation, you're recommending certain types of votes, which would strike me as diametrically opposed to the term agnostic as you used it in your opening statement. So please clarify in my mind what your function is at ISS. As I'd indicated, we are a service company to the investors, and we are a policy-based organization. The investors select the policies. We make the recommendations based on that policy. We don't have an agenda, was my point on agnostic. So we are making a recommendation, but it's based on what our clients are directing us to do. And in this case, the client was the state of Texas. And what direction did you receive from the state of Texas that would cause you to, to make the four votes recommendations that you did? We had a policy document from the state of Texas, and when we looked at the content of that policy document, our teams believed that that was the direction that the vote should go in. Was there anything, I'm not seeing the document, is there anything in that document that should have told you that, that you needed to revisit that given the state of Texas uh, historical energy production uh, over the last century? So the research teams focus on the policy document, so they're not necessarily looking at kind of news and legislation. That the, the document itself governs it. What I was trying to articulate earlier and perhaps didn't was that there is a newer proposal type uh, that we looked at within the framework of the existing policy. And, and that okay. is how that vote came to be. Thank you, Ms. Kelly. Senator. Uh, 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 of course, you're recognized. Thank you so much. Um, let me kind of walk this through and make sure I understand everything. So ISS's U.S. guidelines state that the, and I quote, the overall principle guiding all vote recommendations focuses on how the proposal may enhance or protect shareholder value in either the short or long term. Um, and it, you, you go on to say the guidelines further provide multiple factors that apply when evaluating environmental and social proposals, including whether the company has already responded in an appropriate and sufficient manner to the issue, whether the proposal's request is unduly burdensome or overly prescriptive, and whether reasonable and sufficient information is available from the company or other public sources. Now, to Senator Benton court's issue. I mean, when you kind of look at us as a shareholder in the state of Texas, you know, uh, I, I, I think oil and gas is number one, second only to agriculture, second only to then finally tourism. Um, now, you know, I mean, we've, t <laughs> thank you, Senator Bentoncourt, when you said you're totally against ESG. I mean, ESG is eventually going to get to Agriculture, so you're already attacking the number one industry in the state of Texas with oil and gas. We're going to get to agriculture, and we're supposed to, I think, eat crickets instead of beef or something like that. Um, having said that, but I, I digress. This is what I really want to get to. 
you state in your 2023 updates to your voting guidelines. So that's the newest. I mean, we're, we're still barely in 2022. Um, that quote, and I quote, for companies that are significant greenhouse emitters, which you define as companies on the Climate Action 100 plus focus group list, that you will recommend voting against their board members unless the company acts to set appropriate GHG emission reduction targets. This is precisely, absolutely precisely why we passed Senate Bill 13, the author sits to my left, to ensure our state pensions were not supporting these types of actions, and yet our pensions are still doing business with you. And I'll just be honest, the reason that we're still doing business with them, Senator Bittencourt, is because your company was the only one to bid their proposals. Is that correct? I don't know that we were the only ones to bid. Um, that would not be my information. But what you've read is our benchmark policy that we recently announced for 2023. And I think as you've heard today from some of the other investors, the issues of climate change are very much in the marketplace and through the surveys that we have articulated, that is the feedback that we have received. So the benchmark policy does reflect that. Now, your pensions, neither one are using our benchmark policy. And that is exactly how ISS should work. That a organization says, I don't have this view, I want another view. And so they both have custom policies and I can say we're actively engaged um, with TRS in particular with a discussion of a policy that I'll simplify it, uh, focuses on the G and not the ENS as a standard offering within the ISS set of policies. The G being Well, the governance. I mean, I think it's hard to cut out governance when you're looking at well, and, directors and, uh, and management. I, I think that's great. But, you know, I earlier brought up FTX, who on their governance part of scoring got a higher scoring mark then ExxonMobil. They were doing their finances on Quicken Books. They literally did not have a CPA on staff. They had a two-member board. Hopefully people are gonna go to jail. It will be the largest fraudulent action probably in the history of the United States of America. And they got a higher governance score than ExxonMobil. That was not an ISS score, Senator. So I know, I, I can't, but it's out there. Right. If, if it's scored like that, right. I, I can't, I mean, we're getting to the whole problem here. Right. And this is a major issue. And so I think, again, um, it's disappointing that we're passing a bill, Senate Bill 13, and yet you know, we watch our proxy get voted incorrectly. You know, um, I'm, I'm glad to see that y'all have made maybe the correct moves and, and proper um, corrective action, uh, but you know, I, 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 I again want to state the number one industry in the state of Texas is oil and gas. Number two is agriculture. And can I go on down the line? Well, when you look at ESG, it's fundamentally uh, changing. Um, probably the richest state in the union, uh, I would say. And 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 you know, obviously, um, everybody is moving here for a reason. So, I, I you know, I want to also you know, talk about what, what, what's good for Texas. That's what we're elected to do. Um, you know, I'm off the campaign road and, you know, there, there wasn't, uh, you know, among top issues, everyone wants to know that our grid is going to perform correctly. And, and so we, you know, get to the point where um, the, the, the chairman brought up uh, AEP and the coal plant that they've now been incentivized to to mothball or um, actually just completely put out of uh, a, a commission and then move more uh, to uh, turbines and solar, which again leads to more instability on the grid. So I, I do think that uh, 
it's, it's very difficult. I, and I have to ask this. I think as far as your type of company, there's really only two major players. It's you and? It's a company called Glass Lewis, yes. Why are there only two of you in the United States? I think it's just a hard job, ma'am. It requires a lot of people and a lot of data and information in order to um, execute. Well, if anybody's listening, there's a chance I'm a big believer in capitalism. Um, yeah, I think you were the only one that voted on our proposals. So we really have no place to turn. And yet, you know, um, as Senator Bencourt said, you know, should we fire you? Well, we have nobody to back you up. So um, I, I appreciate you being here. I, I reserve the right to continue to ask questions, uh, Mr. Chairman. I know my colleague, Senator Bencourt, has some. Senator Bencourt, follow up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Kelly, I've got to read this to you. Um, on pages 16 to 17 of ISS proxy voting guidelines for 2022, ISS states that for companies that are on the Climate Action 100 plus focus group list, ISS will generally vote against relevant directors if the company does not implement in quotes, appropriate greenhouse gas emission reduction targets that must increase over time. That does not sound like an agnostic position by ISS. As I had indicated earlier, Senator Betancourt, our policy is arrived at through annual surveys in the marketplace, investors, companies, other stakeholders and the survey direction is to be more focused on the high admitting companies and that's why you see that reflected in that policy okay well but that means this is not agnostic okay let me read it to you again okay uh, let me read this to you again i want everyone to hear this okay on pages 16 and 17 of ISS's proxy voting guidelines for 2022, ISS states that for companies that are on the Climate Action 100 plus focus group list, ISS will, quote, generally vote against, unquote, relevant directors if the company does not implement a, quote, appropriate, in parentheses, greenhouse emission reduction targets that must, in quote, increase over time, unquote. How is this an agnostic policy? Because I, it's, it's one thing to say you've got a fiduciary responsibility, but again, let me read this. If the company does not implement appropriate greenhouse emission reduction targets, that must increase over time. Again, the benchmark policy is developed with market input. It reflects the marketplace. From our perspective, as I said, ISS develops our policies and our, our process based yeah, on what we hear from ISS the market. This is an recommendation. This isn't you having it's, apologized it's, for not talking it's, to the it's employee our, retirement system and understanding that they live in Texas and therefore Texas Energy. This it, is a default policy by ISS. It is our benchmark policy, and if a client chooses to utilize our benchmark policy, they understand that that is the position. Okay, well, that means the benchmark policy is not agnostic. This is not an agnostic statement. This is an activist statement. It is by any measurement, I understand. Do you wish to disagree? I, again, I just tell you, we are working within the marketplace and we are client focused, sir. I understand you're working and, in the marketplace, and, but this and, is not an agnostic statement. I will read it one last time, give you one last time to answer this question. If the company does not implement appropriate greenhouse emission reduction targets, that must increase over time. You're going, ISS will generally vote against relevant directors. That's not an agnostic statement. It is a statement within our benchmark policy. I indicated ISS was agnostic. That benchmark policy is a reflection of the marketplace, sir. But, but that's ISS's recommendation. So it's not just, it's your, it's your company's recommendation in black and white on pages 16, 17 of your proxy voting guide. It is correct, it is an ISS recommendation, sir. Boy, the benchmark I'm really policy. really disappointed in that, okay? Um, I'm disappointed that somebody would come and say that this is agnostic. Because it's not, it's activist. 
specifically against in, in, in what ISS obviously is targeting, appropriate greenhouse emission reduction targets that must increase over time. We have other policies that don't offer that, sir, and it's the choice to the investors. But this is the policy you're defaulting to. It's not agnostic. It's a default activist statement in black and white. So, I mean, I, I'm giving you a chance to retract the agnostic statement because it's not, a, you're not agnostic. It's clearly evident in writing in your proxy statement. Am I missing it? I, you know, again, I don't, I believe the company is agnostic. I think the policy is a reflection of the marketplace. Not the policy is the company's policy. There's no differentiation between the company and the policy if it's on page 16, 17 of your proxy voting guidelines. There isn't. You could say there is, but there's not because it's not. It's not the ERS policy. It's not the TRS policy. Which, by the way, um, Mr. Chairman, I do want to uh, correct something I said. The TRS issue was not an energy issue. It was another issue uh, uh, that was uh, that was a proxy vote on. See, if I'm saying something, I correct it. Why can't you? This is not an agnostic statement. This is ISS's proxy voting guidelines for 2022. Why can't you correct it? It's not, the company is not agnostic when it says, ISS will generally vote against relevant directors if the company does not implement appropriate greenhouse gas emission reduction targets that must increase over time. I believe it's a difference of opinion, sir. There's no difference of opinion because this is all the ISS opinion. It's all on page 16. And your opinion that the company is agnostic, you work for the company. Yeah, you know, sorry to say I have to strongly disagree because this is your statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, Senator Bettencourt. Um, Mr. Chairman, do you want to take a gavel back or do you want to you do? Ahead, you. Okay. Senator Hall, you had a question? Yes. You're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just back up a little bit, go a little bit higher in the, in the level of questions here. What, what is the purpose, objective of your participation and your advice that's given? The advice that ISS provides our investor clients based on a particular policy is on a vote recommendation. But, what, what, but for what ultimate purpose? To, to for, for, reduce incomes, reduce revenue? I see what you're saying. Grow business, lose business? What, what you're giving them advice that they hopefully would use to do what? You know, I would say, if I, generally speaking, it would be enhance that shareholder value. Again, we have different clients that have different um, policies and different philosophies, right. but I would say it would enchant, enhance shareholder value long term. Okay. okay, so what data or scientific evidence do, would you use to base a recommendation on greenhouse gases will help improve shareholder value. The information that we're really looking at is all the public data and whether we think that there is um, a risk uh, associated there, with that. I can show you public data that shows that's a, that is just baloney or actually it costs money. It is costing the state of Texas dearly to be complying with green energy with solar and wind. It is costing us dearly for that. But so I'm looking at what it, specifically what is it, what report, what study that shows if you as a company embrace the green energy philosophy, you will enhance your shareholder value. You will increase your net revenue. Where is that information and data that supports that? I don't have that information or data, sir. Okay. But it must be there somewhere or you wouldn't have reached that conclusion, would you? It is a broad conclusion based on, again, what we are hearing from the marketplace, what that they would like us to implement in that, in that base proposal. Is it, is it from the broad marketplace or is it from the selected marketplace that supports the predetermined conclusion that you're going to make that recommendation? It's the broad marketplace, sir. As I was indicating, we go into a lot of surveys. I'd love to see the analysis that, we've done, that was done that supports it just on that, on the greenhouse gases. We skip all the rest of it. That, that if you will invest in the reduction of greenhouse gases, 
your your share shareholder value is going to skyrocket. And sir, I think that, and I, I think I heard um, the investors talk about this previously. In many cases, it's about the risk management of those particular activities. So it's not always looking at performance, but it's the risk management piece. But we can certainly look into well, we that. Go together. I mean, you can't have one, one without the other. And I, I, granted, I, I recognize risk and risk management and so on, but the element of the part of the piece of it, or whatever they're doing for, for pursuing the greenhouse gas reduction has, has risk issues associated with it. I'm talking about just the general policy if you're going to pursue, if you will pursue the greenhouse gas policy reduction, your investments are going to go up if you do your risk management right. That I would like to see. Where is the the analysis and the data that that's based on as being good advice? I do not have that information at the time, sir. At this time, sir. I would, I would, I would Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask that we be provided with that information because I think. Without that, it's all pure speculation. The statements of based on broad market uh, input and comments like that are general, nice for general conversation. But I think we're trying to be very specific here in, in trying to relate policy with with direction advice being given. And, and this is one where I'd like to see a, you know, the analysis that was there. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, do you have a council here that can take that for a, as a statement for, or a, a uh, yep, we can look uh, into what we have. question for the record sure. and the committee can expect that or do we need to put it in writing? No need to put it in writing. Okay. All right. Senator Hall, you. That's good. Let me, let me uh, if I may, Mr. Chairman, I want to, Senator Betancourt, would you read that section again that you read about how the ISS can override the company board. Would you read that again? On pages 16 and 17 of ISS proxy voting guidelines for 2022, ISS states that for companies that are on the Climate Action 100 plus focus group list, ISS will, quote, generally vote against, unquote, relevant directors if the company does not implement, quote, appropriate, uh, in parentheses, in brackets, greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets that must be, quote, increased over time, unquote. Okay. So based upon that statement, Senator Bertencourt, that would, the ISS would not override a company that was not on that 100 list, that was not a member of the, the 100. Is that correct? Here's what I'm here's what I'm driving to, Ms. Kelly, and, and you're talking about the marketplace. My view is that the marketplace is a bottom-up operation, not a top-down influence operation. And if you're using your financial, as an old soldier, I'll use this term, combat power, to compel behavior of individuals that are trying to use your service as a mover of votes, that's not a market. That's, that's compelling behavior because of your particular position on a, on a climate issue. And that's not market-based. And that's, I think that's what the committee is concerned with. Because we're, what I think, I'll, I'll broadly speak across all three of the entities that have been, that have been testifying today. Creating an institutional inertia to compel a certain policy outcome based upon your priorities that may not be in the best interest of everybody that's investing. Now that's an institutional inertia that Texas as an as a energy producing state doesn't want to see happen simply because y'all have made a decision about what you want to be a policy as opposed to what the people of Texas may want to see as a policy. Your response? Yeah, my response to that, sir, is that we've focused a lot on the ISS benchmark policy. We have a lot of clients that don't use our benchmark policy, that use custom policies to address their views. And that's what I was trying to articulate in my opening statement. So the benchmark policy is the one that's formulated with the feedback from the market, but clients have the option to accept or reject that particular policy further regardless of the policy that any client has, they always have the opportunity to override our recommendation. This is their vote. Did, uh, Texas, did Texas ERS and TRS 
have the opportunity to override? And if so, did they, in having the opportunity, did they exercise that opportunity on it those is, four occasions that? It is my understanding that they did have that opportunity. I don't believe they did. They did have the opportunity. But it is my not, understanding they, they had. I don't. I'm not in the details I know, of I know their Brian's service. Brian's here and others are here that can, service, that can answer that more specifically when, when we get to that. Um, it, members, but, any other questions? Well, Mr. Chairman, I think I need to return the gavel to you. So there it is. Uh, thanks for your testimony. I have a couple more questions about the benchmark that you were talking about, and I was out a little earlier, but following some of this. And so the development of the benchmark, you said, uh, um, I want to make sure I got this right. The benchmark was developed with from market input. I, th I yes. think that was the term. So how much of that input came from CalPERS and CalSTRS. Well, let me back up. Are CalPERS and CalSTRS, I'm speaking of those large California pension funds, are CalPERS and CalSTRS uh, clients of ISS? Have they been? Are they? So respectfully, sir, I'm not at liberty to confirm or deny any of our clients. What I can tell you about the policy, and I think you may have not been here during my opening statement, is the policy survey goes out to not just our clients, but broadly to the marketplace, so that we take that input from companies as well. And so we are looking across the spectrum uh, at, at all uh, market participants and understand that we need to, um, you know, take all, all um, investors and all views into consideration. So my question then, how much of that input came from pension funds CalPERS and CalSTRS? I'm not asking about client relationships, but their input for you to develop your benchmark. I would have to confirm if they participated directly in the survey. I don't know off the top of my head. And I would also want to just confirm with council that I'm able to give that information um, to this committee because I don't want to violate uh, any of their um, confidentiality if, if they had that status in the survey, sir. Should we visit with your lawyers about that? About finding out whether CalPERS he, and CalSTRS. So we can just check. We can just check and get back to you on that. I, I literally, I don't know if they participated in the survey, sir. It's an honest answer. And, and as you, as you probably know, uh, you are are not here under subpoena because your counsel was cooperative in providing documents. But if that changes, the subpoena power is there and very real, and contempt power is very real and enforced by the courts. And so, uh, the Texas law is clear. We're we're entitled to the information, so let me just, if I can ask your lawyers, will you find out for us whether CalPERS and CalSTRS participated in the development of the benchmark? Either tell us that you will or tell us that you can at some point um, by next week. Is that good? Do we have your agreement to do that? Yes. Very good. Depending on their answers, we'll be following up with you through them if we need to. Understood. Thank you, sir. I'm curious whether the benchmark itself is a bias or has bias built into it. Uh, for companies that are significant greenhouse gas emitters, um, I can't help but wonder how this, what, how this, how this plays, how this interplays. I want to ask you in particular, though, about some interaction you've received, or maybe the euphemism is engagement from the other two firms who've testified and who will testify. Again, asset managers like BlackRock and State Street that we just heard from, they made a commitment to pressure you when they joined Net Zero Asset Managers. And so I'm making that up. I'm on the uh, Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative website, and it says, it lists the commitment that they make. And number eight says that they will engage with actors key to the investment system, including credit rating agencies, auditors, stock exchanges, proxy advisors, investment consultants, and data and service providers. So proxy advisors, that's you, right? Correct. Can you tell us whether BlackRock and State Street have, have fulfilled their pledge to net zero asset managers and engaged with you to push these goals? First of all, we are, ISS is not a uh, net zero signatory. No, ma'am, that's not what I said. I they understand. joined net zero asset managers and they promised to engage you. Have they done that? No, sir. Not that I'm aware of. Now, those are very different answers. Is that a no or an I don't know? Those are very, there's, a, there's a pretty big distinction there. They have not. I 
uh, thanks, Senator. So, by joining Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative, uh, one of the commitments that members make is, I'm reading from Net Zero Asset Managers website, members and State Street and BlackRock are members. They, they promise to, quote, engage with actors key to the investment system, including credit rating agencies, auditors, stock exchanges, proxy advisors, investment consultants, and data and service providers. So my question is, since ISS is a proxy advisor, have State Street and or BlackRock engaged with ISS on these issues? No, sir. Not on net zero. You're certifying to this committee under oath that BlackRock and State Street have not communicated with ISS about pushing these climate goals. Correct, sir. Okay, well the documents will speak for themselves. We'll be following up with you, Lars, about that one as well. Thanks for answering my question so forthrightly. I have a question about another proxy vote that was especially important to us because it was taken on behalf of, of Texas. Um, this happened this year. In fact, this vote took place just days after this committee uh, had a hearing on this matter. I bet you know the one I'm talking about. Do you remember the Lowe's Corporation resolution did, earlier sir. this year? I'm going to make sure I get the facts right. So the Teacher Retirement System of Texas, money entrusted to protect those retired teachers and their savings and uh, <laughs> give them a little something for all the ways that they've served us. I want to make sure I get this right. At the Lowe's annual meeting of shareholders, the Education Foundation of America, and this is an education organization who says its mission is to, quote, advance progressive change through support for creative initiatives working towards sustainability, justice, and equality. At the Lowe's annual meeting, this group uh, put forward a resolution that said this, resolved that shareholders request that Lowe's issue a public report prior to December 31st, 2022, omitting confidential and privileged information, uh, detailing any known and any potential risks and cost to the company caused by enacted or proposed state policies severely restricting reproductive health care and detailing any strategies beyond litigation and legal compliance that the company may deploy to minimize or mitigate these risks. They went on to specifically mention Senate Bill 8 passed by the Texas Senate and the House signed by the governor. Uh, now that shareholder resolution, did uh, ISS cast votes on behalf of teacher retirement system for that resolution? We provided a recommendation for that resolution that was ultimately cast, sir. And that resolution was consistent with your benchmark, with your values? It was consistent with the benchmark policy, yes. Does the benchmark speak to other social and political issues uh, that ISS votes shares for or against? The benchmark policy will consider <clears throat> ENS issues, uh, um, shareholder issues on a case-by-case -case basis, yes, sir. Now, a resolution about pro-life legislation, pro-choice legislation, is that E, S, or G? So I think in this regard, that was considered um, a social issue, and that our basis of, on that was more around disclosure, sir, than the specific issues. And so I'm not going to ask you about specific clients today at this moment, but is it fair to say that ISS has many clients that are governments in conservative states who pass bills along these lines? Yes, sir. Has it occurred to ISS that those states may disagree with your benchmark position? That they likely do, based on how the voters have expressed their will at the polls? It has, sir, which is why we offer additional policy options. Anything else for ISS members? Thanks for your testimony. We'll be in touch. Thank you, sir. Thank you, members of the committee.
Terry Calls, Dahlia Blass, Lori Heinel. Please, ladies, if you'll rejoin us at the table. To, but I'll remind you that you're each under oath. Yes, sir. Agreed? Yes, sir. Yes. Still under oath. Thanks. Uh, we have another document that's a stewardship activity report from the uh, second quarter of uh, 2021. And this is a State Street Global Advisors document, Ms. Heinle. Uh, I'll let you give you a moment to look at that. Tell us if you recognize that. Yes, sir, I do. Um, yes, sir, I do recognize that document. Thank you. And tell us what it is. Um, basically, every year we publish a comprehensive uh, report that is made public that um, details our voting activities over the course of the prior year. At the bottom of page six, there's a heading, European banks continue to be See that? I do, yes sir. Okay, then on the next page, there's a box regarding HSBC. And it, I'm going to read it and tell me if I read this right. It says, after engaging with our team, along with to phase out financing of coal-fired power and thermal coal mining in the EU and OECD by 2030 and other regions by 2040. And as a result, the proposal was withdrawn by the proponent. HSBC also committed to set, disclose, and implement a strategy with short and medium-term targets to align its financing across all sectors with the goals of the Paris Agreement, starting with the oil and gas and the power and utilities sectors. Did I read that right? Yes, you did, sir. So is it correct that SSG engage with HSBC to limit financing for coal plants in 2021? That is correct, yes, sir. Did you ask HSBC to align its lending to the oil and gas industry with the Paris Agreement? Uh, so, yes, we did. But let me give you a bit of context, if I may, please, sir. So is the emergence of some very extreme shareholder proposals related to um, asking these companies to constrain their affiliations with energy companies. And that has been a, um, a progressive agenda that has in increased in intensity over the last couple of years. And there are some parts of the world where um, these proposals are quite attractive because there are uh, more asset managers and asset owners who are um, you know, quite aligned with some of those, that thinking. And, and uh, Europe is a place that is often called out as a place where there's a lot of intensity around the energy conversation. In this particular case, um, it was our view that the um, activist proposal was quite prescriptive and went further than what we thought was appropriate. Um, however, we felt there was a, you know, an, an, a significant chance that that proposal might very well uh, get passed, irrespective of our own personal views on that. So I, I guess I provide that context, Chairman, because um, there are times when we try to help the management um, address issues that we think are um, in their best interest, but also where the risk of these kinds of proposals might be more constraining than would be otherwise desirable. Now, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Please. Are you saying that if you hadn't done this, there would have been a worse one? Or well, we I, don't, I, I, we, I don't, we don't understand. Know. I guess I'm, what we're saying I'm, I'm, is that I'm the confused. proposal itself would have been uh, perhaps even more limiting than what HSBC ultimately committed to on their own accord. Perhaps. Well, HSBC just announced it will stop funding new oil and gas fields. I don't know how much further we could go than that. Do you? Yeah. 
so that's a pretty extreme example. And, and yes, they made that decision on their own accord as a business practice. They made that decision, yes, sir. So you did not ask HSBC to take that action? We don't ask them to do anything prescriptive. Again, our, so I know you're looking, looking at me a little quizzically, so let me try to explain, please. Um, so our general way of engaging with them is to understand what they're doing, understand how that aligns with their business strategy, and understand how they're disclosing and managing those risks attached to that. So we don't ever, I'm going to make sure for my lawyers here, but it is not, to my knowledge, we do not go in and say to a company, you must stop doing that business. That is not the way that we operate. We go to them and say, if you continue to do this business, these are the risks that we see, and you need to manage those risks in accordance with your business practices. Well, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and mm -hmm. I, I want to make sure we're, we're talking about the same firm and the same document. Let's go back to the document mm -hmm. that I quoted from. After engaging with our team, Along with other shareholders, HSBC committed to phase out financing. They committed to phase out financing of the coal fired power and thermal coal mining in the EU. Uh, I'm going to skip, well, I'll just read the whole thing. And OECD by 2030, yes. and other regions by 2040. And as a result, the proposal, as a result, the proposal was withdrawn by the proponent. Now, this next sentence, now let's be clear. Yep. I think we're going to agree that this goes well beyond disclosure. The next sentence says, H -E HSBC also committed to set, disclose, and implement a strategy with short and medium term targets to align its financing across all sectors with the goals of the Paris Agreement, starting with the oil and gas and the power and utility sectors. Now, now, now come on, that's not just disclosure, that's no, set I, goals I, and implement those goals. Yes, sir. And that, in what that am case, I missing? No, you're not missing anything. The HSBC did the, take those actions. I would submit that it was, we did not specifically make that kind of request. We do not prescribe to the, to the companies what they need to do. They took that action as a consequence of a broad engagement that they undertook. Yes, sir. Could one read this statement? After engaging with our team, they did this. Wouldn't I, one think that maybe State Street wants people to think that they influenced that decision? We, you don't want us to think that, but you wanted the readers of this statement to think that, didn't you? Certainly, we want our shareholders to know that we are engaged with these clients, or these, these companies, excuse me, and um, we are, we have a voice at that table. That is true. Yes, sir. This says, we engage, and I'm quoting, and as a result, presumably of our engagement, <laughs> this took place. Mm -hmm. What am I missing? Uh, the sequencing was we engaged, other investors engaged, ultimately HSBC took action. I can understand the concern about the way that that is characterized around so our engagement. I do understand that. It yes, was sir. a coincidence. Uh, we try to we try to be quite honest and complete in how we describe our engagement. In this particular case, there was that our engagement and others, which you can see, and as a consequence of that complete engagement, they took this decision. Did you have a question, Senator Colcourst? Um, I don't want to, if you, if you don't, that's well, okay. I, 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 Mr. Chairman, maybe it's just a statement. I mean, when you engage, I, I think what we're learning here, Mr. Chairman, and I, I think this is important for all investors to learn, is that the ultimate goal is these large blocks of money you rep represent. I, I could go back through my notes, how many millions of clients you represent. I think TRS and ERS being some of the largest in the world, um, that this is the ultimate goal, is that we're going to phase out coal-fired plants, um, which you have one right here in your district, I believe, Mr. Chairman, and oil and gas, ultimately. And so, you know, when you say engage, I mean, engage is, is I mean, obviously ESG is a scoring system that's ultimately going to um, 
move policy in a direction that something I don't think you could get at the ballot box. You're just using it through investment funds. And I think that every investor needs to understand what's going on, as passive as they may be, as large as they may be, or as small. Um, and, and I think your points are well made. Uh, this is where we're going. Thank you, Senator. I want to, uh, again, uh, we really want to understand, and uh, these statements appear to us to be clear and unequivocal. They don't look that way to you. So I need to ask you this. Have you provided us all the documents around and in, involved in this engagement with HSBC? I believe we have provided all the documents that were requested related to these engagements. I, if there is something that we have not, so, uh, let me ask this. Okay, let me ask this. Let me let me be, let me be fair because I don't. Please. Let me be fair. I'm not sure specifically what we've asked for. So let's just ask okay. right now. Yeah. We need everything, all documents, everything you have uh, related to this engagement with HSBC that's described here on page six. Uh, We'd really like to know um, yeah. whether. Uh, yeah, of course. <laughs> so, can we have those documents? We, we will get them to you. And again, uh, look, I, I know this is going to um, maybe not ring, you know, with you. And so I'll just um, I'll just acknowledge that. I do want to push against the idea that our goal is to eliminate fossil fuels. That is not what we believe, and that is not what we have signed up for. What we have signed up for, and I, what we do believe, is the testimony that you heard earlier from the, the first gentleman, that there are implications from fossil fuels that are driving climate change that collectively, as a you know, a group on the globe, we've got to try to manage that. And we're relying on how companies themselves are thinking about the implications of that transition and making sure that investors have good information about the company's risks, the company's mitigations of those risks, and the company's um, disclosure related to those risks. I would also just acknowledge that there are some investors in some parts of the world that are have a very a stronger view on some of these elements. So a part of engagement in our view has to be to bring a voice to that conversation and help companies think through dif different opinions and what that might mean for their investor base. Now just so I'm clear, are you suggesting that you are a moderating force in these discussions, and it would be even worse than cutting off all funding for oil and gas exploration if you weren't at the table? So in some cases, I believe we are a moderating force. It's certainly, if when we look at some of the activist proposals that get put forward, we find in many cases they are very prescriptive. They are very limiting of a company's strategic options, and we actually get positive feedback from the energy companies that we engage with that the way we talk to them about these issues is quite constructive for them. While we're looking at your documents, uh, annual climate stewardship review 2020 dated October 2020, we're going to pull that up for you, mm -hmm. 13643 council. Right. Does that look familiar to you? It does, yes, yes, sir. At pages five and six, this document discusses proposals in the 2020 proxy season to require banks to reduce greenhouse gas emissions associated with its lending authorities in, in alignment with the Paris Initiative. Uh, State Street voted for proposals for J.P. Morgan, Chase, and Mizuho Financial Group, and it abstained for Barclays. For J.P. Morgan, Chase. State Street, quote, supported a shareholder proposal requesting that the company report on if and how it plans to reduce greenhouse gas emissions associated with its lending activities in alignment with the Paris Agreement. Did I read that right? You did, sir. Yes, sir. And, and you probably remember this, but just to make sure, are you aware that J.P. Morgan's board recommended against this proposal? Correct. Yes, did, sir. Didn't they say 
I want to quote them, given the reports and disclosures the firm already makes, the board believes the requested report would not enhance shareholder value. Is that, do you recall that? Yes, sir. But State Street voted for this proposal regardless. That's right, because what, we, uh, we believed it provided enhanced disclosure for investors to understand uh, their business operations. Uh, tell us what financial analysis you went through to make that decision. Financial analysis. Well, in that case, it would have been more what were they actually disclosing. So it was less about financial analysis of their business practices and more were they disclosing disclosing their activities in a way that would enable investors to understand that business and make an informed choice. Uh, you've made a couple of references to Mr. Brigham's testimony, and I agree with you. It was quite compelling. Now, I'm going to ask a question that should be rhetorical, but maybe it's not. Mm -hmm. Aren't votes and pressure like this, and what we just had up on the screen, aren't, aren't those exactly why Mr. Brigham experienced what he did with a bank that did not want to loan for an oil and gas project? So, as I heard his testimony, he was being compelled to say things he didn't believe in order to get a business opportunity. And I would not do that either, if had I been asked to make a statement I did not believe in. So votes like this, proxy statements, and then you're claiming that after you engaged, as a result, they, they set and met these goals. You don't think that discourages banks from providing financing for fossil fuel projects? I can't say, because these banks have to forge their own business opportunities. What I can say is that we routinely um, engage with energy companies, financial services companies, all manner of companies, and it's through the lens of, do you understand the risks that you're taking on, do you manage those risks, and do you disclose those risks? That's the basis of the engagement. Last, we have a couple more questions. I want to put a you were you spoke earlier about the letter that you wrote, which you say clarify. Most would say contradicts other statements by BlackRock. But we're going to your letter to state agencies. We're going to put that up and ask you a couple of questions about that. Give us just a moment to to grab that. Obviously, state attorneys general have weighed in on this, and will continue to, uh, following Texas' lead in most cases. But we're all working together. This is federalism, um, and so um, you spoke about the letter that you wrote um, in September of. Uh, 2022 to those Republican attorney generals, again, to clarify some of the statements, and uh, we'll get you a copy of it, but I think you'll remember this. On page nine, you said, BlackRock's engagement and voting around climate risk does not require that companies meet specific emission standards. Does that sound right? Uh, I believe that was in the letter, correct, sir. And then, at, on, at page five, early in the letter, you said, we do not dictate to companies what specific emission targets they should meet. Does that sound right? Correct, sir. So that's in the letter. Are, are those true statements about BlackRock? Yes, sir. We were looking at one of uh, Mr. Fink's letter to CEOs earlier. In the one from 2022, I'll represent to you, he said BlackRock is, quote, asking companies to set short, medium, and long-term targets for greenhouse gas reductions. He said in February of 2021, specifically, we expect companies to disclose scope one and scope two emissions and accompanying greenhouse gas reduction targets. Companies in carbon-intensive industries should also disclose scope three emissions. And then he said, in a vote bulletin, we ask companies to explain how their business model will be compatible with a global aspiration of net zero global greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Do those statements sound familiar? Yes, sir. Do those statements sound consistent with what you said in your letter? Um, they are, sir. They are. Okay. Whitehaven Coal, at their annual general meeting in 2021, uh, BlackRock voted against all directors of Whitehaven Coal because uh, they did not, quote, include greenhouse gas reduction targets or alignment with a global aspiration of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. 
So there was some question before, before about why Florida did what. Here we were told why that vote was taken. BlackRock voted against every director of this of, of, of Whitehaven Coal just last year because the disclosures did not, quote, include greenhouse gas reduction targets or alignment with a global aspiration of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Do you remember that? Uh, well, I was I was not there at that time, um, so I don't remember it. But I I I do understand it if that's the question. So, voted against all the directors at the meeting because they did not include greenhouse gas reduction targets or alignment with a global aspiration of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Isn't that expecting them to meet a certain standard and punishing them if they don't? Um. No, Mr. Chairman, what that's asking for is disclosure. It's disclosure of information that the company chooses its own targets. Um, we don't tell them what those are. We ask for the information so that we are able to assess material risks. This doesn't say they didn't disclose a target. They didn't disclose a target that was aligned with a global aspiration of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. That's what it says. Isn't that right? If I may explain that, that piece, um, sir. So um, I wish you would. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so um, the regulatory framework, um, not just in the United States, but globally, is many countries are adopting regulations ar around this. And what we are looking for um, in, when we're looking to engage in, our, in uh, companies, when we're in our engagement with companies, rather, we're looking for companies to explain how they're um, approaching these regulatory changes, the regulatory risks, potential litigation risks, um, uh, reputational risks. So that is what we seek to understand, not that we tell them you have to do X, Y, Z by you know, 2050. We want to understand how they are approaching it from their business perspective and assessing the risks and, and opportunities. So it's information collection so that we can make the best judgment we can on behalf of our clients in terms of how we can you know, produce those risk-adjusted returns, which is our focus as a fiduciary. If they disclose to you a plan that you do not agree with, is that okay? Just so they tell you, here's our plan? Or must the plan align with net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050? Like you said it had to in that document. Which is it? So, so, Mr. Chairman, our, our goal in our stewardship and engagement and our voting um, is, frankly, the ultimate goal is long-term performance. This is why we engage. This is why we vote. So if we take voting action against a, a company, and I'll, I'll go back to noting that over 90% of the time, we support management our votes, over 90% of the time. If we take voting action, it's because we have concerns with their governance or their performance. So when you say that you voted against them because they did not include greenhouse gas reduction targets or alignment with a global aspiration of net zero greenhouse gases emissions by 2050, is that a true statement? In, in, that, in that case, we would be voting against because we did not see from management um, an, um, information for us to be able to assess how they are looking at material risk to their business and give us, giving us information so that we are able to see that as well. Information on how they'll meet a specific goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Did I read that right? It's a quote from your document. It's information as to how they are looking at the transition to a low carbon economy, how it impacts their business and what they're doing about it. We're not giving them a roadmap. This is up to them. But we seek to understand how they are viewing it. I understand. So your story is that it's not that they were making them set a standard. Just tell us what your standard is. So BlackRock also voted against the re-election of the board chair of Transdime because of a failure, quote, to adopt quantitative greenhouse gas emissions goals. Not to disclose, they failed to adopt quantitative greenhouse gas emissions goals you voted against the chair. Is that right? Sir, I don't have the context of this exact one, and I, so I would like to be very careful. Um, and I will just go to say, um, is for respect to these votes around reduction targets or, you know, GHG, what we're looking for a company to do is disclose. Um, how are you looking at this? What are your targets? How is your business plan? How are you managing your risks? We do not tell them what the target should be or how they should do it. We want to understand how they're approaching it because we do believe this is a material risk. He voted against Exxon Mobil's directors because, quote, 
Exxon's failure to have clear long-term greenhouse gas reduction targets, unquote. Not failure to disclose, failure to have. Is have the same thing as disclose? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the vote against Exxon after years of engagement with Exxon was based on performance, 100% performance. The company was underperforming, had lost 60%, that's six zero percent of its value in the five years running up to that vote. Today, Exxon is, is not only outperform, it's outperforming the market, and its peers. This was concerns of our governance and performance. So it wasn't about, quote, Exxon's failure to have clear long-term greenhouse gas reduction targets, unquote. That's not true. It was about performance and governance. It was not about Exxon's failure to have clear long-term greenhouse gas reduction targets, as BlackRock said it was at the time? I, I, sir, I don't have the full voting bulletin to, to parse through it with you. Um, well, I'm not parsing. The words are very clear and unequivocal. But I, I, I think the, the bulletin was, was quite long and, and explained the, the, the vote in, in detail. But what, what I can tell you is, with respect to Exxon, it was seriously underperforming the market and its peers. And today, that is no longer the case. This was a concern over the performance and the governance of the company after years of engagement with, with Exxon. Senator. I just, could you tell me when that vote took place? When was that pro when was that vote? The one for the one on, Exxon? on Exxon. You can well, you were talking about you'd warned them for years. When was that vote when you voted against ExxonMobil's board of directors? Um ma'am, I don't have the um the bulletin in front of me. I think it was twenty one. In but less just, than, okay, so when y'all voted no, then they they just turned it around in less than a year. You're saying that they're outperforming their peers now? They, they are outperforming their peers now. Um, I also note that uh, Whitehaven, I, if, uh, I believe, is, is not a U.S. company. I beg your pardon? Uh, the Whitehaven vote, I, I believe that is uh, not a U.S. company. Exxon, a U.S. company? Um, yes, sir, right here in Texas. Texas company. That's right. And we have approximately $27 billion invested in Texas, in Texas, and Exxon on behalf of our, of our clients. That's our concern. We wish you weren't there. Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, my hearing's not great. Did you, did you say $27 billion? I believe so, ma'am. Yes, right. We're and one Mr. of the largest Mr. Chairman, shareholders. your uh, rebuttal to that statement was? Um, I said that's our concern. We wish BlackRock didn't have such a big stake in Exxon to push them around, bully them, and vote against oil and gas exploration, vote against energy that Americans and Texans need. Mr. Chairman, I know you noted up there a number of times that BlackRock voted against um, the sitting board of directors. Did that vote sway? Did they remove members? Are they big enough players in all of those companies you listed that the result of the vote was um, a termination of current board members? Yeah, that, that uh, Exxon vote was pretty big. Uh, and again, a lot of folks were following, I would say, these firms and trying to remove directors. Uh, some results were successful, some weren't. And of course, our concern was their voting shares, again, as they've admitted, using Texas money. Thank you for that clarification. We're going to get another document for you to look at and make sure we understand it. While we're looking for the text to put in front of you, uh, you probably remember 
not long ago, September of 22, uh, the uh, New York City Comptroller wrote a letter uh, to Larry Fink on behalf of the New York City Pension Funds. That's what we read on page, I'm, I'll represent to you that on page two of the document, paragraph five, New York City Pension cites several climate commitments BlackRock has made. We're gonna get that in just a moment. All right, does that letter look familiar to you? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, page two of the letter, paragraph five. Again, um, the New York City pensions, they cite several climate commitments that they say BlackRock has made. Do you see that? Yes, sir. Can you read that paragraph five? Read out loud, that is. I'm sorry, is the one that starts with uh, BlackRock? It's on the uh, climate commitments that BlackRock has made. Do you have it? I'll just read it. You tell me if I read it right. I appreciate that. Remember the letter, you know, the context, this is the New York City Comptroller writing to Larry Fink, right, about pensions. Does, you're familiar with the letter itself, right? I, I am, Mr. Chairman. Here just a few weeks ago. Okay. The letter says, BlackRock has repeatedly and rightly recognized climate change as an investment risk. In your 2020 letter, in your 2020 letter to CEOs, you name climate change as, quote, a defining factor in companies' long-term projects, prospects, unquote, and declare your, quote, investment conviction that sustainability and climate integrated portfolios can provide better risk adjusted returns to investors, unquote. Your 2021 letter to CEOs committed to, quote, supporting the goal of net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050 or sooner, unquote, in line with BlackRock's pledge as a signatory of the Net Zero Asset Manage Managers Initiative, NZAMI, and asked businesses to disclose how they are integrating their own net zero plans into their long-term business strategies. Did I read that right? Um, yes, sir. Can you confirm whether BlackRock has done what the New York City Comptroller said BlackRock has done and made those commitments? Sir, you have um, the Comptroller's letter to us. I, I believe that you also have the response that we sent to the Comptroller. That we make, we'll try to find that, but I'm asking if you believe the comptroller's letter to Larry Fink accurately described commitments BlackRock had made. It's, my point is, it sounds like we're not the only one who are reading those documents in plain English. What about the New York City comptroller's claims? Sir, in our letter to the comptroller of New York, uh, we explained how we view um, our participation in these organizations which is in line with what I said earlier in my testimony. So the, the, the comptroller in New York City got it wrong. I, sir, I, what, I, what I can say is we explained in our letter back to him, which is public, um, how we view our participation in these organizations. Well, in the same letter, in the same letter, you know, he, he accuses BlackRock of recently disclaiming, I'm going to quote, disclaiming responsibility for net zero alignment in its own portfolio by saying that it does not ask companies to set specific emissions targets and that its participation in the net zero asset management initiative does not mean BlackRock is setting or meeting any net zero targets. And then here's what he says. New York City comptroller says BlackRock has recently tapped its continued investment in fossil fuels without specific net zero targets or commitments for any plan for a phased transition away. So it sounds like the New York City Comptroller is frustrated as we are and that depending on who BlackRock is speaking to, it gives the answer they think is wanted by the person asking the questions. Can you see how one might think that? Um, sir, if, if I may, and um, I, I'll amend something. I, I thought that our response letter was public. Um, it is not, so we... I haven't will, seen it. Yeah, we will commit to getting it to the committee so that you see our response, our words, and how we approach this. And just to clarify, and as your lawyer knows this, 
we have requested not just documents we can get online. Our, our subpoena and our document request is not limited to public documents, and we'll go to the courthouse if we have to, the other courthouse, to get that done. I want to make sure we're clear about that. Go ahead. Um, thank, thank you, sir. Um, and and at, at BlackRock, um, as a fiduciary asset manager, what we do is invest clients' money in accordance with their commitments, their mandates, not ours. And I think this is why there is so much conversation and perhaps I really hear your frustration, sir, but this is our clients asking for sustainable portfolios, our clients asking for portfolios that don't take climate risk into consideration. This is why we truly believe in choice. We're not a balance sheet financing business. Uh, we don't, we're not the ones that make these decisions. We provide the investment solutions and the products, and our clients are the ones that invest. Um, they're the ones who are choosing what is lining up with their goals. We don't tell them that. That's not our role. We manage their asset to meet their goals. Again, we haven't seen your response. We're, we're hoping for a response from you here, but on pages four to six of the document, in bold font, the New York City pensions make three demands of BlackRock, and let's look at those. Here's what the New York City Comptroller, on behalf of their pension systems, demands from BlackRock in this letter. He says, number one, publish an implementation plan that makes clear BlackRock's commitment to achieving net zero across its entire portfolio. And let me pause. A number of times today, each of you has made references to clients who want green investments, who are concerned about net zero. We understand that. But this is one of many quotes we see from net zero asset managers, from Climate Action 100, and from your own documents that say the commitment is across the entire portfolio, not limited to those six ESG funds that you were talking about. But back to the letter. New York City says, we want you to publish, back to the letter, we want you to publish an implementation plan that makes clear BlackRock's commitment to achieving net zero across its entire portfolio with concrete steps that detail how it intends to reach science-based targets on a specific time frame and clear mechanisms to regularly report on scopes one, two, and three emissions for all assets in BlackRock's portfolio. The demands go on. Provide a detailed approach to keeping fossil fuel reserves in the ground and phasing out high emitting assets. And demand three, support climate action through transparent corporate engagement that requires disclosure of climate-related lobbying, works to end lending and insurance for new fossil fuel supply projects, and pushes for science-based targets at portfolio companies. Do you remember the New York City Comptroller making those three demands of BlackRock? Um, yes, sir. I think you've answered this question. You may have responded to the letter privately, but not publicly. Is that right? Uh, that's my understanding, sir. Has BlackRock met privately with the comptroller in New York City or with those pension funds to, to discuss this letter? Um, I, I do believe it, um, the comptroller is a client, so we have had engagements with the comptroller. Have any compromises on these demands been made or any deals reached between BlackRock and the New York City pensions based on this letter? Um, sir, the, the comptroller is, is a client. We handle their mandate, their assets in accordance with their mandates. We handle other client mandates in accordance with the mandates from those clients. We are a manager to a multitude of clients. We believe in choice and we believe in offering our clients what they are looking for to the best of our ability as an asset manager. So has BlackRock met these three demands put on them by the New York City Comptroller? Sir, if, for example, if you go up to the very first one, which um, I, I can't see now, um, the commitments 
um, clients make their own commitments with their portfolios. We manage to their commitments. We do not make commitments with respect to other people's money. Uh, we look to what they want to do with their assets and manage in accordance with that. Now, as a public issuer, BlackRock as a public issuer has made commitments to reduce our, um, our, our carbon emissions, but that's us as a public company. That's, that's different from our role as an asset manager where we are bound by our clients' mandates. So when we see language like this from net zero asset managers, from G fans, from Climate Action 100, and from your own documents that talk about pledges to address these challenges across all assets, does all assets mean all assets? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I, I really understand your perspective and, and I, I, I hear your frustration with the language you're reading. What, what I can say this and um, this is public. You can look at it in our net zero um, statement. You can look at it in the Climate Action 100 um, letter that we signed when we joined. We have made it clear that we are fiduciary. We are bound by certain regulations as a fiduciary. We are bound by our clients' mandates as a fiduciary and that is how we operate. I'm going to read goal seven that you agreed to when you joined uh, Net Zero Asset Managers. And goal seven from their website says, I'm sorry, pledge requirement seven, implement a stewardship and engagement strategy with a clear escalation and voting policy that is consistent with our ambition for all assets under management to achieve net zero emissions by 2050 or sooner. Now, all assets under management is not limited to ESG funds, is it? Mr. Chairman, I know you're reading from their website, but if you look at the letter that we um, when we joined, what we put together, this Climate Action 100, we made it... That was Net Zero Asset oh, Managers, sorry, but I, go ahead. I, I know, you've joined so many, it's hard to keep track, I no, know. I, I'm sorry, I, I apologize. I, um, in Climate Action 100, we made it very clear that we are bound by laws and regulations and our clients' mandates. In our Net Zero statement, um, we make it very clear that it's our clients' assets that are have the, the, the commitments. That is, our, that is a firm limitation on us because it is their money and we are bound as a fiduciary by their mandates. So where you've pledged to net zero asset managers, to Climate Action 100, to Glasgow, where you've made these pledges to manage all assets under management along these lines, you didn't mean that. You had your fingers crossed. Sir, we, we, we participate in these, in these um, organizations as we participate in many organizations around the globe in different parts of our business to be part of the conversation, to understand issues that are important to our clients. But how we act, how we invest, how we vote is accordance with our own principles and our fiduciary obligations. One more question for now on the New York City Comptroller. You know, you probably remember in his letter, he says, if you don't comply with those three requests that we read a moment ago, he will pull his $40 billion from BlackRock. Has he pulled his money? Has he pulled the state of New York's money? Uh, sir, I'm, I'm, I'm not at liberty to discuss any, any, any client that has not said something publicly. Um, if, if you would, um, I'm sure you'd appreciate that. So has BlackRock met those three demands? Sir, as, as I, we will provide you with the letter that we sent to the, the comptroller, um, as I, you know, uh, we are a fiduciary asset manager. We look to our clients' mandates. We meet those mandates because it is their money. Our purpose is to provide the best risk-adjusted returns we can for them. And we believe in choice, and choice not just in investments. We're proud of the fact that so, sir, like one one of the things I think you um, you know keep coming back to is um, essentially our voting, um, and this is why we truly, truly believe in voting choice. And we have done the absolute best we can to advance voting choice up to the regulatory you know hurdle that we have right now, and we are looking to see how we can operationalize that. Given state laws and other regulatory burdens, we would love to partner with you to make this available for more and for more people because we truly believe the more voices, I believe that a lot of your concerns would uh, would be addressed that way. When did BlackRock begin voting choice? 
Um, it's taken us years of work, years of work to get to the place where we launched it in January um, of this year. Um, it took about four years of work to get it to a launch stage. So it was publicly launched, publicly launched after Texas and red states began to complain about what you're doing with our taxpayers' money. Isn't that right? Um, it was, we announced it in um, 2021 and then it launched, but it, it was actually something in the works for us for several years. This has taken um, a tremendous amount of uh, time and resource and technology to get it launched. It's, it's not a, it's a pretty complex work to do. Mr. Colcourt. Mr. Chairman, you may or may not know this answer. I don't know if either one of you know the answer. You mentioned that there was $40 billion dollars invested in BlackRock from the uh, New York New York City New York City pensions yes ma'am city pensions do we know how much and I'm just gonna I wouldn't even go into our city pensions let's just stay with the TRS and ERS do we know how much is invested uh, with BlackRock or State Street from TRS and ERS? We have some of the numbers the witnesses may know. Do you know offhand, Ms. Blass, how much money of Texas teacher retirement system, employee retirement system, is entrusted to BlackRock? Um, we'll be asking each of you. I don't have the number right in front of me, and I don't want to say it incorrectly. Um, you can give us an estimate just so you tell us it's an estimate. I, I don't have the, the number um, to, to give you the exact number, but I will tell you that we are... Um, for our active mandates uh, for the pension plans, we have outperformed the benchmarks for the past five years. And, and I think, you know, I, I, I see the difficult um, stance, position that you're in. Uh, and I want to thank both of you. I think you've done a great job today, um, hard um, to answer these questions. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I think from the line of questioning and, and, and what we've discussed, you know, Texas is a unique state. Um, like I said, oil and gas number one, ag probably number two, bounces back and forth with tourism, depends on how you rank industries. Maybe you can't serve two masters. I mean, that's maybe where we are, you know, with New York's demands, uh, Mr. Chairman, and you put up their demands, and then you obviously see Senate Bill 13, and um, passed by the legislature, um, and I've you know watched um, some requests by some of our statewide. Uh, we've recently had our, all of our statewide um, reelected, some to new positions, some not. And, and I guess, Mr. Chairman, in listening and showing you know uh, the balance between where we are. You know, maybe it should be more along the Florida lines where we just say, y'all have made a decision, we respect that decision, um, and we take our marbles and go somewhere else. Is, is that maybe potentially where we're headed with this? Because I know um, the investment practices of, you know, I'll just read, we've done a lot of reading from documents today, but study the investment practices of financial services firms and how those practices affect the state's public pensions, make recommendations to ensure the state's public pension funds are not being invested to further political or social causes. And I'm gonna read that last sentence just again. Make recommendations to ensure the state's public pension funds are not being invested to further political or social causes. And I see the Attorney General's uh, from New York's stance, and I respect that. He's duly elected, and our stance is different. And so I think, you know, what I'm concluding here is impossible for y'all to serve two masters. And I get this, all the different, you know, I, I see all the different funds, and, and, you know, you have different boards that govern this and govern that. But as your statements have uh, so eloquently uh, defined today, it's, you know, I hear these inclusive terms, all, um, you know, all of our funds, so forth and so on. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not jumping to a conclusion, but I'm certainly arriving at a place that you can't serve two masters. Uh, please go ahead, Ms. Um, so, first of all, thank you for being so straightforward about that because I'll be honest with you, we have that same conversation internally all the time and I will say over the years um, we've debated whether ESG is a performance enhancement and as CIO I've been steadfast in saying by definition imposing a constraint on a portfolio 
If you just do basic investment principles, that's a constraint. And so I've steadfastly encouraged our teams to not think of ESG as a performance enhancer, for example. They are risk issues, for sure. And again, I detailed earlier some of those. But I think the part, what we're trying to navigate, and you, maybe what you just said is, is the, the sort of dilemma we're all facing, is that, and, and again, I go back to Mr. Bridgewell's, uh, Brid Brigham's testimony, because it just hit me so much. If we all do believe that we have to get our arms around climate change, and, and maybe there are some who don't believe that that's true at all, so that could be true as, you know, there could be people who just don't embrace that, then the question is one of transition. And what I've been encouraged by is that everybody's at the table on that discussion. You see, you know, the energy companies themselves making their own commitments around you know, achieving a, a net zero emission through carbon capture, through diversifying their businesses, through you know, greening even the legacy uh, energy sources. You see places like Saudi Arabia putting forth. So I, I, again, I think that the way I think about it, so I'll just speak for myself, is that there is a path forward here, but it is very delicate. And how we navigate that, I think, is what you're rightly very concerned about. Because if the navigating that path disadvantages the economic engine of energy and the economy, then that's a real problem. Um, is it Ms. Heinel? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. And, and I love that, um, that, that you're right. We're all at the table. Um, my concern as um, an elected official in Texas, um, born and raised in Texas, six generations, um, more from the United daughter States, here. A, a, a <laughs> long time around, is 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 the disadvantage that we're seeing, and and I'm going to go a little more global, the disadvantage um, for our country as we uh, bend to ESG, or some of our competitors are not. Mm -hmm. For example, China approved the construction of 8.63 gigawatts of coal power, plant, uh, coal power in the first quarter of 2022, nearly half the amount seen in all of 2021. So I'm going to say, you know, my politics are different than China, but I'm just going to say as a global leader for the United States of America, right here in the county in which we sit, we're going to decommission a coal plant because of ESG scoring, because AEP is being forced to do that to be able to compete to get funds as Mr. Brigham. I, I don't even know who that man is. And he came all the way from Austin and he kind of just put it out there. He's dealing with the same thing. He has to tweet certain political positions. How embarrassing is that? I, unethical. Whoever, you know, that's just unethical. That's just absolutely unethical. But having said that, is the position that it is putting the United States of America. So China, Russia, and India are putting their countries, I've said this before today, first. Not only their economies, but their national protection. While we're all bending to some scoring that y'all all sit around a table, and the only way that Texas can fight back is potentially take our marbles and go elsewhere to derail some of these proxy votes, but to also maybe change some of the thinking and again, keep Texas and this nation at the forefront of a, national, a global power. And, and so I have said this over and over and over again, when other countries mm -hmm. adhere to what we're doing or what Europe is doing, Let's not forget that Germany, they have a, I think they're all looking for firewood right now. It's not going to go very well in Germany this winter. Mm -hmm. It's a developed country. Wow. So when we're talking about this, this is really important stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and, it, it, and I, I get where y'all are. You're, you're sitting here and I mean, man, y'all, I don't know how y'all drew straws, but I'm sorry y'all drew this one. Okay. I, I say, you know, girl power here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> just saying everyone that's testified today, you know, female, thank y'all. Um, but 
it, it, it really is important that we discuss these and we discuss them in a public matter. While New York may want something, trust me, Texas wants it different. Mm. And the proof is in the pudding where we are economically, okay? And they can do what they want on the East Coast, and they can do what they want on the West Coast, but we're trying to determine for Texas. And I am concluding, I'm not going to try to um, rush to this conclusion, but I am moving toward a conclusion that your two firms are something that we shouldn't invest in because we have different um, goals. That's how I'm going to say it. We have different goals. We love our earth. We want to take care of it. But the jury is still out, as I read the other day, that if you don't drive 60,000 miles on a car, that you actually, uh, on an electric car, you actually have a larger carbon footprint than a um, gasoline or diesel powered car. Now, let me tell you that Senate District 18, you can fit about three or four of the East Coast states just in my Senate district. And I drive about 30,000 miles, 35,000, I think, election year. It might have been closer to 40. But I'm not even sniffing 60,000 miles. So the, the normal person that doesn't have to drive as much as I do won't. So I'm saying that all of these environment, social, and governance, which I'm now going to start just asking the question, is that under the E, the S, or the G? The, the chairman put up, you know, does pro-life stances become in a company under the social? What about, one day we might get to, are you vaccinated? Do you have vaccination policies? That probably would fit under the S, maybe the G, maybe the E. I don't know. Y'all are going to determine that. And so I'm just going to say again um, that there are other countries, 88.63 gigawatts of coal power in the first quarter. That's just the first quarter of 2022. And we're over here arguing about how we voted out the directors of ExxonMobil, which is a Texas-based company. I hope that just puts it in perspective. It's maybe time for us to take our marbles, go elsewhere, find other investors, Mr. Chairman, uh, be a little more direct to ERS and TRS, like Florida and a couple other states are doing. Thank you, Senator. Uh, makes a lot of sense. Senator Hall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Senator Hall, if you will get that microphone real close so they can, so the folks watching on television and the recording can get all this. Thank you. No, no, Senator Corcoran, that, that's exactly in line with with the the question I'd asked earlier with uh, ISS that uh, the works out of alignment here, and I see things that are being talked about with no real a credible rationale behind why that's a good idea that we're doing this. I still would like to ask the question of both of you that I ask of ISS, where is the empirical data that supports that net zero is good for the bottom line, that actually would improve income, improve revenue, and the rest of the things that are stuck in that woke analysis that's done? Where is the empirical data that says this will actually be a benefit to the investment by doing this? I hear talk about it, I hear do this and do that, but I've yet to hear or see anything written that says here's our analysis that says that this will result in more revenue. This will invest at lower risk in there. And it's like, like the senator said, we're finding the issues about green energy, the, the problems we're going to have with the, the wind power, we're not going to be able to store the blades. I mean, those blades are a threat to our environment. The construction, all the concrete and steel and construction, that gets left out of the carbon analysis, and they just pretend that it only exists once it's in place and the blades are turning. The analysis that ignores the manufacturing and the disposal process of solar panels, huge impact to the environment, huge impact that gets left out. So we're going to run around and say, oh, this is low carbon impact. It's not. It's a lie. But it's being used that has a tremendous impact on our country and our state here. And so that's our great concern. And, and I agree with look, New York can do whatever they want to do. And the crazy coast can do the, whatever they want to do. But this is Texas. And we do things a little bit different here. We happen to believe in the truth, 
we happen to believe in honesty and we have believe in having real objectives that we're trying to achieve. And so I would like to see the written analysis that shows that, wow, each one of these is going to be a net benefit because, and I'll show whatever analysis you, yeah. you use to arrive at doing this. Um, Mr. Chairman, if, if, if I may, just a few points. On it. I would love to answer the Senator's question. Just a few other points, if I may. I'm trying to answer the questions. That'd be good. Uh, thank you. Um, so, Senator, we have done research um, in, in, this, in this space. Um, and based on our research, and this is data analytics, uh, we believe that an orderly transition um, to a low carbon economy is, um, is, is much more beneficial for our clients' portfolios. A disorderly transition um, can cost the global economy about a 25% reduction in GDP which would impact our clients' portfolios. So we've actually done research in this space um, and, and how it could potentially impact our clients' portfolios in the, in the long term. Um, the, um, the serving two senator, uh, two masters comment really, um, really struck me, Senator, um, because for us at BlackRock, we have one master and that's, that's our client. It's our North Star. Uh, and being a fiduciary to them and um, providing them with the best risk-adjusted returns we can. And we are really proud of the performance that we have generated right here in, in Texas for our Texas clients. And not just as an asset manager um, to them, many of them have actually been holders of our public stock since we went public uh, back in 99. We, were, we went public at $14 a share. Um, the clients that have stuck with our shareholding um, as of last week, um, what they gained is 7,700% return holding BlackRock stock. We are a success story. We're in the top of the S&P 500, top 20. In the top 20 of the S&P 500, we are really proud of what we have delivered to our shareholders, including many right here in Texas, um, and to our investors in terms of the performance uh, in Texas. We have beaten the active benchmarks for five years. You know, with, with, with that, um, I'm going to come back to um, choice, that the way that you address the needs um, of unique clients who have different views, sir, be it New York or California or right here in Texas, is that you provide them with the choice to make sure that you are meeting their needs. But right here in Texas, I'm gonna, we have $107 billion invested in the public energy companies. We've invested in Texas Energy just the past two years, $31 billion. We believe in these investments. We, we do not boycott oil and gas. We, we look for investment opportunities. We've just invested this past year, this past summer. We believe in, in these investments. They're very, very important to us. And the final point, sir, if you just indulge me, I apologize. I know I'm, I'm talking a lot, but I do want to come back um, to Florida, sir, and, and, and the comment there. Um, BlackRock outperformed um, the benchmark for five years. And the number one ranked firm versus us, the difference was less than a quarter percentage point, less than a quarter. This is how tight um, these are. Yet Florida chose to fire you for the reasons that Senator Betcourt read to us. We'll get back to that later. I want to talk to you about a, I want to talk to you about a coal plant right here just down the road that you guys, we believe, are engaged with. We mentioned this once or twice already. And just to be clear, a few miles from here, there's a power plant that this community relies on for jobs and for electricity. That Texas relies on for jobs and for electricity. It's called the Perky Power Plant. Swepco, a, a regional company, a respected company here, has had it for a while. It's owned. The parent company is now AEP, American Electric Power, which BlackRock is very engaged with based on documents we've seen. Now, according to AEP, they're going to close that plan in 2023. It has decades of life based on its technology, based on the, the coal that's there. It's a workhorse. It provides clean, reliable energy, keeps the lights on, provides good jobs, not just the, not just the power plant, but the mine that's attached where the lignite is mined. And so, according to AEP, this parent company, over 200 jobs will direct, be directly lost as result. And then for every job lost, two or three jobs lost in the economy. Good, high-paying jobs, especially in days like these. Our school districts lose tremendous, tremendous uh, tax base. And 
tens of millions of dollars to local communities. So uh, AEP is closing the Perky Power Plant as part of its plan to achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050. The Sabine Mine, whose only customer is the Perky Power Plant, they don't support the closure. In fact, uh, their parent company, North American Coal, says that the Perky Power Plant, quote, is a reliable and resilient asset, and the continued long-term operation of the facility is in the best interest of our employees, the local community, region, and state. So here's my question. Did BlackRock engage, and I'm using the euphemism engage, did BlackRock engage with AEP about its retirement of the Perky Power Plant? Um, um, Mr. Chairman, I, I don't know about that specific question. I, I do know that we have supported management of AEP in the past several years of proxy seasons. Isn't AEP one of your Climate Action 100 focus companies? Sir, we have... Climate Action 100 means that as part of your responsibilities, different asset managers focus on different companies. Isn't AEP one of your focus companies for Climate Action 100? We have our own um, a climate universe of companies that we focus on. So AEP is not one of your focus companies under Climate Action 100? I, I'm, I would have to get back to you on that specific one. I know we have our own climate focus group, which is on our website. I can represent present to you that Climate Action 100 says AEP is one of your focus companies. As you know, Climate Action 100 assesses utility companies based on whether they've assigned a retirement date to each and every coal unit with a full phase out by 2040. Now that's what Climate Action 100 says, I'm, and I know we've talked about this, but I'm not going to apologize for reading your words, your company's words, back to you. Now, Climate Action 100 has made this pledge that utility companies have to have a plan, a retirement date for every coal unit with a full phase out by 2040. Has BlackRock communicated that to AEP? Sir, I, I believe you just said you read a, uh, a pledge on from Climate Action 100. Which you've signed on to. Yes, ma'am. Uh, sir, I... Um... So you're not going to answer my question, are you? Has BlackRock communicated to AEP that Climate Action 100 expects retirement of these coal plants by 2040? Yes or no? Sir, I, I would have to get back to you in this specific question, but I, I will say that when we engage with companies, we engage independently, not behalf on some, somebody else's voice. We have the largest stewardship team in the industry. We do our own guidelines. We don't take them from a proxy advisor. We engage independently, and we vote independently to drive governance and performance. On your website, and, and I, I'm not going to apologize to you about reading your website. On your website, it says that it co-leads. Your website says BlackRock co-leads GFANS' work stream on sectoral decarbonization pathways. Those are your words. Does that sound familiar? Yes, sir. Okay. What's GFANS? G-F-A-N-Z. Um, G-FANS. Tell us what that is. The Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero. What does that mean when you join that? It's the same as the other, uh, any other group we join. Uh, we are joining it to participate in dialogue with other participants on issues that are important to our clients. In this case, the transition to a low-carbon economy. So to that point, uh, according to GFANS, a stated goal is, quote, to provide owners of carbon-intensive assets with tools and to incentivize and facilitate asset retirement and decarbonization in line with a science-based net zero pathway. Does that sound right? Yes, sir. In fact, didn't BlackRock help author the June 22, 2022 report on, quote, how to facilitate the early retirement of high-emitting assets, unquote? Is that the sectoral? Yeah, I believe we work work stream co leads on that. Work it says you help help me help write the article. Do you think it's necessary to finance early retirement of a significant amount of high emitting assets? Sir, just to um, perspective around this, the research paper and the paper that you are referencing, this is a research paper, um, and the idea behind it and the idea of why it's important to, you know, be um, participants in organizations like this, it goes through the assumptions um, that you, it explores and researches and makes analysis of assumptions that you would have to go through to get to a net zero, and that's important because it enables market participants to understand the cost-benefit of, of these pathways. So this is a research paper that was 
um, that the GFAN's um, organization, um, um, you know, asked for, commissioned, if you will, and so it just it runs through assumptions of how you could get there, giving us information. You say G fans asked for it. Your website says you co-lead G fans in this department. Isn't that right? This was a a, paper, a research commissioned by G fans. And you're part of G fans. We are members of G fans, correct? When you write these papers, do you expect people to read them? Sir, this was not written by BlackRock. We participated in a work stream, and I believe if you look at the document, um, it has a, a couple of columns of entities that were participants. We were co-lead um, in, in this one, but we did not, that this was not a BlackRock paper. It was commissioned by GFANS. It was under GFANS's rubric, and it goes through the assumptions that we believe are important for market participants to understand, but this is not directives to do anything. Let's just read what you said as a participant, what BlackRock said as a participant in this paper, it says. And I want to ask you if you agree with this. This, this is relevant to this community and this state and these people in this room. Yes, sir. Do you agree that it is best if companies and financial institutions, quote, manage down the greenhouse gas emissions from their portfolios rather than divest and transfer them to someone with less climate ambition? Do you agree with that? Um, yes, sir. We don't believe in divestment, and we've been very public about that. We, our lack of belief in divestment. So what that means here, that means... G fans working with BlackRock has said it's better to make the companies keep the coal plants and manage them down. That means shut them down rather than sell them to someone else who will keep operating them and keep the power and the jobs coming. That's exactly what that means in this community. And we're seeing that play out where similar plants have been purchased by investors who wish to continue to operate them. But the decision here is to prematurely shut it down. Uh, respectfully, Senator, this is about managing carbon emissions, not shutting down plants. By way of example, <laughs> manage down emissions. Manage down emissions, sir. Uh, Rather than divest and sell to someone with less climate ambition, they don't want to sell the plant to someone who will keep operating and not manage it down, as you so euphemistically state. May, may I? Please. I'd, I'd love to hear it. Thank you, sir. So, man managing your carbon emissions by way of example. Um, we are um, one of the largest investors in carbon capture with Navigator. Um, we are investing in, in a carbon capture facility using the old salt mines to put the carbon in there. Managing emissions is not shutting down the pump. Managing emissions is how we can get to net zero, be more efficient in terms of capturing that carbon, but it does not translate into um, you know, asking them, these companies, to stop producing oil or gas. We continue to be investors, and we have publicly said that we believe they are part of the solution, and the success of these companies is the success of our investors who are invested in them. Senator Birdwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I try not to be too loud. Um, I, I'm not so much that I, I have a question for for Ms. Blass. I, what I'm hearing is, is managing something down to zero, that's kind of like, you know, the doctor lets the patient die and claims success. Uh, it's kind of like if, if, and this has happened to both of us, where uh, we get a bill out of one body and somebody picks it up in the other house, not to actually move it, but to kill it. And so in this sense that BlackRock and, and, and uh, uh, State Street, uh, maybe you haven't spoken to this directly, ma'am, so maybe I should, but it, get to claim they invest in, in, the, in the energy industry uh, so that they don't deal with the boycott aspect, that they're not boycotting industry, but they're functionally malpracticing, in my view, in the sense of letting a, a, an energy production system uh, survive and thrive and continue to move if you're letting the patient die. And look, I, I think the, the folks that are going to testify later, um, you know, during uh, URI almost two years ago, about 30 to 32 percent, if I recall uh, correctly from, from uh, Senator Hancock's BNC hearings, about 30 to 32 percent of our electrical power generation in Texas is coal-fired electricity. Um, so 
you know, to just simply say, shut the plant down in, in another year and a half. I mean, I've got rural folks that are sick of seeing solar farms going up on every good piece of ranch land. Maybe that's why we're going to be eating insects instead of, you know, because there's nowhere for the cattle to graze. And you can't sit here and just simply be blind to the aspects and effects and say, you know, you're investing and, you know, and you're, 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 you're managing it down. I mean, you know, it, it, if I may speak bluntly, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I mean, it's like urinate on my leg and tell me it's raining. You know, I mean, I, I guess I'm just frustrated being taken for a fool, and we're not, we're not sitting up here being foolish. We're scared to death of what you're going to do to our citizens in this state of Texas. And call it the free marketplace. So, thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator Hall, get close to that microphone. Again, again how do you relate? You say it's not, it's managing their carbon emissions down to zero. How do you show that that can relate to, if you get them down to zero, your profits are going to go up. Your, the investments are going to be better, if that's what you're trying to do. Because what we're talking about here, they manage it down to zero. It shut down. It could have been sold to somebody else. But I don't, and we're, explain to me how there's a, that you have a, an analysis that shows that whatever it takes to do that, you get your, your, your down to zero and your profits are going to go up. Because that's what you said. It's about managing carbons to zero. So please explain that to me because it, it escapes me. Um. We, we appreciate, I, I appreciate, um, this is um, this is about people's livelihoods. Um, I, I really appreciate that. Um, I, I, um, my my mother-in-law lives down the I-70. She's um, a pensioner, 87-year-old retired school teacher on a fixed income. Um, I, I appreciate the price of gas and what it's doing to a lot of the communities around the United States. I just, I just want to... You know, Senator, Vice Chairman Birdwell, what you said, we are not blind to the effects of, of this. And no, no one can be. No one can be, sir. Well, you, you may not wait, be. Wait a minute. I, no, no, excuse me. And, 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 just, uh, are you working towards an answer? Because nothing you've said so far even closely addresses the question I asked. Um, I, know, I'm, I, I am working to an answer, and I apologize, um, sir. Um, managing to net zero is essentially making sure that you are, that carbon you're emitting, um, you're also offsetting that. You're taking that, you know, the, the, the carbon out. So right. I want to make sure we're so, clear. You're, you're, you're saying that manage down in the context of a coal-fired power plant, you're saying manage down does not mean move towards shutting down. Come on. We're talking about coal-fired power plants. That's, that's, that's the context here. I, I I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. Um, when we are looking at the net zero um, transition, the transition to a low carbon economy, we are looking at multiple factors that can move in that direction, from renewable energy that can replace some of um, some of the uh, fossil fuels, but also to carbon capture and to making our energy production more and more efficient. Which, as you noted, the United States has has done that. Central, I'll go ahead. Uh, go ahead. You told us earlier that your objective was to maximize investments. Now you're telling us that your objective is zero carbon emissions. Which is it? No, no, no sir. That's, uh, what, that's what you just said. I mean, twice now I've heard you say that. No, sir. I was answering what net zero is. Our objective as a fiduciary asset manager is to provide the, rest, the best risk-adjusted returns for our clients. We do that by looking at the market risks. We do that by looking at market opportunities. Okay. We do that okay. by looking at how the companies are managing their risks. And as the global regulators, including here in the United States, are moving more and more towards a regulatory system around net zero and, and, and yeah. carbon yes, reduction, you, told us that we look at how they're managing that to make sure that long-term they are able to produce results for our clients who rely on the success of these companies. Okay. You, I think it's probably about three times you've given that kind of answer to various questions. My question is, how does reducing their carbons to zero increase their net worth, their revenues? 
how, how does that do it? If, if what you're going to say, you need to get your carbon emissions to zero, and your objective is to maximize in value, how does that work? What is the analysis that you have that says, Mr. Coal Plant over here, if you'll get your carbon emissions to zero, your net worth is going to go up, your revenue is going to come, go up, and the whole country is going, to, is going to prosper from that. Where is the analysis that supports that? We have done an analysis that shows an orderly market transition to net zero is much better for our clients' portfolios than a disorderly, a disorderly transition to what, net zero. What is an orderly transition? One that is paced out, one that is supportive of communities and not rushed, one one that is um, thought through, if you will. An orderly transition is much better for communities and for the for our clients' portfolios. Okay, so, so if they take ten years to shut down, that's better than if they shut down in five years. So is, that, we, is that orderly? Because they be, they get to zero in ten years instead of getting zero at five years. Is that? Uh, but the five years would be better than the 10 years. Sir, what we, what we look at is long-term trends. We look at regulations. We look at long-term trends. We look at what companies, but, but, how they manage their risks. But for who? I'm talking about for the plant that you're telling. Now they're, you're, you're, you're letting this board know that, that if you're not going to be voting for zero carbon emissions, we're going to try to get you off the board. <coughs> so you're trying to get them to zero emissions, and their choice is... Shut down. It's, it's, it's to shut down. How is that beneficial to the bottom line of that operation? Sir, we look at macroeconomic trends and we put out research in that regard. With respect to companies. I'm not asking you what you look at. I'm just saying it's a real simple, it's not a complicated question. How is requiring a company to go to zero emissions in their best interest to do that? From, a, from an investment standpoint, what, it, what is it says that your company, the one just like the one we got here at Marshall, they're going to be at net zero. How is that in, will have been in their best interest to go out of business? Sir, what we, with respect to our engagement with companies, we don't tell them do this or do that. We ask them, how are you managing the risks? How are you, what, what are the material risks to your business? How are but, you managing but, but these why is z net zero carbons even one of your concerns about risk that they're managing? What is the risk of not getting to, what is the risk to that company of not getting to zero carbons? I don't even understand why you even have it in your, your list of questions that you would even ask. Um, th thank you, Senator. We look at uh, physical tran and transition risks with respect to climate. So physical risks are things like hurricanes and if a business is impacted. Transition risks um, include actually regulatory changes and risk by way of example. And as regulators move increasingly to um, around climate um, goal, climate um, disclosures and climate regulations, we look at how a company is managing against that because we are looking at the long term to generate those long term returns for our clients. So it's how, it, how you're managing your physical risks, how you're managing your transition risks so in accordance ask, with your what business. What does zero emissions have to do with anything you just had to say? I understand all of what you said, and I cannot make the connection between getting to zero carbon emissions and a, and a general discussion on risk management. That, that's trip. exactly what you gave, and I understand risk management. But I, I want to know what is it specifically about zero emissions that causes you to tell a, a company that if you want to max, maximize your asset value, you get to zero emissions. Um, it's the transition risk, sir, and we don't tell them you have to get to this. We ask them, how are you looking at this in the, in the global economy, in terms of the regulatory atmosphere that you are working in, and how are you managing it? But it's the transition risks that impact... I'm not talking about risk. I'm not talking about risk. I'm asking about end objective. You, you, okay, we get all the master risk managed, and we get to zero emissions. How does that improve their, ass, their net value, net worth, their assets, their income? They get there. They hand manage everything. Now, don't talk about transition, whatever. We get there. How, how is, is that an advantage from the standpoint of asset value? 
sir, uh, companies um, operate in a highly regulated environment here in the United States and across the globe, and making sure that they are looking at uh, regulatory changes um, that could impact their business in the short term, medium term, and long term is important. Is very important for them to continue to be able to generate this long term performance, which, as fiduciaries, is what we're looking for them to do um, on behalf of our clients. Okay, Mr. Chairman, you can have it back. I give up. We're not going to get an answer. I've got Senator Betancourt had one, and then we'll come back to Senator Colcourt. Senator Betancourt. Um, I just want to say something to the audience here today. Um, there's no fact or supposition of fact that managing down a coal plant means to shut it down. There were workers here this morning. I wish they were here today and uh, this afternoon because I would say it to you, Senator, um, that I will do everything I can to help you to keep this plant from being shut down because it's a symbol of what's wrong with this entire discussion that we've had today. Senator Hall, I laud your efforts to try to get a straight answer. Um, but the straight answer to this back row and everybody else listening is when you talk about a, a coal plant and you're gonna manage it to zero, you're talking about a shutdown. And we don't need these plants to shut down. Um, we have the cleanest tech coal technology in the country. Uh, Senator Colcourse made a comment about the fact that in China they're talking about gigawatts, gigawatts of construction. That's a thousand times the five megawatts that I'll be proposing we need to bring onto the Texas grid. And the order of magnitude and scale is astonishing because it's three orders of magnitude. It's a thousand more, not even counting the digit of it. And so, basically, what we've seen here today, then I'm going to say this to Senator Birdwell, I don't see how either one of these companies is in compliance with Senate Bill uh, 13. Ladies, you better reconsider your positions, because it's, in my mind, an open and shut case that you're not complying with Senate Bill 13. And that has specific financial uh, 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 you know, uh, consequences uh, for everybody involved. And the fact of the matter is that the longer this discussion goes on, the more sure of it I am. Because if you can't tell the truth to a simple question, because you've got a Swepco plant that's uh, owned by ADP here, and, and all the discussion today is managing it effectively down to zero, it means you're going to shut the plant down decades ahead of its economic life. And that's not good for this local area. It's not good for the Texas grid. It's not good for economic reality as I understand it. And um, I, I'll, with, all, with all due respect to all the discussion of market trends and et cetera, okay, we've seen enough evidence to understand uh, that, uh, that what we're dealing with here um, are companies that seem to have made up their minds about what we should be doing and uh, in the state of Texas. And I submit that they're uh, incorrect. And that uh, what, I don't need any more anecdotal evidence, I don't need more direct evidence. Um, I know that they're not following the intent of Senate Bill 13. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna continue to say it because I don't need to be convinced anymore. I've already heard enough hours of testimony, Chairman. And I think they've been very enlightening. Uh, and uh, so ladies, I would encourage you to take back those words uh, and, and reconsider your positions because uh, I believe Senator Colcourse is correct. You can't serve two masters here. And, um, and our intent is clear. And I believe back to Florida, the Governor DeSantis is gonna end up with a bill very much similar to Senate Bill 13. Uh, and, uh, and with that being said, uh, Senator, I wanna thank you for the invitation to bring us here to talk about this because it was the employees that we are sitting in the back corner of this courtroom are the ones that may have the problem because they're the ones that are going to be directly affected by this type of, of ESG uh, uh, attitude that is permeated documents, permeated statements, permeates the reality 
of, uh, of these two companies that have been testifying on it. And the question is, did we fight for these employees or not? And I may be from Houston, but I'll fight for them because I know this battle's coming to our consumers in Houston when we turn on the light switch and this plant is not there. So I'm willing to fight and I already know the answer and I believe the answer is clearly uh, that State Street and BlackRock are not in compliance with Senate Bill 13. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Senator Colcourt. Just a quick question. We talked a lot about coal today or later this afternoon. Uh, what's your stance on natural gas plants? So quite honestly, we don't have a stance on any particular business model or any particular energy source. What we have a stance on is that we believe the science that suggests that the globe is warming, we believe the science that suggests that that is in part driven by emissions. So our only interest is in making sure that companies are processing what that might mean for them. And I'll just give an example. Again, I grew up in Pennsylvania. Father was a coal miner, his father was a coal miner. As you all know, the coal mining industry in Pennsylvania was basically decimated. The other side of it, though, is we were very fortunate because the fracking industry took off. And part of the, what decimated the coal industry was the fact that you could get cheap natural gas to fire the plants. And so it was a combination of some regulatory changes that had happened over many, many years, coupled with new technology. So I, I share that story because I, I'm, I'm disappointed deeply that you know we may walk out of here leaving the impression that somehow we're not aligned. I think we're all aligned towards we want companies to manage those risks. And I would directly answer Mr. Hall's question by saying I have no evidence that this is good for returns in, in, in any time frame. In fact, we've seen the evidence quite the contrary. The last year, if you didn't own energy companies, you did miserably compared to broad benchmarks. The year before that, it was quite the opposite. If you didn't own energy companies going into the pandemic, it was actually a boon for you. But that was just a happenstance. That's not because it's good investment. So I, 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 I'll, so I'll say one final comment, then I promise you I'll be quiet. Um, so to me, it's about making sure the companies understand the regulatory, the consumer, the physical, the reputational, the physical structure, the operation. If they understand those risks and they're managing them, then we're good. And I think what, what, what hasn't been stated is the obvious is the Green New Deal, uh, I believe it was renamed something like uh, the Inflation Induction. Inflation Reduction Act. Whatever that was. That's a great marketing tool. I wish I could... <laughs> you just can't make that stuff up. But anyway, what you're saying is you're trying to tell your companies that you're investing in, there's $2 trillion out here, go chase it, basically. And, Bob, that's the answer to your question. But as a state senator in the state of Texas, I have to tell you that URI is uh, fresh on all of our minds. You take a coal plant out of operation, um, then you are putting us at risk uh, for not meeting the needs. And there is no way that the state of Texas can operate mm -hmm. on coal and solar. Zero way that we can do it. I mean, tonight, when the sun sets here, I will tell you how much yeah. solar is putting on the grid. It is zero. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely zero. In fact, on a cloudy day, I'll tell you how much it's putting on. Zero, um, right? From Pennsylvania. And the batteries are not capable of keeping days. it up. And once the batteries finally get mm -hmm. there, I think they have about two hours storage, we can't stack them. Robert Nichols asked if we could stack them. It's a great engineer question. All the, the things that Bob said, uh, the long-term effects, and, and where rare earth materials are. And uh, again, I've, I've noted some other uh, countries. I don't see them as enemies. I see them as competitors. No different than TCU in Michigan on December 31st. Maybe slightly different, uh, but they are our competitor. And it is my job to put Texas at the forefront of competing. And we cannot compete with solar and wind. And we saw what happened in Uri, and we came this close this summer, this close in June. And had we not had that coal plant here in Harrison County, 
we probably would have been without energy. Every one of them had to be firing at its top right. So for us, we are going to build more dispatchable, what I call base load, and I, it takes too long to get nuclear. We're going with gas, and we're going to build a bunch of it. So I hope you all get on. And finally, I'll just leave it with this, that whether it's World Economic Forum or the Green New Deal, um, there are standards being set out there that the whole world is not living by. Mm. And I'm going to go back to that. I'm elected by people that actually think that every day I wake up seven days a week is to put their families at the forefront of my mind and represent them and put them in a position, like I said to Senator Lucio, research him. He came from the most humble of beginnings to go on to be a state senator in the state of Texas. It is my job to let every one of my constituents live the American dream, and I view ESG as doing nothing but marginalizing this country that I have been so blessed to have been born into. And so every day I'm going to fight for this. And I'm going to say this again, TRS and ERS, it's time to pick up our marbles and move. And then maybe the state of Texas, who is arguably the richest state right now in the United States of America, will start changing the opinions of investment firms. I really have appreciated y'all being here today. You've been fabulous. You probably should answer some of those a little more directly. But thank you for being here. Um, I look forward to working with y'all. Uh, but my job is to put Texas at the forefront, and Texas is in the United States of America, so I'm going to fight for this country too. We have been our own country once. Uh, we're very proud here, and we're extremely independent. Extremely. So if I was a New York AG and had as little resources as they did up there, I'd probably say, okay, I'd write a letter like that. We're not. We're not. We are blessed with even rare earth materials. So we're going to do our th own thing here, and we're going to do it in a way that puts our constituents at the forefront of being successful and living that American dream. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Senator, Senator Birdwell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, um, I'll be, I know I'm, I'm being too... I don't want to yell. Um, ladies, thank you all for, for joining us today. I think the, the, the practical reality of, of what you've told us in testimony is, whether it's State Street, Black Rock, Vanguard, pick, pick the, the, the combination of, of folks. Look, I, I don't, I'm not one that, that buys the, the climate change. Um, I think too much of our conversation in here, I mean, while the, the committee hearing was not designed to have the argument of the climate changing or not, uh, there are those of us that don't buy it for a lot of different reasons and a lot of facts related to it. But what I don't want to see happen is financial leverage used to basically put dispatchable energy on hospice because that's what you're functionally doing. You may call it something else or, you know, investment strategies and the like, but we're not going to put, you know, coal and gas. I've got a nuclear plant in my district. It was the only, the only electric generation in the state of Texas that was unimpacted by winter storm Uri. And it's why Dallas and Fort Worth didn't completely freeze to death because of the nuclear plant in my district. The federal government's already trying to put dispatchable energy on hospice. Texas isn't going to participate in that. Please don't take our tone and our tenor as hostility to you personally. It's not designed that way. But the hard reality is um, we don't want, like the citizens of Germany are going to be doing this winter, you know, scraping the woods, grabbing, you know, grabbing wood and taking us back to the 1800s because it is fossil fuels that has made us so prosperous, so productive, so safe, and the like. You know, wind and solar certainly have a place, but they're not the anchor, they're not the center of gravity. And my center of gravity is my constituents, and to make sure that Texas stays free and strong and prosperous 
and I think absolutely that that whether what Senator Hall said that about I guess Senator Colcourt's comment about I guess at some point we're just going to have to decide to, to disagree and break contact. Uh, and I think that's the direction we probably ought to take as a state, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ladies, for joining us today. Senator, thank you. And, and for the benefit of those who, who do wish to testify uh, after uh, we're uh, moved from this portion of the hearing, uh, we will need a witness affirmation card filled out, and they are just outside the courtroom, outside those doors. So anybody who wants to testify can testify. A few more questions about voting while you're here and while we're on the topic. And so, Ms. Heinle, going, going back to State Street, um, we're going to look at another document uh, just to make sure we understand uh, and that we're we understand what you're telling us and what State Street's position is. And so uh, there's a document from 2022 entitled Energy Transition, Fast Forward or Slow Down. We'll grab that. You got that. It's uh, 7963. Got it. I can give you some background. This was prepared by someone at State Street for a summit held a few months ago, June of, of this year. Does that look familiar to you? I've not seen this, partic I've not oh, seen this particular pr presentation, but I do know we shared it with you, so I'll, I'm, I know the individual and I'm familiar with the content broadly. Thank you. So we're going to go to page two of this document, and it says uh, on, page, on the second page, it says oil prices are set to remain relatively high over the medium term given supply scarcity. And then it says a focus on decarbonization by many of the oil majors may constrain their investment. Tell us, tell us what's meant by that. Yeah. So um, just for context, the person who presented this, Esther Brody, is a portfolio manager in one of our active strategies. Uh, she is located in London, and her job is to deliver alpha for clients. So she looks at all of these issues through the lens of um, the you know financial impact to a company and ultimately whether it's a good investment. So my understanding of what she would mean when she says those words is that there are pressures, certainly in Europe, which is where she is, to decarbonize, which again, as um, Vice Chairman Birdwell has rightly noted, has not served them well, particularly given the intensity of the energy crisis with the Russia-Ukraine conflict. But the basis of her whole thesis is to um, that energy companies are going to be continually getting pressure from regulators in Europe where there's this acute um, interest in divesting, for example, and they need to be able to respond to that. With that, let's take a look at the uh, annual climate stewardship review from 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, it came out in October. We'll pull that up for you, and you'll, again, this is Wednesday, this is your department, one of yes, the many sir. things you're responsible for. Yes, sir. And so we're going to go down to page seven of this document. Um, and at the top, it notes that uh, Climate Action 100 supported 12 shareholder proposals in 2020. Mm -hmm. And those 12 proposals are listed on the chart on pages 7 and 8. So let's look at page 8. It talks about one category of these proposals which relate to, quote, lobbying for a policy framework alignment with the Paris Agreement, unquote. So is it correct that these proposals direct companies to align their lobbying and their trade association membership with implementing the Paris Agreement? Well, so again, the context for a lot of this is that right now, it's a bit of the Wild West in this space. So different jurisdictions are imposing, in some cases, quite draconian disclosure requirements or expectations. And again, as I mentioned earlier in my testimony this morning, um, there are even some proposals being circulated within the United States that would be quite extreme in terms of what it would require companies to disclose. It would be quite labor intensive for them to do it. There's no common framework for how to you know, calculate some of these things like scope three emissions, for example. So again, the spirit of this, and I, I'm trying to quickly read exactly the words, was in this context of companies need to participate in the process too to make make sure that there is um, coherence and that the costs of complying with these kinds of regulatory requirements are not undue burdens for them. So then it, it sounds like you're saying this is directing companies to lobby 
against aggressive climate uh, so there, policy? Well, there are two, it, 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 two it reads like it, forgive me, it reads yeah. like the opposite of that. Yeah. So, there so two, we'd like to understand that. So there are two pieces. So one is that, as we mentioned earlier, many of these companies themselves have put forward their own net zero aspirations. And so there, you know, again, we are supportive of, and I've said this, um, that there is a climate impact and there is a um, greenhouse gas emissions, or at least in part, uh, contributing to that. So that is our posture. I recognize not everybody believes that, but as, that is our posture. Many of these companies have themselves also adopted that posture. So one piece of it is they've often made their own commitments, and then the question really is how do we manage through how the regulatory environment is going to evolve to require disclosure reporting. And there are some extreme examples where some jurisdictions want a lot of very detailed reporting on these things. We think that would be counterproductive because it would be very expensive for companies to comply. It could be quite complex because you might have different jurisdictions wanting different things. And it won't help investors because they won't have a clear body of reliable information to judge. To be clear, yes, sir. this language, and I realize we, we're mm -hmm. skipping around, but this language is about encouraging companies to lobby in a certain direction. On are behalf you, of the are, disclosure, yes, are sir. Are you concerned that companies are going to lobby f to move too quickly toward net zero and you want to slow them down? I, it's, I'm, it's I'm genuinely about, confused. I, yeah, I, I want to understand. So it's not about lobbying toward net zero. It's about lobbying towards the disclosures that they'll have well, to abide by is as it, they make their commitments. Okay, and we'll see this language in some of the votes, but it says lobbying for a policy framework alignment with the Paris Agreement. And to be clear, Paris Agreement's about a whole lot more than disclosure. Wouldn't we agree with that? It, it is. Wouldn't yes. BlackRock agree with that? Mm -hmm. Yes? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So let's move on, and I think yep. this will make more sense. But to be clear, uh, whatever direction this is taking, this is saying that Climate Action 100 should be directing companies and in how they exercise their lobbying, how they exercise their political speech. Whatever the message is, that's what that says, right? And again, it's because we're trying to get their voice into how these issues get disclosed, reported on, and to make sure that we are, there's coherence globally around how these things happen to reduce the cost and the burden of complying with that disclosure. Many of the members of Climate Action 100 are foreign asset managers and, and asset owners. Isn't that right? Yes, that is correct. And this directive is about the lobbying and political speech of American companies. Isn't that right? Well, it's all companies globally. So we engage with companies globally, not just in the U.S. Does it affect the political speech and lobbying of American companies? It, it, would, it would, yes, sir. Yes. Um, 16089, you got 16089. Um, you, uh, it's, I've got a spreadsheet that you provided to us, and I know we have a lot of documents, but you're probably aware State Street provided this committee with a document that contains notes about its engagements related to certain companies, including Chevron. Uh, that document has a row 54. It talks about a May 4th, 2020 call mm -hmm. uh, between, uh, re regarding Chevron between Michael Jonas at SSGA and Adam Kanzer, who is the head of stewardship at BNP Paribas. Paribas, Paribas, how do we say that? Paribas. Paribas. I knew that. I read that somewhere. BNP Paribas. So you're familiar with BNP Paribas. I am, yes. And with uh, Mr. Kanzer. Uh, I don't know him personally, but I know Michael Yunus on my team. Okay, yes, very good. And the label on this row is engaging for voting purpose, engagement for voting purpose. And the notes regarding this call say this, new type of proposal, 10 years of traditional lobbying proposals. This proposal is different and focuses on, exclus ex focuses on exclusively the alignment with the Paris Agreement. Proposal asks board to conduct an evaluation and report on its lobbying, including misalignment with these activities. Paris Agreement is imperative and failure to achieve presents a critical systemic risk to all of our portfolios. Trade associations play an outsized role here and we need to make sure that the lobbying act activities of these organizations are in alignment with Paris. Mm -hmm. Did I read that right? Again, I don't have it right in front of me, but that sounds, I believe you, yes, that's true. Okay. So why is State Street Global Advisors uh, coordinating with BNP uh, Paribas 
about taking action on Chevron's lobbying and Chevron's membership in trade associations. So I don't know the details of that particular engagement, so I can get back to you. But again, the context that we do this in is to make sure that they are getting their voice out around what their commitments are. Because in many cases, these companies have already made commitments. They are going to need to report and disclose those commitments. And it's in all of our best interests to make sure that there's a coherent framework through which they can do that. So this is to help Chevron lobby in favor of what's good for its shareholders or to encourage, manage, engage Chevron to lobby in favor of more Paris Accord results. They're, they're very different and they're, they're, they're very, very different. different things. And I think and it's clear, but I'd like to know what you think. Yeah, so again, my view is not that they are lobbying per se for more draconian emissions restrictions. That's not what we're asking to lobby for. They've already made commitments of what their future pathway is. It's in their interest, it's in our interest, it's in the shareholders' interests to make sure that everybody's clear about how they're going to disclose those commitments, what the regulatory framework is against that, and to have coherence and consistency in that regulatory framework. Otherwise, what you get is they're spending a lot of time figuring out how they're going to report to the U.S. government, how they're going to report to the U.K. government, how they're going to report to the Singapore government. Everywhere they have operations, they might have a different reporting schema, which would be very confusing yeah. for investors. What you described is noble, and I understand uh, alignment of those reporting processes. This is not saying that. This is talking about Chevron's lobbying and Chevron's participation in trade associations and making sure that the lobbying activities of the trade associations are in alignment with Paris. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what it says? It, it does. And again, that's where it, it's very nuanced. I would stand by, we are not encouraging companies to specifically lobby around target setting. They have to own their targets. They have to um, have the pathways of how they're going to get there. But the intersection with how they're disclosing that, how, what the regulatory frameworks are that require and mandate that disclosure, that's quite fluid. And we're all, I think, trying to come to some framework that will be implementable, provide the information investors need, and be manageable for the companies. So to be clear. Yes, sir. You are not, you are not encouraging Chevron to lobby and for Chevron's trade associations to lobby in accordance with the Paris Accords? Um, Council, we're, we're not asking them to lobby on behalf of a specific net zero target, ever. We're not asking them to lobby in favor of a specific net zero target. That's not what we do. We do ask them to engage in the same dialogue we're having today. What are the implications of a commitment that I as a company made this commitment? So Chevron made commitments. How do they then evidence those commitments? What regulatory framework, what disclosure framework? That's, and again, counsel, anything else do, that I'm missing? Do you really think you have to ask them to lobby in their own interests and for their trade associations? It's a rhetorical question. We can, we can keep going. Uh, you can answer if you want to. No, I'll, I'll pass if it's okay. I think, oh, I think I've answered as best I can, sir. Uh, BNP, uh, Paribus, uh, they were uh, coordinating this action with part of Climate Action 100 based on the mm. correspondence we read about with your company. Isn't that, isn't that right, with your firm? I believe that to be true, yes, sir. BNP, uh, Paribus, part owned by the Belgian government. Is that right? Uh, I, I, I think of them as a French French company, but um, I, so they may be partly by Belgium, I'm not sure, but I do think of them as a French domiciled uh, entity. Did you perform any analysis to determine whether their motivations were financial or maybe intended to advance a foreign government's policy agenda? I did not look at that specifically, no, sir. What's the financial basis for saying, for Chevron in particular, mm -hmm. not for the global economy, not for the common good, but for Chevron in particular, what's the basis for saying Paris Agreement is imperative and failure to achieve presents a critical systemic risk to all of our portfolios? Yep. So again, keep in mind that these are companies that have made those commitments independently. 
They are, in some cases, bound by those commitments and jur jurisdictions or geographies that they operate in, and they have a requirement to be able to evidence that they are complying. That's whether we were involved in the picture or not. That's the framework. I want to talk to you about some Delta and United Airlines lobbying and voting. We've talked about climate lobbying proposals and there was, we talked about Chevron, there were also votes for Delta and United Airlines that you were involved with. Uh, and then the, those were 2020. 2021, mm -hmm. this came up again for Delta and for United Airlines. Now both in 2020 and 2021, you'll probably recall that Delta's board and United's boards recommended against this proposal. Is that your recollection? That's my recollection. And, and that's what happened. And again, despite those recommendations, uh, State Street again voted in favor of the proposals. And this time, and the second time, those proposals passed, didn't they? Mm -hmm. I, that, I believe that to be true, yes, sir. And these were both supported by, by Climate Action 100. Uh, in fact, the one for Delta was introduced by BNP Paribus Asset Management. Mm -hmm. Is that your recollection? I, I don't recall the details of that, who originated that, but I believe that that's true, yes. Well, there's a call in May of 2020 between SSGA, your firm, mm -hmm. and Adam Kanzer at BNP Paribus Asset management about climate lobbying proposal. That was in May of 2020. Do you know if, if State Street again agreed to coordinate with BNP Paribus on these votes in 2021? So I, I don't know the details of whether there was that kind of activity. Again, we ultimately we vote our own analysis and we vote based on our what we believe is in the interest of shareholders. Now you probably know this, but I think folks here might be interested just in case. Mm -hmm. After those Delta and United votes, which passed over the objection of management. After those votes, Climate Action 100 and Saris issued, press, issued a press release, and they said these votes were a major victory for them. In fact, the first person quoted in the press release was Mr. Kanzer, and he said, corporations have a significant impact on climate policy directly and through their trade associations. Mm -hmm. This string of majority votes is strong recognition by investors that these efforts must be fully aligned with the well below two degrees goal of the Paris Agreement. Mm -hmm. Does that sound familiar? It does, yes. Does that sound like uh, this guy is bragging that these votes were taken and it's a wonderful goal because now <laughs> We're fully aligning to get to this well below two degrees goal of the Paris Agreement. Is there any other way to interpret that? No, sir. And, and again, I, I would just lean. That's not yeah, that's not. No, it's not our statement. That's. Yeah. Well, it's not, it wasn't our statement. We're well, being advised not to comment. So I it's understand. Not our statement. But you're part of Climate Action 100. We are, yes, sir. Um, this press release went on. Saris, a founding partner of Climate Action 100 and ICCR, helped coordinate support for the proposals among North American investors. ICCR launched a concerted initiative in 2020 to spur companies to disclose and align their lobbying activities and their trade association memberships with the goals of the Paris Agreement." Unquote. Do you know, after joining Climate Action 100, um, how many of the uh, climate lobbying proposals State Street voted for in 2021? So I don't have the precise numbers, but what I can share is that our voting record has been quite consistent. Um, if you look at before we voted, or before we joined Climate Action 100 and post, as a general rule, we voted with management about 80% of the time, and that was fairly consistent, in part because we're not being very prescriptive in the way we expect them to adjudicate their responsibilities and their business plans. Rather, it's more of a framework and how we engage with them. So the act of joining Climate Action 100 did not really change the overall support that we had for management in the energy space. Thank you. Thank you. The information we have shows that after formally joining Climate Action 100, uh, State Street supported eight out of ten climate lobbying proposals in 2021. 
Do you know how many of those eight that? I don't, is that, well, I don't have that detail in front no of me, I'm problem. sorry. No problem, we'll, we'll have to get back to you. It'll concise. speak for it. the record. Will, go ahead, please. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No, no, I was just saying I don't have that specific detail that you're referencing. I have a different stat, so we'll have to reconcile that for you, sir. Does your record show, as mine, that uh, every climate action uh, vote that State Street took was opposed by management? In 2021, our records show they were all opposed by management. Again, I don't have that in front of me. I'll have to get back to you, sir. Thanks. In the uh, second quarter stewardship activity report, we'll pull it up for you. It's, it's mm -hmm. your second quarter 2021 stewardship activity report. We're going to take a look at that. It has some votes involving Phillips 66, uh, Miller for America, and, for, and certainly for our area. So on, on page five. Do you remember the document I'm talking about? And Again, I'm familiar with all these documents. I don't remember exactly every detail, but yes, I'm familiar with the documents. No problem. Well, on page five, it discusses a vote on scope three emissions reduction targets for Phillips 66 in 2021. And if you look at page four above this table, you'll see where it says requested companies to expand emissions reduction targets beyond scope one and two emissions. So above the table, right, requested companies to expand emissions reductions targets beyond scope one and two emissions. Can you just go down a little bit? Because I think it says there that we actually, it says for this reason we voted against the proposal requesting the company adopt scope one, two, and three targets, sir. No, we're, we're getting to okay, it. We just want to get you, give you the context okay. for it. Thanks. Thanks. And so, uh, State Street said about this about this vote, uh, Phillips 66 has not yet adopted any greenhouse gas emissions targets. We believe greenhouse gas emissions are a material risk for the sector and supported the proposal to bring the company better in line with peers. Recommendations and our and our climate expectations. Yeah. We also believe that Phillips 66, one of the largest U.S. refiners, is well positioned to lead other midstream and downstream operators in adopting such commitments. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Yes. The, yes. And again, this is all related to their <clears throat> disclosure and them being, you know, um, leaders amongst their peers who are. So it's all around disclosure, yes, sir. Well, to be clear, mm -hmm. the first statement I read, so I'm quoting, Phillips 66 has not yet adopted. It doesn't say disclosed. Right. It says Fair has point. not yet adopted right. greenhouse gas emissions right. targets. Fair point. And, and respectfully, in response to a number of questions, there's been an obfuscation of, of requiring uh, targets be set and requiring that they be disclosed. So, so thank you for, for staying I with understand. us. That's fair. I understand. Yes. And so in this particular case, they had not even adopted the targets. That's, that's that's fair. Yes, sir. And so uh, the reference is to be better in line with peers. Now, in a moment about Chevron, you spoke about Chevron's peers and you specifically referred to European companies. We'll get to that. But who are the peers that we're trying to bring, that you're trying to bring, bring Phillips 66 in line with? Well, it would be the entire energy universe, which would include companies around the globe, including those in the United States. Yes, sir. Why is bringing Phillips 66 in line with its peers in the best interest of Phillips 66 shareholders? Well, again, our view is that companies need to have a plan for how they are navigating the transition and companies that are more thoughtful about that plan, including having their own targets of what they plan to do and what they don't plan to do, and then disclosing those will be able to manage that transition better. Disclosing as well as adopting, not just disclosing, adopting, right? Uh, so, so first, under, understand their risks as it relates to the transition. So, 
what are their physical assets today, um, what businesses are they in, what markets do they serve, all those things. So it starts with their business model, their business strategy, and then the question we ask them to ask themselves is what are my risks as they relate to the transition and what does that mean in terms of commitments that I as a company will set and then how will I be able to evidence that over time through disclosure and through measurement. So on page five, there's a reference to a proposal in 2021, which a State Street voted for to again require Philip 66 lobbying to be in accord with the Paris Agreement. And we yeah. differ over what that means, but do you see where I'm reading? I, I do, okay. yes, sir. And again, Philip 66 board opposed that proposal, didn't they? Uh, I believe that to be the case, yes, sir. Well, the, uh, the record will show that they did. Yeah. Uh, what financial analysis did State Street perform before voting contrary to the management recommendation on this proposal? Yeah, so again, we would have conducted analysis around what their peers do what inv information we would expect investors to have available to them. And if investors don't have the information available to be able to make assessments, then we would typically vote against because we think it's important to have that disclosure and that information transparency. It's a, it's a principles-based argument. So it's, un, it's not that we necessarily are doing a lot of financial analysis on the actual plan they've put in place. It's more about are they giving us as investors the transparency of what that plan is, why they think it's going to be a good plan for them, and then how are they going to report on that through time? Are they setting goals you like and being transparent are about those goals? Are they setting any goals, sir? Are they setting any goals? And, and, and again, the answer could be we have zero commitment, we have zero target, and here's why we might not like that, but that would be their prerogative at that stage. And what would be the consequences of that? Well, we would likely vote against them because we would likely want to see a more planful uh, path forward yeah. through the transition. Yes, sir. So respectfully, what we're saying is, you're saying to the company, you can do whatever you want, but we're going to vote all our shares against you if you don't do what we want. Well, if you don't have a plan that we believe is credible and that addresses the transition pathway. Yes, sir. Now, according to Climate Action 100, this campaign uh, about Phillips 66 lobbying and its trade associations was led by CalSTRS, which we've spoken about before. You know, of course, that's the California government agency. Yes. Is, is that right? Yes, I know them. Yes. How did State Street determine it was in Phillips 66 shareholders' best interest for a California government agency to dictate Texas company's corporate speech. That's 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 perplexing to us. I, I it's troubling to us. So I appreciate that. Um, this is perhaps the nuance of how some of these organizations work, and you you talked about it earlier as well. There are initiatives, and various of the members kind of take the lead on those initiatives. So in that particular case, Calsters had been in the the position to take that lead. State Street think it's good policy for California to limit Texas companies' political speech? No, sir. We don't believe it's in the best interest of anybody to limit anybody's political speech. Was voting with Calsters to limit their political speech about maximizing shareholder returns or about supporting California's political goals? Our only interest in all of this is to make sure that these companies have thought through credibly their transition pathways, that they are lobbying for coherent and achievable disclosures, and that they are complying with those disclosures through time. Have you reviewed Calster's communication with State Street regarding this vote? I have not read, I have not looked at that, no. Will you do that for us? Yes, of course. Will you share that with us? Absolutely. Don't need a written request for that? No, sir. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. We really would like to know what blue state pension funds are telling you to do with Texas companies. This is a big deal. And so we look forward to seeing those documents. Of course. We're talking about the Chevron vote. And while we're on that, uh, while we're in this area, uh, page four of that same stewardship activity report from second quarter 2021. Page four, that's 5080, Drew. It discusses State Street voting for a proposal in 2021 to require disclosure of reduction targets covering scope three emissions for Chevron. Mm -hmm. Item four on the proxy card, you got that? 
Now, you probably remember this, and it won't surprise anyone, that Chevron's board recommended against this proposal, yes. didn't they? Mm -hmm. Is that right? Mm -hmm. But State Street voted for the proposal. Is that right? That, that's correct. And I will also, I'm sure you have this as well, in 2022, we actually did vote with all management and board uh, proposals, and we specifically called out the progress that Chevron had made over the prior year, and we retain a very strong engagement relationship with the company. We're pleased that as Texas and other energy states have shown a light on these matters that that things have developed in a different direction. We're glad about that. Let's talk about this 2021 vote for yes. now, though. Mm -hmm. Thanks for sharing that. We'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, the report from State Street says, quote, as a major U.S. integrated oil and gas company, we believe that setting time-bound scope three targets, not just disclosing, but setting, mm -hmm time-bound scope three targets and outlining steps to achieve such targets would not only bring Chevron better in line with European peers, but also help lead the U.S. industry in establishing scope three disclosure and targets as market practice. Did I read that right? You did, sir. Yes. And so you mentioned before that the uh, energy market is worldwide. Why are we specifically wanting to be in line with our European peers? It's a global business, sir, and uh, so in general, we look at these operations as they're, they are they are global peers, and they operate in many of the same markets, and so we believe that it's useful for them to look at their peer universe globally. Yes, sir. Well, just to be clear, this doesn't say global peers. It says European peers. I understood. The intention is all peers. So I respect that it says they're European. The point is that we look at these energy companies as global players. They are all global players at that level. Is HSBC a European peer that you're interested in pushing this direction? Well, again, HSBC would operate amongst the financial services businesses globally, so they would be in the peer group with JP Morgan and you know other major lenders, Citibank, et cetera. So yes, HSBC would be a global peer in the financial services world. Yes, sir. Looking back at the spreadsheet of engagements, that's 16089, Council. Looking back to that spreadsheet of engagements, I'm going to go to an October 13, uh, 2021 engagement. Mm -hmm. And again, this is uh, on that spreadsheet, row 46, where State Street had a call. State Street had a call with the chairman and CEO of Chevron. It appears that this call was at the request of Chevron following the proxy season and the vote that we just talked about. Mm -hmm. And these notes reflect that State Street told Chevron, quote, SSGA, and that's State so Street Global, Global Advisors. Advisors. That's yes, you, right? Mm -hmm. State Street wants to see a pathway on how to get to a lower carbon economy. Is that right? That's right. So again, that's not, it's, it's that's all not just same. about that's not just about disclosure, is it? No, sir. And again, it's all in this context of the belief system we've talked about, and the energy companies need to our view that they are, need, want to participate in the transition to that. Yes, sir. So. Did State Street tell Chevron we want to move to a lower carbon economy so that they could maximize uh, returns for Chevron stockholders? So it's a little more circuitous than that. So for, I've, I've been on record, and I will say again, I don't believe that ESG factors per se drive long-term return. I do believe, and we do believe, that ESG exposures have risks that need to be mitigated and managed, but price matters, right? So the actual performance of the company through time will um, be based on a lot of factors. But what we have said, I think, consistently is that we believe that these companies need to participate in the transition and that those companies that are more proactive about understanding how their businesses are going to evolve, managing that transition, and you know, providing the disclosure and the information to investors to make sound decisions, that those companies will, will be best in class in that regard. The notes on this same vote say, in the context of scenario planning, that, quote, China may need to bring coal into the fold to support their growth. Remember that? Mm -hmm. Yes. So what's, just so we're clear, while State Street is pushing Chevron to create, quote, a pathway on how to get to a lower carbon economy, unquote, it's also recognizing that China needs to increase coal power generation. Is that right? 
it's recognizing we are not advocating that. We just recognize that for lots of unfortunate reasons, they're at a stage in their maturation where they're still dependent on very dirty fossil fuels that we would ideally like to see them transition from. Do you know how much new coal power China built in 2021? I, 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 the, um, no, different numbers. No. Oh, okay. Sorry. 33 gigawatts. Yeah. You know it's how much large. we have in Texas today? It's nothing. We have 18. Right. Barely half that. Yeah. Now, and again, we've been quite on record to say that the best way to manage greenhouse gas emissions in the shorter term, it would be to convert coal-fired facilities in places like India and China to natural gas or other less dirty fuel sources. And at the risk of stating the obvious, coal plants in America are a whole lot different, a whole lot, a lot cleaner, a whole lot safer I, I know than that Chinese. Is, isn't that correct? Than that Chinese coal plants. Correct. But again, I'm just saying, just as an example, you can make a lot bigger impact on the greenhouse gas emissions globally if places like China and India were to adopt cleaner coal technology, natural gas, or other cleaner burning fossil fuels. We've been on record saying that repeatedly. Records we have indicate that State Street has over 3,000 employees in China. Does that sound about right? That is correct, yes. Has the Chinese government ever attempted to influence State Street's decisions in this area? No, the sir. Area not of that voting, I'm aware of. Of no, U.S. Sir. companies voting, of, no, of sir, we taking deny. action? No, sir. Not that you're aware of or not? Not that I'm aware of, no, sir. Can we ask you to check on that for us? We can absolutely ask you to We'd yeah. like to know. Has yep. the Chinese government ever attempted to influence any of your corporate decision making. Okay. We'll, we'll get back to you on that. I, not to my knowledge, but we'll get back to you on that. And Do you need that in writing or is this verbal request sufficient? Yeah, we'll double check. No, we, you we won't answer, tell us? Or, or? No, we think the answer is that no, they haven't influenced us in any way, um, but we will confirm that and get well, back to you. Have they attempted to? And if so, were they successful? Two separate questions. If you can certify that to us in writing, that would help a lot. Sure. Absolutely. And by the way, this Chevron vote was a pretty big deal to a lot of people. Climate Action 100 put out a press release and they called it a day of reckoning. Remember that? May, uh, the Climate Action put out a press release. The day of reckoning, of course that has some uh, biblical connotations, but the idea is, uh, I understand a time when past mistakes or, or misdeeds must be punished or paid for. And again, that was a Climate Action 100 press release. Your, you, your firms are both members of Climate Action 100, and I understand that's sometimes convenient. Today it's real inconvenient, but you're members of Climate Action 100. So isn't the point of inflicting a day of reckoning on companies so that they'll just do whatever Climate Action 100 wants going forward? That is very unfortunate language choice. Was bringing about this day of reckoning to maximize returns for Chevron shareholders, many of them I, teacher retired teachers in Texas? I respect that completely. And again, my interest, our interest is in making sure that companies are aware of the risks and that they are navigating the transition. They are disclosing that to investors. Um, again, that type of reference is unfortunate language, Dave. in my opinion. Day of That's Reckoning. Just the opinion of Lori Heinel, not the opinion of State Street, for the record, sir. Thank you. A Day of Reckoning quote in that Climate Action 100 plus press release. You know who they were quoting? <laughs> they were quoting an employee of CalPERS, that same California agency we've been talking about so much today <laughs> and having so much concern about them influencing Texas companies and Texas money. If I may, sir. Um, Please. I think this is part of the delicate threading we're all trying to do, and I, I've heard your views on this uh, from some of the, the members. There are um, jurisdictions, right? If you look at, again, I referenced Europe a little bit ago, that are going to ha continue to have expectations of companies that do business in their worlds. That's part of what we're trying to make sure companies are processing integrating into their strategy and then ultimately disclosing. So it is in part because of this wide range of views that we're all tilling with globally that we think it's so important that companies understand the implications for their businesses and manage that.
on ExxonMobil a little bit more about free speech and trade associations because the, the well, you can help us explain what states were meant when it made these statements, yeah. I hope. Um, the 2021 proxy contest, Exxon, Exxon Mobil Corporation, uh, Council, that's uh, 5921. SSGA 0005921. This is a bulletin that State Street put out specific to the Exxon Mobil votes in 2021. Do you, do you remember I that remember in general? I remember those sure. very well, yes, sure. sir. And by the way, thank you for your patience and your recall. We, we are never trying to get you to agree with things you don't remember. We're doing our best to no, pull the documents No, I, I remember so intimately. I actually was um, part of the conversations with the Exxon management in this particular case, which I do not always participate, but the, given the sensitivity of this particular one, I was part of that conversation. And this is... Uh, Central Coal Course was asking about this particular vote with Exxon. They got a lot of attention. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, SSGA, State Street, put out this vote bulletin specific to that vote. Now, State Street, you guys supported those two dissident candidates. We did indeed, yes, Is sir. that right? That's uh, right. Uh, Kaisa Hayatala and Alexander Karstner. Does that sound That's right? That's correct, yes. All right. Page one, at the end of the third paragraph, it says the basis of State Street's vote was, quote, to oversee the implementation of a more disciplined approach to capital allocation, as well as greater focus on the company's energy transition strategy. Did I read that right? You did, and in that context, because I remember this quite vividly, it's making sure that we believed that the directors had the appropriate experiences and skills to be able to oversee company management's um, strategy in that regard. And this effort, again, was led by Climate Action, was done through, coordinated through Climate Action 100, isn't that right? I, I, that I, I don't recall it being that way. This was a very um, intensive engagement that we had in our own right uh, with Exxon. Oh, well, well, Climate Action 100 is taking credit for it, but again... The, well, uh, again, the extreme views were to elect me more board members on the dissident slate than what we voted for. We were a more tempered vote on that particular uh, vote. Well, Climate Action 100, whom you, uh, uh, of which you remember, uh, mm -hmm. says it was coordinated through them and, of course, led by our friends at CalPERS. But page two of this document, uh, State Street voted for two shareholder resolutions that Exxon's board recommended against. The first was Proposal 6, mm -hmm. which sought to require an audited report on how the IEA net zero 2050 scenario would impact ExxonMobil. Now, based on his proxy statement, mm -hmm. Exxon's board opposed this proposal. They said Exxon had already analyzed scenarios with lower oil and gas demand than required by that scenario, so it was unnecessary. So why did State Street vote for this proposal after what Exxon's board said? They'd already analyzed an even lower threshold, so, so why that? And again, my recollection at the time was that we wanted to have a standard that was in the um, sort of the assessment at the time, and that it was valuable to have common reporting, common disclosure that would be across uh, comparable across companies. Second proposal mm -hmm. State Street supported over the opposition of Exxon management was proposal 10. And that was to require Exxon to report on climate lobbying. You and I have talked about this a lot and as we've it's gotten a little clearer as we've gone played through the documents, and thank you for helping us through it. Mm -hmm. So it's about climate lobbying. Now, based on the proxy statement, this was issued by BNP Purvis, which is coordinating Climate Action 100 efforts to require U.S. companies lobbying to be in accord with the Paris Agreement, as you and I spoke about mm -hmm. a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Now, Exxon's board opposed this proposal. And based on the proxy statement, Exxon's board said participation in trade associations enables the company to effectively advocate positions it supports, shares its shared views with other companies, and influence trade association policy debates. It also said the proposal was unnecessary. So Exxon said this proposal will limit our participation in trade associations and our advocating for positions we agree with. And given what Exxon's board said, I would think State Street would agree. But what did y'all do on that vote? Yeah, and again, it's about the disclosure. We wanted to know what, who, how are they lobbying, who are they lobbying, how, what are they lobbying for? It's a, it was about their willingness to disclose their lobbying activities and report on that. What's an R factor score? 
So we've developed our own internal ESG score, which is a synthesis of a variety of third-party uh, metrics. And I think we talked earlier about this, that the ESG scores are very opaque. They're quite um, they're you know, they're different based on who the provider are provider is rather and so what we attempted to do a couple of years ago was take several of these industry leading scores and consolidate them so that investors could have a, a, a kind of compendium if you will a shortcut to say if one you know provider has a 59 for a company another one has a 20 well you kind of blend them at least you get something that's a little bit more um, calibrated. Uh, that's helpful. I was curious exactly how they came about. Does State Street consider those R factor scores to be accurate and reliable measures of a company's uh, compliance with ESG goals? We, we believe they're as good as you can get in terms of um, at least having the transparency of what the material issues are that are relevant for a particular company and um, how, what, the, what the company's self-reported data is related to that particular item. And then we use them as really a basis for engagement. So, for example, we came up publicly to say that the, the what we call the laggards, which are the lowest, you know, 10% in any particular industry, that we would engage with those companies to understand why it was that their R factor scores were so poor relative to their industry and what risks that created and what they were doing about that. Uh, the spreadsheet that State Street provided to this committee uh, showed that on May 22nd, 2020, Exxon had an R factor score of 65.53, mm -hmm. described as an outperformer. Does that yes. sound right? That's right. Okay. On uh, November 1st, 2020, Exxon had an R factor score of 66, even better. Is that right? I, I don't have that legacy, but that, I believe you, yes, okay. sir. That's, that sounds right. Yet State Street voted against. Yeah. two directors and for those two climate proposals even though Exxon was outperforming. Is that right? Well, they were outperforming on the R factor score, but as I think we discussed earlier in the testimony, um, they were not outperforming as a, as a stock, as a company. Do you know whether Exxon's R factor went up or down the year after you voted against the board and voted for those it, resolutions? It, 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 I, I don't know the answer to that. We would, could, could get, easily get you that information. They've been fairly stable in having good R factor scores, in part because there are a lot of things that they're doing right, and that they're you know they're disclosing that enables them to get captured by those R factor scores. Well, if it's helpful to you, on June first, twenty two, Exxon had an R factor score of sixty three. It went down three points. Okay. Do you plan to vote against those Exxon directors you put on now that they've caused the R factor score to go down? No, and again, 63 is still a very credible R factor score relative to the broad industry, so that would still put them in a good good place relative to the industry. So they would do, not be a laggard, for example. Do you like the trend to 66 to 63? Again, this is part of the problem with some of these scores is that um, they can be, um, over, you know, over long times the trend is useful to look at. Over short terms you can get anomalies and it could be something like data reporting, the data is a little bit stale, things of that nature. So we're looking for relative to the peer group, are they an outlier? And then over time, are they relatively stable or trending? And that 63, 66, it would be a rounding error, quite honestly, in this context. Thank you. I have uh, one more set of votes to ask you about, then we're going to move back to uh, to, uh, to BlackRock. Uh, uh, Senator Bird, will Central, any, any, other, sure. any other questions for, uh, hold, on, hold on one second, I'll come back to you. Any other questions for, uh, for State Street as we wrap this up? Please, go ahead. Um, Mr. Chairman, it's been a very long day, um, and we have to get back to Dallas weather is inclement. Um, it's very difficult to get flights um, out, and we wanted to be here all day, and I was wondering if we might be able to wrap up relatively soon or perhaps take some of the questions in writing uh, afterwards so we could get uh, answers. Uh, we've been here since uh, 8 this morning. We had 30 minutes for a lunch break. We want to be very respectful. It's eight hours, and I was just wondering if it might be possible to wrap up so we could get to the airport before return our rental car, before the uh, 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 the flights leave. I have a uh, one more section to uh, visit with us, handle that, then then some more questions from BlackRock. Then I'm done after that. So uh, do what you need to do. But that's uh, that's our plan. So I'm almost done. Thank you, sir. 
since Charles had been part of anything at this point. I, I want to ask you about another Chevron vote. 2022. You've probably seen this one. Well, and, and by the way, you're extremely knowledgeable of these matters, and thank you for your candor and working through these things with us. We appreciate that. Uh, vote in, uh, in uh, 2022 for Chevron. Uh, there was a proposal for a racial equity audit. Do you remember that? I do, yes. And Chevron voluntarily said, we'll do a, an audit of our workforce diversity, but that's not what this was about. Uh, this was about uh, uh, this was about greenhouse gas emissions and the disparate impact of greenhouse gas emissions on people of color. Do you remember that? Yes, sir. Some said it was not racial at all. It was really an environmental uh, question couched as, as a racial one. Chevron's board and the proponents uh, uh, said that the statement cites unsubstantiated and inaccurate allegations and statistics and statistics, pardon me, and Chevron opposed that proposal. Uh, they said the, the uh, studies or claimed statistics showing there was an outsized uh, effect on people of color was, was not based on good science. Uh, but State Street voted for that proposal, is that right? It is, yes. Did State Street confirm it was in the shareholder's interest to vote for a proposal that the company's management criticized as unsubstantiated and inaccurate? And again, in, our, in this particular case, we um, thought that it was appropriate to, um, for them to conduct that audit, and so we voted in favor of them conducting that audit, respecting that they had a different view. Yes, sir. What analysis did State Street undertake? Uh, to see if it was in the financial interest of the stake of the shareholders to do the audit. So in, in that particular case, we were, again, looking at trends around some of their peers that were doing that kind of work and the expectation that investors would grow to expect that as a matter of course. So it was not, an, it was not a formal financial analysis in that regard. Are racial equity audits always good for companies, good for shareholders, financial interest? Uh, this, this is a tricky one. I mean, we, we certainly believe in um, combating racial inequities. We've been on record um, and have, our, have taken our own actions uh, in that regard. Uh, we do think that um, it's in the interest of all people to know that they've got kind of a playing, you know, a level playing field. Uh, and we have um, advocated on behalf of certain uh, initiatives that uh, support companies, um, you know, looking at what their practices are in this regard. Do you remember in 2021 uh, when shareholders proposed a racial equity audit of State Street Corporation, your parent company? Do you remember that? I do. The claim basis for this audit, and I'm just going to quote, was that currently State Street's board has no black directors, none of the company's executive leaders are black. In 2017, State Street paid $5 million in back pay to settle Department of Labor charges based on a pay equity analysis that the company paid top female and black workers less than top male and white workers. Do you remember that? I do, yes. Were those statistics unsubstantiated and accurate when the proposal was made? Uh, so, uh, no comment on that. I, I, but if I maybe just put it's a settlement. Yeah, we can't comment on the settlement. But can I can I make a comment about that experience? Underscores our view that these are important things for sure. to consider. Okay, so I, so I can't talk about the settlement under the agreement that we, we reached with the Department of Labor, um, but what I would say is that that's an example of why we think it is important that companies, um, you know, understand their risks in this regard and conduct these kinds of practices through our own experience there. And as I understand from documents we've seen, your team was responsible for responding to that proposal through, uh, there was a letter April 22nd of, uh, of uh, 2021, signed by Ben Colton and Rob Walker. And I'm not mm -hmm. talking about settlement, I'm just talking about yes. correspondence initially. Yes, they're good, yes. Okay. And uh, those, those men respond, report to you, as I understand. They do. Rob Walker is no longer with the firm, but Ben Coltman, Colt, uh, Colton is the head of our asset stewardship group, yes, sir. And State Street Corporation's board recommended that its shareholders vote against the racial equity audit of State Street, didn't they? 
I didn't say so, and I want to know your vote yeah, no, on the audit. Okay. Okay. Yeah, unfortunately, this is a, a matter that's currently under, um, we've got some, I can't comment on that particular issue right now. Sir. So I'm not asking about a settlement with the Department of no, I'm asking, I'm asking about the board's vote on whether to conduct so, a racial So the board audit. did vote against that, that is correct. Board voted yes, against sir. that. Okay, so we voted for the racial equity audit of Chevron, but against the racial equity audit of State Street. Again, it's two different bodies. Like we, just to confirm, our asset stewardship team did not vote for or against the State Street audit, correct? Yeah, it's two, It's a bit of apples and oranges. It's our stewardship team. Yeah, our stewardship team doesn't vote on matters related to State Street, our parent, because of conflict of interest issues. But you're right to point out that the board of State Street voted against doing that audit. That is correct. Senators, so any other questions uh, from Ms. Heinle of State Street? Thank you very much. A few more questions for you. Now, I want to be clear, and I'll talk to you and your lawyer. Though you, though we did subpoena you to be here, no one is being compelled to be here. No one's going to arrest you if you try to leave. Are you okay with talking about some of the votes that, that uh, BlackRock has taken? Similar questions to what we just had, and that's all I've got. Um, sir, I'm, I'm happy to answer your, your questions. I'm just mindful. I'm also just uh, uh, flagging, so just to put it out there, that I'm, uh, I'm flagging, but I'm, I'm, I'm here to answer your questions, sir. Thank you. It would it be fair to say that BlackRock uses its voting power to promote the objectives of the Paris Agreement? In particular, we mean transition to net zero by 2050. <laughs> Just as a as a practice, as an overarching practice. Um, no, sir. We use our uh, our uh, the votes that our clients have entrusted us with um, as a fiduciary to drive long term performance. Now, uh, one more thing on, or one or two more things on on uh, Climate Action One Hundred Net Zero Asset Managers. According to BlackRock's words, BlackRock joined the organization because it quote believes. BlackRock, quote, believes that the transition to a net zero world is the shared responsibility of every citizen, corporation, and government. Is that a statement that BlackRock still believes? Um, I, I'm not sure where you read that from, sir. I, I have seen that statement, but I don't, I don't remember the context around it. Um, we spoke a lot about the plant here. I want to ask some broad questions about the industry to make sure we haven't missed anything. Does BlackRock invest in utility companies involved in coal, oil, and gas production projects? I think we know the answer, but y'all do invest in those, don't you? Um, sir, we're one of the largest investors in the energy sector globally, um, approximately 300, um, about $280 billion, um, and a third of that is right here in Texas. Does BlackRock engage or otherwise encourage these utility companies to phase out coal and gas projects? Um, Mr. Chairman, we look for disclosures to understand the material risks these companies are facing as increasingly the regulatory, um, um, global regulatory initiatives are moving towards um, net zero. So we are looking for how they're addressing material risks to their businesses, regulatory risks, so that we can um, deliver performance for our clients, which is our goal as a fiduciary. Climate Action 100 on its website again. Uh, it's net zero company benchmark prerogatives. They're very clear, very stated, and very set out. I want to make sure I'm clear. Are you pledging that BlackRock has not pledged to follow the Climate Action 100's net zero company benchmark prerogatives? Um, Mr. Chairman, I would point you to the letter that we signed when we joined Climate Action 100. It's dated January 6, 2020, and it articulates very clearly um, to Climate Action 100, and it's on our website, that um, we are bound as a fiduciary by certain regulations. We are bound by our clients' mandates, and we participate in these, in these conversations, but we are driven by these regulations and mandates that we are bound to as a fiduciary. 
So then you can certify the, to the committee today on behalf of BlackRock that BlackRock will not support Climate Action 100's net zero company benchmark prerogatives. Sir, we are independent. We look independently as a fiduciary in how to drive long-term performance. We need to. We look to understand these risks to the particular businesses on a case-by-case -case basis because there are different businesses, different sectors. But we we are independent. How we do our investments, how we do our voting, is done independently. So then, it sounds like BlackRock will not support Climate Action 100's net zero company benchmark prerogatives. Sir, we believe in that the, the transition to a low carbon economy is beneficial for clients' portfolios. We, we believe in that. We believe there are material risks, um, um, it, climate risks to certain sectors. We believe in that. We look to companies to explain to us how they are managing these risks so we can deliver to our clients. Mr. Chairman, if, if if I may, and I'm, I'm you know listening to all of you today, I just um, I'm I really hear your frustration with some of the language and how it can be interpreted, and you know uh, voting and all that. I just would have you keep in, in mind um, a, a few things as we go through this. Number one, our our true performance on behalf of our clients here in Texas. Number two, voting choice. A lot of the questions you're having about voting and how we voted, how we did not vote, are our guidelines um, that we appreciate. We have guidelines that we vote in a particular way. We're very transparent. A lot of institutional investors are not required to be as transparent as asset managers are. By law, we have a huge amount of transparency required, and we actually go even beyond that, which is why you're able um, to see our, our voting records. But we appreciate people have different views, and the answer here is voting choice. The answer is more asset owners being able to take back their vote and vote in accordance with, you know, how they want to vote these assets. That is an answer that I think can answer and address a lot of the concerns that you all have. Has anyone in your company recommended, suggested, encouraged a company to take a public position on a policy adopted in a state? Uh, a letter on elections policy, a letter on abortion. Has BlackRock taken the action along those lines with any of the companies that it engages with? I am not aware of that, Mr. Chairman. Let me put that in terms of request to you and to your attorneys. Will you get that to us in writing? We want to know if anyone in your company is recommended, suggested, encouraged, because and we're, we're y'all are articulate. We thank you for being here, and the English language is beautiful. Uh, it's so beautiful and so nuanced. Sometimes we can lose meaning, so we want to be very clear. Whether we call it engagement or encouragement or managing down, we want to know. If BlackRock, anyone at BlackRock, is recommended, suggested, encouraged a company to take a public position on a policy adopted in a state, uh, elections policy, abortion policy, issues of the day, which uh, some companies that happen to show up in a lot of your documents have been taking positions on recently. Unusual for companies to do that. We want to know about that. Will you get that to us in writing? We are, we are happy to take that back, Mr. Chairman. Will you take it back, and then will you bring us the answer? Yeah, we'll, we'll do our best, absolutely. Well, I'm not asking if you know the answer today, but I'm asking if you'll get me the answer. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think the the reason is like um, we we will talk to the senior um, executives in the company and to get you the answer. We can't cover every single individual. We're like a nineteen thousand um, member firm, but we will talk to our senior executives and 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 get back to you. Do you need the request in writing? Nope. Very good. Uh, we have a the identical question. For State Street, is anyone in your company recommended, suggested, encouraged a company to take a position on a policy adopted in a state? 
uh, elections policy, abortion policy, any of those issues. I guess they might come under the S of ESG, could come in all kinds of places, but we want to know if anyone at State Street is um, calling it engagement, calling it manage, whatever you call it, has anyone at State Street uh, recommended, suggested, encouraged a company to take a public position on a policy adopted in a state, be it elections, abortion, any of those matters. Okay. We'll, we'll take that away and come back. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, uh, my counsel asked if you could please send that specific request in writing. We just want to make sure we understand exactly what you're asking for. Do we need that to put? Do we need that in the form of a? Uh, it, do we need that in the form of a subpoena or is a? No, no, no. A formal just, a, request just, a, just, a, just a formal written request, just so we can make sure we answer the full contours. Just like we've been. Yeah. Responding to requests for information. Well, this We're is happy the first to do it. We're just trying to understand okay. exactly what the contours okay. are. That's well, all. Well, up until that one, unless I misunderstood, when I've offered to put them in writing, you've said no. Do we need this one in writing? No, uh, for, forgive me if I misremembered yeah, that. Up until now, we were able to understand exactly what the request was. And we said, we'll get it to you. This one I would like to have in writing. It's a little bit more amorphous to me. So. Okay. I just want to make sure we understand it, sir. That's all. Very we're good. We're not trying to be in any way not provide the information. Answer. Happy to answer it. I would say um, we are on record. There were three proposals put forward during the proxy season related to reproductive rights, and we voted against all three of those because we felt that they were overly prescriptive and that we do believe that companies need to manage these issues on their own behalf. Senator Hall, anything else uh, for our witnesses from BlackRock and State Street? Anything from you, Senator Hall? Very good. Thank you for being here, for working with us. We'll continue to work with you and your lawyers to get answers to these questions. Yes, sir. Glad you came to Marshall. We'll, we'll see you next time. Thank Merry you. Christmas. Thank you. Appreciate the uh, engagement. Really do. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll now Thank open uh, public testimony. A lot of our bosses, folks we work for here, our, our constituents want to participate. And so, uh, well, again, if anybody wants to testify publicly, uh, you can. we ask that you fill out a witness affirmation card. It's just outside that door to my right, to your left, unless you've turned around to leave. Okay. We'll see you later. See you soon. Uh, thank you. And so uh, we'll open public testimony at this time. Uh, Herman Hernandez. Mr. Hernandez, I know we've been going a long time. Let's see if he's still. All right. Hey, man. Thank you for waiting. Please come on down. You bet. Before you sit down, let me put you under oath. Okay. Raise, raise your. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Very good. Sit down, please, and introduce yourself, and then give us your testimony. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Chairman Hughes and committee members. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak today. My name is Hernan Hernandez. Um, there you go. Get real. That's right. Eat that microphone so we can. We don't want to okay. miss what you're saying, so get close. Thank you, Senator. So, my name is Hernan Hernandez. I was born and raised here in Marshall, Texas. Um, I currently live here with my wife and twin daughters. Uh, a majority of my family and friends are uh, from, from Tex East Texas, uh, specifically Marshall and surrounding areas. Um, I graduated from UT Tyler, uh, where I found passion for business and finance and accounting. And uh, I also invest locally here in uh, rental properties uh, where I take pride in providing affordable and safe housing in the community. Um, I would like to thank this committee um, <clears throat> and your work on Senate Bill 13. Um, I came here today to shine light on the fact that BlackRock and State Street are uh, top shareholders of our local power uh, company, Swepco, which is owned by AP. Um, it has been I believe this community's belief that AEP's leadership was influenced by these institutional giants uh, into prematurely retiring a local power plant here uh, to satisfy the ESG agenda. Um, if this were to be true, that would mean ESG is negatively affecting uh, our local community through the loss of well-paying jobs, tax revenue for our schools, and power to the local grid, uh, energy grid. So I really appreciate the pushback your committee 
had today on the ESG prioritization over fiduciary duties. Um, and I would just like to thank you for your time and diving into the connection of e uh, between ESG investing and the early power, uh, power plant retirement. Mr. Hernandez, thank you. I know it's been a long day and you could have been out making money and spending time with your family. Thank you for yes, doing this, preparing your testimony and sharing with us. You know, we work for you and, and hearing from you is important to us. Thank you for doing this. Senator Hall, Senator Bartlett, any questions for Mr. Hernandez? Very good. Thank, thank you so much for being here. Have a good Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now the chair calls Honorable Richard Anderson. Senator, I'll, I'll ask as he comes out, I'm wondering if Senator Anderson has ever testified before a Senate committee. Uh, I know he's been up here quite a bit. We'll find out. And Senator, even though when you get here, we'll give you the oath. You've, you've, uh, let me give you the oath before you sit down. We get, so so uh, do, you, do you solemnly swear the testimony you're about to give this committee uh, will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you guide? Thank you, sir. I do. I know you do. Have a seat. Thank you. Welcome. For the, so Senator Anderson, of course, represented this area in the Senate and served as county judge before and after that and as a business leader, lawyer, and a long time uh, involved. And uh, he brought his, he brought, he, he, he does well when he, when he brings Ms. Anderson with him. It's, just a, it's a good idea. We're good to see her. You go ahead, Judge. Welcome and introduce Thank yourself. You, give us your testimony. My, my, uh, my best asset. Uh, and I'm glad you didn't administer the oath of office. <laughs> You'd have run if I tried that, wouldn't you? You'd <laughs> Out the door. Yeah. Uh, Chairman Hughes and members, uh, it's a pleasure to have you here uh, today. Uh, it has been a long day. I'll be brief. Oh, that's fine. Uh, that's fine. You know, at, at the time that we designed this courtroom in 2009 and opened it up, I had no idea that we needed to plan for the State Affairs Committee. That's why we only have five chairs here for the commissioners and the judge. So uh, next time in our, our planning, we'll, we'll try to think ahead on that. The, the, um, the, by way of background experience, uh, I was licensed to practice law uh, when I was 22, and that was 50 years ago. So, and uh, I have since that time, I have uh, been involved with uh, corporate law, extensive experience with fiduciary relationships, uh, investments for over 30 years uh, and uh, basically have a founding within the issues that I understood that we would be speaking of today. The one thing I would notice, you know, th there were uh, two observations made with respect to performance. Senator Bettencourt had one, like five of 12, and Senator Kochhorst had one about, well, the the top performers in the uh, ESG rated no better than the bottom performers in the rest of the market. And particularly, that's probably so with respect to where we are in 2022, because of the 511 components in the S&P 500, energy's been the only one positive, you know, and it's uh, basically ripped and roared, you know. So, uh, that that may well be have been a, a focus of what you know I thought we were looking at from the standpoint of the performance of the ERS and the teacher retirement and so forth, namely looking at what the performance of those portfolios have been. You know, because that the bottom line with respect to the uh, employee retirement system, the like of that, those former employees are going to be interested in what the performance of that is. So that that obligation, you know, to them, it's a basically a defined benefit plan. It's not a 401k. You know, you, you know what you're going to get when they're. And they're going to be looking at that those returns in order to make sure that those obligations to them are, are retired. So, you know, as you're, and I know most of this today is focused upon environmental, social, and governmental. I would recommend that you look at, you know, the return on investment of the uh, the portfolios that are here. I presume they're balanced portfolios, a 60/40 or 70/30 allocation, uh, and, and real performance over a, not just 2022, but a one, three, five, and 10-year period to see what that performance has been relative to the marketplace. If they've not been performing well, 
then that's a legitimate grief. You know, the the, the letter, Mr. Chairman, I, I, the, there were 16 or 17 attorney generals that signed that the letter, and it looked to me, quite frankly, that it was, you know, it, it spoke in terms of fiduciary relationships. It spoke in terms of, of returns and so forth. But in the subpoena issued by the committee on Exhibit C of that, there was no mention of returns. You know, it was basically ESG. Now, I presume that the committee will be gleaning or obtaining that information so as to look at the performance of the assets, okay, in, in, in the future. Uh, and the, some of the other issues that, that and, and I noticed that, you know, a lot of the, uh, I've had experience preparing proxy statements before and shareholder communications. <clears throat> and I thought for the first several hours, that's what we were doing. <laughs> because there was a lot of information here about, you know, well, what's being set forth in here from a standpoint of uh, the solicitation of proxies or votes or directors for or against or, you know, whatever, uh, uh, those items. Um, but, but again, I, I, you know, I want to harken back to that piece with respect to what are the respective returns from the asset classes, and are these people doing their job? You know, I think that's that's that should be the litmus test with respect to this. You know, and I know that there's some you know there's some political issues with respect to the the uh, <coughs> the ESG, and I I venture to say, you know, excuse me, I venture to say they're probably will not be as much mention of ESGs and proxy material uh, distributed by some of these people in the future, particularly as it pertains to Texas investments. I think their, their guard is up at this point, okay? But the, uh, the, the, the and w one thing that you had mentioned, Mr. Chairman, earlier about the short term and the long term, the, I mean, within the industry, that's typically referred to as strategic and tactical. You know, I mean, tactics win battles and strategy wins wars. And so with respect to this, you know, the ESG component, I think, th there are clearly, there are strategic concerns there. But we can't get to, I mean, we actually... We export a little bit more oil than we import at this point, about 8.57 million barrels a day. You know, versus about 8.41 on import. So, we we may be looking at trying to, you know, build on our renewables. Uh, the the chairman of GM, Mary Barrera, had mentioned two years ago, one year ago, that we'll be all electric by 2030. You know, I think that's unduly optimistic. You know, I think with, we're in a transitional phase to, with respect to, you know, having electrical vehicles. Uh, we're in a transitional phase with respect to the, the, the way we produce electric power. Texas, as you know, is the, the, the leader in the United States for production of wind power, you know, and could be solar. You know, in the years ahead, and, and I, I mentioned this, and I'd like to, to read it to you just briefly, because conversations arose with respect to the Perky Power Plant. And a quote from the, well, <laughs> my cell phone is not letting me get past this advertisement that's running. It was a quotation by the, the chairman of AEP. And the Big Brown in Fairfield was about 1.1 1 .1, uh, gig. My memory bank was. 1.1000, okay. Perky's about 572, okay. 
and the one at Monticello and Sandow both are operated by AEP. Those have either been closed or are in the process of being closed down. The many of those announcements were made two years ago when natural gas was three dollars a thousand. Okay, now as we know, it's like six fifty to seven. You know, it's a lot different because I've I've got mineral interest. Okay, so I kind of follow that too. But he indicated that they're closing those down in order to, and, and he mentioned eighteen thousand five hundred megawatts have been closed by Swepco within the last uh, ten years and two years coming. And he said they're doing that, and that's all been replaced by renewables. So the, 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 the power, the power companies, are starting to realize that too. And again, I, I think the, some of the observations were made, I think you and, and Senator Birdwell have both mentioned it. The, I mean, the fact of the matter is that the, we are in a transitional world. Okay, but it can't take place overnight. Okay, it's got to be a methodical process, you know, setting of goals in order to be able to accommodate this in the years to come without putting a tremendous strain in the event of some un, unforeseen situation like the invasion of Ukraine jumps up and all of a sudden we see energy prices spike. So, I would like to to conclude with with uh, well one other observation too. You noticed two years ago that the Saudis had planned to uh, actually start selling oil in place with a view to diversifying their economy, and then there was this little episode with the the journalist Khashoggi that all of a sudden got, you know, invited to the embassy and then got cut up. And now, last week or two weeks ago, the Saudis have come back and said, okay, we're, we're now going to reactivate that plan to start selling some of these assets in place. Now, I will submit to you this. <clears throat> they are aware of the concept of stranded assets. If you've got assets out here that the viability or the economic feasibility of that has been diminished as a result of alternative power sources, then that's a stranded asset. And if they weren't interested in maintaining all of this, if they wanted to actually, you know, have the supreme confidence in the price of oil going forward, they wouldn't be trying to diversify. And they're trying to diversify now. So, I mean, that should be a signal to us because the Saudis are not our friends. You know, I mean, that's, I mean look at 9 11. Uh, we may have some temporary alliances with them, but uh, what they're doing is they're recognizing this transition in, in effect. And we need to as well. But being tempered again with the concept of, you know, it's, it's a transitional world. You know, we can't be like the blacksmith in 1903 when he saw Henry Ford's Model T roll off the line and say, well, what's that going to do to my horseshoe business? Because those will never go more than 30 miles an hour. You know, I mean, we understand, we need to understand going forward, you know, again, it's transitional. Let's don't get behind the curve. Let's get in front of the curve. And I think you've delivered a, a message again to the, the people. I saw that cadre of lawyers <laughs> behind me. And I'm thinking, okay, if you're running at three to five hundred dollars an hour, so I thought, you know, that was a pretty expensive outing today. You know, but I think they did get the message. And I want to thank you, Chairman, and uh, members of the committee uh, for your courtesy. And uh, I'd also like to thank you for your endurance today. <laughs> Senator, thank Please. you for yours. Uh, uh, Senator Barton, will Senator, all any questions for Senator Anderson? We'll, 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 be seeing, we'll see you in Austin in a couple weeks, yes. maybe, for the look, look forward, forward to it. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Senator. Thank you, sir. 
Now, those, uh, Mr. Hernandez, Mr. Anderson, are the only two witness affirmation cards we've received. Anyone else who wishes to testify before the Senate Committee on State Affairs, where anybody can testify, and uh, that's how it's supposed to be. If anybody wishes to, please go back there and fill out a card. I don't see anyone or hear anyone. And so, uh, Senator Hall, Senator Bartle, uh, anything else? I thank you everyone for being here, and I, and I thank the, the uh, staff of the State Affairs Committee and the individual senators who are involved in getting all this ready, all this prepared, and my, our friends from the Senate uh, Audiovisual Department who traveled here and set everything up so this could be shared with the public. And most of all, I think the real people, the individuals are here from, who took time to be here, so thank you each very much, and we wish you a Merry Christmas, and the Senate Committee on State Affairs stands in recess. I'm going to call the chair. Thank you.